morning. We're on the record. Okay. The notice of the October 3rd meeting of the Board of Architecture and en en Engineering Examiners was posted to the website on September 26th. And this is the interior design meeting. Uh, roll call, please. Yes, ma'am. Um, Ms. Susan Ballard? Here. Mr. Frank Waxner? Here. And Ms. Kathy Ware? Ms. Weir's not currently here. She may be joining us. We can go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the one topic that I wanted to bring up was the um, issue of the term of interior architecture. Uh, two years ago, the interior design programs across the state, five out of seven, changed their name to interior architecture, which under the um, Southern Colleges, there is a coding that allows them to do that in their curriculum meets that requirement. Our board does not have any regulations over them, but there's a ripple effect to this. And so what I happened to come across a couple months ago was where an interior designer has tagged on to this concept that now she's an interior architect and has a her own firm and is advertising as such and she is advertising on her website I don't think the schools understood when they are telling the students you can't call yourself an interior architect that it that it doesn't apply to the community because they don't know that it's not a legal term so I'd like and I discussed this about four years ago when they told us they were going to change it that we need to come up with some kind of policy uh, a statement some way to respond to individuals who don't understand interior architecture is not a legal term in Tennessee. And so um, that is something I'd like to bring up to the architecture committee and uh, again to the board. I feel like we need to have a conversation about this and get this resolved because the public doesn't understand that there is a difference between a licensed architect and someone who calls them their practice interior architecture. And so, um, I brought a set of my own drawings from a project we completed recently to show what we do as interior designers, but that doesn't make us an architect. And so um, I feel my responsibility here is to hold, uh, uphold the laws that we have here in Tennessee and that we need to uh, have a clear statement to those people practicing, you know, um, and are licensed and registered in the state. So um, would you like to add to that comment, Frank? So, from oh, an in-car viewpoint. I know in the past years, uh, I remember meeting with the, the, schools. the schools and pleading with them. I don't know if I had any authority, but pleading with them not to call, start calling themselves a school of, or interior architects or interior architecture. And obviously, they paid no attention to that. And it wasn't just myself. I mean, it was several. I actually members. issued a letter to all of the programs in the state of Tennessee, which ended up going nationally. Um, without our knowledge, we found out on the backside that everybody sent it to everybody. And so um, I heard about it at the NCIDQ meeting that my letter had gone across the board requesting that they not do it unless they go through the legal process to make it a recognized profession. And that has not occurred. I have asked the schools to um, approach it in that manner. If they're going to want to call their programs that, then they need to go through the legislative process to make that a legal term and have a registration for that. But no one has, you know, pursued that. They have their own agendas to take care of their you know, fundraising and their students and other academic things they have to do. But now that it's it's spread to the local, like, oh, I can call myself that as well, I think we've got to do something. And um, because I don't think the public will ever understand there's a right and a wrong and, and the differences in it. So um, I want to make a recommendation that we do make a statement in that regards. Um, so that the registrants understand that they cannot call themselves that unless they've taken the ARE and um, or there is a legal profession, you know, designated as such. So, well, you know, apparently they're using this term. I mean, there you've got a publication that has that in there, um, and that's not uh, a 
College Interior Architecture Program. That's a firm calling themselves interior architect or saying they provide interior architecture. And that, to me, there's a difference there. But I'm not the legal person that can say what is and what isn't. I'm assuming that, from what I can tell, um, when somebody uses the word architecture, it's different from saying you're an architect. And I don't know how to get around right. that. And so I guess... So, Elizabeth, can we get guidance um, in that respect before we make a big to-do? Um, yes, if this committee um, wants to request of legal to um, write a memo regarding what can and can't be used um, by these firms, um, we'd be happy to do so. I think, um, I think you're spot on with the public confusion, and I, I think that it's a great idea for our board to at least um, do what we can to educate as what can be used and what can't be used. Um, but uh, if this committee wants to make a motion legal, can certainly um, get started on that for you. Just to give you a little background, uh, four years ago when we had the deans um, do their presentations for the first time, when we broke out into the various uh, committees and workshops, um, we suggested if they want to pursue this, and we were able to put them off a couple of years, that they come up with an examination, that they have a credentialing means, and they do a process to make this, you know, legit. And they all felt like the NCIDQ exam, which is what we have as interior designers, was good enough. And it has changed, and it is more complicated and more technical than it has been in the past. When I took it, maybe 30% of it was history. Now there's there's six questions that are history. So, you know, they've, they've actually developed the exam which is why I go to that national meeting every year to help with that. But nothing has been done to my knowledge. And I met with an educator uh, this past week, and and she wasn't aware of any you know efforts to pursue and change that, simply because they can do it, they can tag it, and that's what works. And it draws in a more diverse group of students and a higher quality level student. And so I understand their methods and, and means, but it doesn't help with the general public. And so um, I would like to make a motion that we ask legal to have a definition between architects and architecture and how it can be used um, within our registrants in regards to the interior design um, situation. So. And, and let me say, I, there's, there's no intention or desire here to uh, limit what like this firm is doing it's just they're doing they're doing interior design and they're but they're implying there's more there by calling it interior architecture exactly now i and, personally and employ, we wouldn't limit what they're doing at all yeah. that's that's what they're doing but for the general public you would perceive that to mean something else so Hard, that's, a different degree so I personally have an architect uh, in my firm, and um, we let him do the structural technical things that have to be done that are applied to the building shell that the architect of record does. So we're doing everything according to you know what is required. But there are people that don't understand this, and that's why this was this was published a year ago, and I was just happened to be at the right place at the right time, and somebody gave me a copy for other reasons. They want me to advertise in it. And I open it up, and there's a full two-page spread of interior architecture, and I'm about to hide. <clears throat> so anyway, um, I guess, do we need to vote on I that motion? I would second the motion. Yeah, OK. <laughs> all right, so all in favor say aye. 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 No one to oppose it. So if you all will add that to your to-do list, I would appreciate it. Um, is there anything else that we need to bring up? You do know. All right. <clears throat> being no further business uh, we will adjourn thank you
Good morning. Yes, we are on the record. Today is October the 3rd, and this is the Landscape Architect Committee meeting. And notice was posted on the board's website of this meeting on September the 26th. And I will turn it over to Mr. Blair Parker. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Uh, this is the Landscape Architecture Committee, and uh, we have just a few things to discuss. This shouldn't take take too long, I do not believe. Uh, back in April, roll call. Uh, sorry, roll call. We do. Have, I've got you there. Yes. You Thank have, you, uh, Mr. Blair Parker. Here. Mr. Frank Wagster. Here. And Mr. Robert Excuse Campbell me. Jr. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in April of this year, I, I presented four landscape architecture applications for us to look at because they were all extenuating circumstances. They were all different. Uh, each of them had a little different twist. And in discussing this as a group and then asking legal uh, how much leeway we have as, in the, the landscape architectural rule, it was decided that we have no leeway whatsoever. Like there's no wiggle room whatsoever in the way that the landscape architecture rule is written. So um, at that time we decided that uh, it, it's, we should uh, open the opportunity to make change. And with the realization we had elections coming up and what have you, we felt that the environment uh, may be better for us to wait till. So, which is what we've done. That's where we find ourselves today. Um, uh, so what I'm going to suggest, and I would, uh, I'm going to ask that legal help us prepare, uh, get prepared for this. I don't know. I as a motion, but if it does, um, what I would like the option to do is to just have some wiggle room for as we review landscape architecture applications to have the same type wiggle room that uh, the other design professions do as well. Um, now, does this require a motion? Best help from legal? Yes. Yes. I'll make a motion that we uh, review the uh, how the other two professions look at um, exceptions uh, and try to incorporate similar language uh, for landscape architects. If legal will uh, for legal to look at that and and see what we need to do, please. Okay. Have a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Uh, so for our next meeting, I will uh, get with Nathan Ridley, who represents the Tennessee chapter of American Society of Architects, get with him and start those discussions and get that ball rolling. Uh, so the next time we meet, we will have a full um, packet of information, hopefully for us to look at and to evaluate. And where I stand on this, I just want the ability for we as a committee to review these. As, we, as it stands right now, there's no wiggle room, so there's no reason to review them. And I don't think that's, that's very fair to our constituents. So um, anyway, we'll do that. Um, on another note, uh, the continue education. It's interesting how the health, safety, welfare question has, has come up throughout the state, and it continues. Uh, ASLA is uh, trying to figure out how they deal with this. And we had an applicant um, uh, who was, pardon me, we, we have a licensee who was audited. And in that, in the audit information that uh, he sent back, um, it was interesting the, the, the uh, education units that he was claiming were health, safety, and welfare. Well, I happened to, I happened to attend all both conferences and all of the hours that he was claiming, with the exception, I believe, of two. And there were a few in there that I, that I didn't really believe are health, safety, welfare related, which generated the conversation around the state of, well, how do we know how this is done? Well, see chapter of ASLA on their uh, information for their conferences and then uh, their certificates that they hand out to those who, uh, who attended says nothing about health, safety, and welfare. So it's up to the person who attended to make that decision, I suppose. 
I've suggested to ASLA is that it would be most helpful for the state of Tennessee to receive certificates that say something about uh, through the, the uh, ASLA National or AIA. Raise the question, what do you do with local, you know, local folks who come in with some educational unit and how expensive it can be to have Certified through those national organizations. The good part here is that the conversation is being held, and I believe that the next time we come back, deciding how they're going to how they're going to handle that. But as I went through this, this was the first audit that I had actually reviewed since being on the board, and I was amazed how much time it took me. And I attended these <laughs> these courses, so you know it it didn't really make much sense for you who did not. It'd be much easier if you had something that said this was HSW or not. Um, anyway, that to the end here, I just want to get uh, get that resolved. So those discussions are being held around the state. And then last week, the Council of Landscape Architecture Registration Boards held their annual meeting in Toronto. Um, and uh, while I did not attend, I did participate in in some of the activity, and they actually voted on some change of governance. I voted no. Uh, Tennessee cast a vote for no. I was one of ten. Back to us again for review. And I voted no because I felt there were, the language wasn't specific enough or it wasn't clear enough. And I feel if, if I can't understand it, um, then others are not going to be able was a common theme that I heard from other other folks they were also in in their rearranging of things not removing entirely but it, but CLARB is set up in regions m much like the other professional uh, in our region we have a fair amount of conversation amongst ourselves and they are lessening the importance of the regions. And uh, it was no votes. Many of the no votes came from the southeast, the region three. I haven't spoken to anyone in region three, but it's going to be interesting to have those conversations. Tell us what the significant issues are that you, that, that I have. Yeah, that weren't, you know, Clear, I guess you'd say. Yes. Um, well, the one issue of the of the regions, how the regions are being um, less qualified, they're still going to have regions. We will have fewer fewer meetings or conference calls, and I don't think that's good. I believe it's it's advantageous for me from Tennessee to hear what's happening around us. I don't know that I necessarily need to hear what's happening in, in the far ends of our country because how they do things there may be a little bit different than how we do things. But on a consistent basis, I want to hear what's happening in Mississippi and Florida states that are relatively in this southeast area. Um, the proposal was to remove the secretary, uh, secretary and vice president of CLARB and then they were in doing so the justification that CLARB made for that is that they really don't do much you know it's a it's a placeholder if you will for what they did was they wanted to remove those two and add um, add two other uh, positions on the overall board and I don't know that I totally disagree with that but I want to know more about that and I felt Not available for me to review that and to fully understand why they would do that. It would have been helpful, no doubt, for me to attend the CLARB meeting, but I was not able to attend that meeting. So those were two of the issues. Well, it seems to me like those positions may not, and in most organizations, having some sort of succession plan, whatever, succession plan, um, is a good thing because it does get to where that learning curve for somebody coming into one of those 
leadership positions is not so steep because they have been forced to keep up with where the issues are and where things are that are, you know, multi-year uh, resolutions. And so, I, you know, maybe they don't do, quote, do much, but it does keep you engaged in that process so that when you're at that, that point, you're able to effectively lead and, and not just lose institutional or historical knowledge uh, every time you have a new person at the top. Uh, because I'm, I'm guessing the p positions they're going to create are not automatically moving up the chain of command. And, and that's uh, that seems to be a little goofy. Some you know? political maneuver. Yeah, it does. Like it that. does. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, so... You know, I mean, yeah, they may not do much, but it does get you in line, and you do have to pay attention a little bit more and understand the issues a little bit more, and you're in on all those executive committee phone calls and stuff that you need to be in on. So, One, one of the uh, interesting moments in this overall um, virtual vote and conversation and, and what have you, uh, there were several people who, who believed that uh, – was removing the requirement to have a licensed landscape architect at the head of CLARB. And uh, they clarified, no, that's not the case. You, st we still, you st must still be a licensed landscape architect to be the head of CLARB. But there was so much confusion amongst those on the conference call and those apparently in the audience, it's well, what else in here is, is confusing. So um, the thought is, let's, let's get into this a little bit further and make sure that things are that is it from Clark do we have anything else from landscape architecture I don't nope. thank you very much Today Morning. is Wednesday, October the 3rd, and this is the Architect Committee meeting. Um, notice was given to the public on the board's website on September the 26th, and I would turn it over to our chair, Mr. Thompson. Um, let me go through roll call, if I could. And Mr. Rick Thompson? Here. Brian Tibbs? Here. And Frank Wagster? Here. All here. Thank you. I will turn it over to you, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. This... Uh, this committee meeting this morning, uh, we really don't have a, a lot of business to discuss. We're pretty pretty well caught up on most of our issues, and uh, uh, I noticed that on the uh, on the agenda there is uh, a bullet point about any applications and audits we might need to review. Uh, I have not received anything from the from the board, so I'm, I'm not sure if that's even. Correct. I don't believe we have any. Wanda didn't add any to your iPad, so I think we're in good shape. If there's any other topics that uh, this committee wanted to discuss, this would be a good time. We, we do. We do have one request from uh, Susan to uh, uh, make some comments in regard to some licensure issues. I believe or title issues. For the record, I'm Susan Ballard. Um, I had received. Um, advertising booklet uh, when I was in Knoxville uh, by the publishers and found that uh, there's a design firm who is using the term interior architecture and design and I think this is a spillover from the programs changing their name to interior architecture that former graduates um, feel like they can use the term interior architecture uh, as part of the title of their practice and so I wanted to bring it to the Architecture Committee's attention. We discussed it in the Interior Design Committee uh, this morning, and we've asked legal to try to give us an opinion uh, as to why or to what we can uh, put in our documentation to discourage this since we don't have a law that, at this point. So um, I just wanted to bring it to your all's attention. And Frank's seen this, and you all have seen this. So. That's that's my statement. Thank you. Do you have any questions of me? 
Uh, thank you, Susan. Does anybody have any uh, questions or comments before we discuss this? Please feel free to uh, comment in our discussion since you I, brought the comment. I'll stay with you. Uh, <clears throat> I, I know we've I know we've covered this topic uh, uh, a few times, and there 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 is some confusion in regard to what the law specifically states if you use the term architect. In, in your in your uh, title or uh, qualification statement, whether if that is not correct, you are in violation of of the the law. <clears throat> and but there is still question regarding the term architecture in, in there. And uh, and I know legal, you'll comment on this, but as a statement from me. Um, to me, it's basically the same infraction of the law. I. I I know that that may not be the letter of the law, but to to give yourself uh, a title uh, practicing architecture is is misleading, and uh, we we uh, took exception to the universities changing their programs to that. Uh, it's uh, irresponsible, in my opinion, because you're you're promoting something that is not really a. a a degree in architecture it's an interior design degree you can call it whatever you want to call it but it's not true to what we do as architects and uh, based on your opinion we may have some uh, requests to possibly amend uh, or amend the law or have a new law or whatever so I'm just leaving that open for discussion yes so um uh, Ms. Ballard, during the Interior Design um, Committee earlier today, did make the motion to request that legal um, prepare a memo. So what legal will do is we'll prepare a memo with our opinion on um, what titles and what terms can be used within our law, and then we will also put in that memo um, perhaps suggestions for um, what the board has the authority to do regarding educating the public on what they can and can't do. Um, for instance, um, putting out um, bulletins or um, uh, emails or social media that are typically done by our internal communications team um, versus whether or not we could do letters, things like that. So the memo will be inclusive of our interpretation of the law and what we feel like next steps could be for the for the board. Would it be possible to send out, I know we're not doing a newsletter now, is that my understanding, where this had, had been a means of communication. We need to let the registrants know what is appropriate and what's not because you know as a graduate of this I know this individual as a graduate of the, of the same program that I attended they've changed their name so I'm sure she felt like she could do the same thing because I'm, I'm here I know differently but the average person is not going to know that and we've got to do something to let them know that they can't do that she's she needs to change her website she's gonna have to change business cards you know and that's that takes time and money and she's when, it's just going to be a huge ripple effect you know, uh, it is more appealing, you know, to say you're this as opposed to what you're allowed to call yourself. And I think we need to stop it um, and move move forward with, uh, you know, a positive response and get this done. So. Thank you. I, I know there are programs uh, in, in the country that have interior architecture in their architecture department. And I had an architect that worked for me that had architecture degree and an interior design degree, and therefore she got the ar interior architect's diploma. It's an actual diploma. It's not, she can practice either or or uh, both. That's not the case in Tennessee that at this is, point. I, that's what I understand. So that's Correct. why I'm bringing that up. Right. If, if the, if the, education requirements are not in line with what they need to be that that may be part of what legal can advise us on as, as part of their research uh, you know at, it's my understanding at the University of Tennessee Knoxville the interior design students and architecture students take all the same courses uh, until they get to um, physics and there's a different course there and then their junior senior year they're more and separated unless they do a joint studio uh, but they don't take the ARE and so to me the way it's set up in Tennessee at the moment it may change um, 
the other interior design programs do not have an architecture program that they are taking courses with as well. So you've got Memphis and Knoxville that have architecture within the interior design program and the rest of the colleges do not. So we don't have equal playing fields with this situation as well. And so I know at UT Knoxville they make them sign a statement that they can only call themselves an interior designer, and I say that respectfully. Um, but then they still put on their Facebook page, I'm graduating in interior architecture, and then I happen to see them, and then I have to say, no, you can't use that term. you know. And then they go back and they look at their documents again, and they realize they can't. So I, I don't have time, and neither does this board, to police everything that's going on like this. That's why I think we need to make a strong statement and you know, until the appropriate legislative action can occur, if it's in the curriculums are changed to make it legitimate you know, interior architecture degree and an examination that goes with it, so. Susan, what, uh, what stance do the interior design associations take on this? Different from my opinion. <laughs> um, the uh, CIDQ feels like what our education involves is interior architecture, um, as well as ASID and IIDA. Um, and that may be the opinion, but unless there's an education that goes along with it and a test that verifies it, to me it's, you know, it's, it's not there. And they'll probably kick me out for saying that on record, but anyway. I have a high respect for y'all's profession. Every project I work on, I work with an architect because I do, you know, multi-million dollar construction projects and I respect what you all do and I feel like your all's profession needs to be recognized as such. I could say it, I'm a me too also, but I'm not going to do that because I, I see the differences in what I do and what you all do. So, uh, I Ms. don't Ballard. know if we, I'm sorry. Oh, I did want to address um, just uh, the comment about the C CIDQ um, having the stance that they do about um, the, the term involving architecture. Um, it is very likely that some other states do allow this term in their statute. Um, so it, it is hard when comparing our state to what national organizations um, might approve. Um, so that is um, something we can always remind them if, it, you know, we're kind of butting heads as far as what our statute states versus what the national organization is allowing. Only, I, I, I guess, of course, I agree with everything you said, Chair, and thank you, Susan, for bringing this to our attention. Um, whatever we can do, I think, right now, legally, I think what we, it's what we should do, whether it's a strong memo or if there's any other enforcement, I think that's, um, you know, we, we just went through a two-year long, at least, you know, getting architecture out of our poor interns, <laughs> you know, so that how they were going to be represented, and then, you know, we're allowing someone else to do it easily. So I, I don't know what's all about, and I, I'm, I appreciate you just looking more into it as you are um, legal to see exactly what we can enforce. But whatever we can, I think we should, and then um, kind of go to that next step from there. But um, seems like we don't have a lot of legal ground, but whatever we can do, let's let's do it. And I would like to note, as far as enforcement goes, um, besides um, education and providing information is, is separate, but for enforcement, um, we do start that with the complaint process. So um, the board cannot, um, I guess, dish out discipline unless we are notified through a complaint um, that there's been a violation of our law and rules. Um, so I, I, I agree. I think um, we'll, we'll get the memo that has a clear analysis of, of what we do have the authority over and then some possible next steps for the board. So it's, it's probably unrealistic that you'll have that information for us by tomorrow at 8 when we have our architect landscape and interior design meeting with the professors <laughs> well, it sure depends on how long you keep us here today <laughs> well, um, is there I, any other business on this? No. <laughs> I do have one comment I, I don't see how we can tell them you're doing the wrong thing if we don't have something in writing that states that and so that's why I'm bringing it up or what the limitations are or you know we don't have any guidelines we don't have any ground rules for them to even say you can't do this so we don't feel like they can do it, but we've got to have something in writing. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. So. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, uh, Liz, I think I'm, 
I'm just kidding, but I'm not. You know. <laughs> I have no. um, noted it on my to-do list regarding motions that the board committees have have asked of legal. So um, hopefully we could have something for you for the next meeting. Of course, you're welcome to discuss the topic um, throughout you know your um, three-day meeting this week as well. I know um, at least for education purposes, um, there are people that do watch our our meetings. So perhaps the topic will will get out there through through this sort of communication as well. Well, uh, you know, we we uh, we always have a few talking points that we want to discuss, um, different opinions and that type of thing with them. Um, would would it be possible that we could maybe consult on what talking points on this particular uh, issue is with them in terms of, you know. Um, is there any kind of a preliminary legal opinion? I mean, if the opinion is we got to look into it, that's fine. I, you know, if we are pursuing it as a board to kind of develop a definition. What are we doing? Well, any opinion generally that comes from legal, if Liz creates drafts it, she she drafts it. I review it. My boss reviews it, and if requested, our general counsel would review it. So I can't tell you how long it generally takes to draft something like that but I could tell you that it could not be done in the next 48 hours well, I, I understand that I, I was just kidding about that but oh, okay sorry but I thought no, that was no, serious no. I apologize no 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 I, <laughs> well, I what, what I wanted was was some type of a statement that might be might come from legal that we have been requested by the board and we are what are we doing to determine if that is if we can limit that use of that term or or, or is it legal to use it? I mean, you know, our, our opinion, our opinion oh. is our opinion, and, and we don't want right. to make a statement that isn't correct. Right. Well, um, you know, legal, we can always give you an opinion as to how we feel either something could be interpreted or whether or not a certain activity is or is not a violation under the statute or rules, um, and we can provide that to to the board with our recommendation um, the the board itself has the statutory authority to interpret its own laws um, so so you all can do that but we can help you along that way to do that um, so so that's something that we can do um, to see where it would be and generally it's it, something like this would be a name use violation like w and under what statute would it be a violation um, if it could or could not be be done, that's generally kind of where where I see that these issues lie. Um, when we look at them, that makes sense. Does that? So, so um, the summary basically is we've asked legal to look into a potential name use violation, yes. and that'll be based on uh, their search into the. The, the current laws or help me help me with my statement oh yes so so um, if you're just looking for for a statement then you're you're requesting is it is the term interior architecture is yes. that what, so you're requesting legal to to provide analysis as whether or not the use of the term interior architecture would be a violation under the board's uh, statutes or, or, or otherwise regulations all right that's thank you yeah that's, that's what I was okay looking no, I for, but I wasn't very clear I'm sorry that's okay yeah. that's okay that's all right okay. it's, uh, it's, it's right. pretty normal thank for us you. thank you uh, is there any other business this morning Mr. Thompson, can, I, can I address uh, potentially uh, the, the PDH rules right? yes. is, is, is that something that would be appropriate to do now sure for for the so this is for the architecture architect part rules of the PDH amendments and I think I'm, I emailed you I think back in July and we haven't had time to discuss I apologize I hadn't followed up on it but I do have some concern um, about the architects amendments um, because in hindsight when reviewing this as they were being passed um, through uh, through its normal process of review the question was brought up as to what is is there any negative impact unintentional negative impact from these rules and in looking at it I noticed that number one it's it's drafted significantly differently different from um, the engineers landscape architects and interior designer rules 
And when I looked at it, when you work out the prior to 2021 and subsequent to 2021 provisions of the rule, I think it, I think it has licensees on, be, on being able to meet the requirements of the PDH. Um, and so that's, that's something that I wanted to discuss either with this committee or with the full board just to look and see um, what you're all just well to bring up and recognize this is the issue that I see and then I have a recommended fix to this um, for the for the either the committee or the board to consider um, but as written right now this rule kind of has a it's kind of at a at a stalemate of moving further throughout the process and it's really and it's honestly it's holding up the entire package of rules um, so I just really want to have that discussion so that you all understand kind of our point of view and and kind of the fix the recommended fix that we have I think we ha we have one is a, a pretty easy fix but it will change um, it would change the um, how, how PDHs would be um, the requirements for um, the first biannual and subsequent biannual re renewals. So this, the, and I did get your your email. Thank you for sending. I that. apologize. No, no, no. I, I understand. I, it, um, so, is this is this a subject? Do we have time this morning to discuss this further? I mean, I I don't want to encroach into engineering, but. Uh, they're going to take all day anyway. So. And I'm and I'm available for the, for the next two days. Whenever 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 would be appropriate time to to, to bring it up. I'm I'm available. That's one what, of the main reasons why. What I is the potential negative in, impact you're talking about? The, the first uh, the potential negative one of the, the there's basically two categories. So the rule says that um, anyone so anyone who if this rule is passed, anybody who let's just say that this rule passed and it was effective as of right now, anyone who's renewing in 2018 and 2019, when their next renewal is in either 2020 or 2021, the rule requires that they show 12 PDHs per calendar year, and all 24 PDHs in total have to be in health, safety, and welfare. They can carry over 12 PDHs earned in excess of 24 from the 2016 to 2018 or 2015, 2017 period. What ends up happening is they have to do 12 PDHs per calendar year. If somebody's renewal is in July of 2018, then the PDHs that they would have to show is 12 per calendar year, and it creates almost a, a situation of impossibility when the renewal cycle runs across three separate calendar years, six months within 2018, all of 2019, and then six months within 2020, the rule says 12 PDHs per calendar year. It just, it does not, it, it because it has the term calendar year in there, it creates, and, and the other rules don't have the, the calendar year in there, it creates this, this question of exactly how is it supposed to be administered, and it, I thought it created a, a potential impossibility within, within that rule. Um, it also allows um, it also allows carryovers um, prior to 2021, 12 carryovers, but that would not be available to somebody who was a new registrant because they would not have had. We looked at that scenario of, oh, well, what if they had some previous PDHs that they could carry over? Well, if you were a new registrant, you wouldn't be able to carry that over because you wouldn't have a, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have that. Um, Just a calendar year term. The calendar year term is what really creates the difficulty because the in let me put it in perspective it's the the revi the amended rule for architects says 12 pdhs per calendar year um the previous rule that we had and then for the rules for engineers landscape architects interior designers 24 pdhs in two years and that's what creates the flexibility amongst two actual years so um with um with the architect's rule it's tw it's 12 pdhs per calendar year everyone else went to 24 pdhs um in two years if the architect's rule said that it would it, it wouldn't create this uh, impossibility where you can't get 12 pdhs in in certain calendar years because somebody for instance the rule may already go into effect in 20 in 2019 they have to renew in 2020 and they didn't start doing their pdhs until 2019 so they would 
they wouldn't have enough. They wouldn't have 12 per calendar year um, the, for those people who get their 24 on the back end of things. Um, so, so, so the the suggested fix was is that they that the rule could be uh, amended to 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 the other um, professions, engineers, arch, landscape architects, and interior designer, designers. Um, and it would it would fix the it would fix the issue, um, and and I apologize I wasn't here when the rule was you know suggested for amendment so I don't know if there is a background as to why that one is different. There, I personally don't remember us demanding it be calendar, you know the term calendar year be used. I could actually pass out something to you all to visually look at if that's helpful. I don't I don't know if you would want that now or if we're going to go too. F too too far into it right now. Oh, I'd say though, if unless you guys disagree, I think we could. Unless I'm missing something, but we could. That seems like an almost an easy one. Well, the, I, I, some quick background on that was that uh, as far as the in carb requirements, and we were trying to get a little closer to what that is in terms of licensure across states. Uh, the majority of the states now have gone to calendar year. And it, it is a requirement if you, and, and I know this is Tennessee, but we, we, we practice in 40 states and it, 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 it is a nightmare to try, if I'm practicing in Tennessee and I've got carryover hours and I'm rocking along thinking everything's fine and I get a job in Ohio, I can't practice there because our state law won't let me practice in their state. So therefore, it, 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 the reciprocal agreement is, is in jeopardy, which is not our intention to, to limit anyone from practicing in our, in our state or if we're penalized for practicing in another state because that we have all this carryover and all this stuff that's, that's antiquated and, and other states don't use it. That is one of the reasons that, that this was suggested. And, and, and I actually, Frank, you, you may not remember, but I, I, I did bring up the calendar year issue because I, you know, that I do that anyway, because, you know, I, I can get my hours in Tennessee because I do it in a particular way. I get more than 12 hours because some states are 14, some are 16. So, you know, I'll, I'll wind up, I've got 19 hours right now because I have to have 20 something in, in another state by the end of the year. So, and for a two year period, it's, it's very confusing across the board, but I think part of the biggest issue here is the carryover. I mean, they, they just don't allow carryover, and I don't know why we continue to do a carryover. It, do, it does not make sense because you are renewing on a licensure date. My, mine's in August. Yours is in July. And, and what, what does that do to the board and the staff? I mean, it, what's wrong with, you know, J1 through D31? Here, do it. Or don't have carryovers. I mean, you know, I, I would, I would, if we don't go to a calendar year, then I'm going to make a recommendation that we that we eliminate the carryovers. That is possible. That's without a doubt, as far as even from the office perspective, that carryover um, is always a phone call, an email, um, confusion to the licensees who aren't sure what carried over, what didn't. That's a big obstacle to us. Let me put this into perspective. Is that? The, the rules as amended for all of these professions, all of them, already drafted in there is that from 2021 onward, no carryover. That was, that was I, th I thought, I, not having been in the meeting, is, was the idea is that there, there's moving towards, beyond 2021, there will be no carry, carryover. And for the professions such as the engineers and the landscape architects, they have two years to get those 24 PDHs, as opposed to 12 per calendar year. And so, and so the, the need for a carryover becomes less of an issue since they have a full two years to do it. But all of these programs as, sorry, I'm going to call them professions, all of those professions as drafted, including this one, has, has a no carryover. The reason why I bring it up is that the, the carryover created a, an, an issue is that it was 12 PDHs per calendar year. Now let me put this, let me say this also is that all of the other professions, engineer, landscape architect, and interior designer, also adopted an alter alternative approach. 
And the alternative approach would allow the board to um, accept 12 PDHs per calendar year in all of those programs. So, in a, again, on 2021, has no carryover. So basically, there was previously a um, alternative approach in all of the professions. In 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 architect did not did not adopt this an alternative approach, but it would allow for both. It would allow for both so that if if there was a and I'm assuming to the to the point you made earlier of of other states that if somebody came from another state or if you wanted to do the 12 PDHs per year the board would actually accept it and you can actually use that in another state so it seems like because Tennessee <coughs> maybe has a has a different way of doing it we allowed both ways to do it on the PDHs and so all of the, all of the other professions had that except for for architects um, so that was it so that was a suggestion that may Kind of fill that gap of that concern you had is that there was a there was a there was a you know this is the way we're going to do it but also um, you can do it this way which would be 12 per calendar year each each of the programs would be able to accept. Uh, we're we're good with that. Yeah. That that clears it up. If, if you it, it was just it, some confusion there okay, for, no, for, and for me, maybe not these guys. But and I, I completely I completely understand, and I apologize. I didn't catch it months ago when we were drafting these and looking at these. I think it was it was on hindsight when somebody brought it up, like let's calculate this out, create a spreadsheet, and see what happens. We realized that I think that's when we realized it happened. Um, okay, well that makes that makes perfectly good so, sense. So I mean, are you all comfortable adopting? You know, Making a motion to d adopt that um, that amendment change, or or do you want to discuss it further? I think we I think we are ready for a motion, and I'll defer to my colleagues. Yeah. And so the restating, I'll go ahead. You and this would and this would be the committee's motion to take it to the full board for their motion. I so move. Second. So for the full board, will we have a, a copy of that of this motion that I, I can read into the record, or we can read into the record? I'm going to get it all confused if I write. Oh, <laughs> we'll, we'll guide you. We'll do Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Yeah, so I, I think we have a motion and a second. A second. Need, need a vote. Uh, call for a vote. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. That, that was a little. Before oh, we adjourn, I know we got to go. Was there another one as well, or was it just that one? No, there, it was just it was just okay. the 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 architects. Okay. Um, okay. Anything else? Or are we adjourned for this committee? Uh, we uh, have, have a motion to adjourn. Yep. Motion, so, so motion made. On favor, aye. Aye. Motion. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, we ran over for the. Rookie, we're all set. We're on the record. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, welcome to the engineer committee meeting. Uh, notice of the October 3rd through 5th, 2018 meeting of the Board of Architectural and Engineering Examiners was posted to the Board of the Architectural and Engineering Examiners website on September 26th, 2018. So um, we need a roll, roll call. Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Ricky Versailles? Here. Mr. Robert Campbell? Here. Ms. Catherine Weir? Here. Mr. Alton Heathcote? I am here. Thank you. Mr. Stephen King? Here. All here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Roxana. The first order of business uh, are applications and audits for review, and Wanda just handed us a couple. Uh, one for discussion and one for review. So we'll, um, I guess we need to take, why don't, why don't everybody just take some time and look at both of those cases on the iPad. Um, take about five or ten minutes, whatever it takes to, to look at those.
guys let me know when you're ready to go over these. I have a want to volunteer to take us through a discussion on Gawande. The <clears throat> I can, I think. Um, I think the issue here is we agreed, excuse me, we agreed to have a, to have CLEP courses take uh, up for the general education credit. Uh, Dr. Smith says that that's okay, but that those CLEP courses need to correspond with the NCWS uh, criteria. Um, and he lists that in there. And I'm sorry, I don't have it right, right in front of me, but I'll find it in a second, his words. Um, and he said marketing does not. Um, NCWS says that marketing does uh, is is okay to substitute for general education. So I think the question comes down to us is, are we going to go with NCWS's criteria for general education, or do we go to D uh, Dr. Smith's recommendation for that? Uh, second thing is is we may need to revisit the CLEP, our understanding of what, if, if that's the case, that we're going to have CLEP courses that meet the NCWS criteria, we may ought to state that in our uh, our policy um, instead of just saying CLEP courses, nothing after that. Um, so, did that sound? And I, I'm I, my, myself personally, I think we've relied on Dr. Smith over the years, and so I'm, I'm a little conflicted because to me, marketing is a general education. You know, I mean. That's to me, but uh, again, that's one person. Yep. No, I think that was a good summary. One one question I have is there. Let's see what page this is. On page fifteen of forty one, there's an email from Doctor Smith that where he says he doesn't believe the course appeared on a, an official transcript. Also, the character of the course should meet the NCEES guidance which this one did not. So I wonder, it makes me wonder if if the course actually does meet the NCEES guidelines. Uh, if Dr. Smith knew that, would he then approve the course? In other words, he, he was, he's not taking issue with NCEE. Uh, it looks like he was thinking that he, he was agreeing. His interpretation of the, on the next page, on okay. page 16, yep. it says, First, the NCWS guidance identified general education courses as definition was that it didn't meet it, but NCWS. Yeah, I wonder. So I wonder if his conclusion might have been different if he knew that NCES's interpretation of their own criteria was that it did. Mine, mine would, because they're the ones that crafted the. Well, also, Ricky, if you look on page uh, on the table on page twelve, principles of marketing is listed, even though it's not called out as, in the paragraph above at the very beginning at the top of the page. It says no more than six credit hours may come from courses in management, accounting, business, or law. But then, if you go to the bottom of the table, principles of marketing is listed. It is. So that I mean that's pretty contradictory I and most of us think that that probably falls into the management yeah. side I mean, marketing talks about it's not a personal craft it talks about people's uh, buyer, personal skills uh, yeah and what am I trying to say it talks about interactive skills yeah and how how, how you understand sell to people needs. and what yes uh, um, one of these days the I can understand English you words, may not be good at that the, the English words will come up I'm, I'm probably not very good at it as a matter of fact. Um, but um, you know I, I got a uh, MBA with that as a concentration but I'm probably not very good at it but, well it, you know. I agree with what you I, what I think you were saying is you know what what dr. Smith said in his email was culture courses that install cultural values are acceptable while personal craft or not and I do think of marketing is a, a area of study where they talk about cultural values and that sort of yeah. thing. So I, yeah, I agree. But isn't the bigger issue the fact that he didn't get it at a regionally accredited university? He just got this is from the college board, quote unquote. That's who administered this. 
Who is we allow, that? But we allow that. Do we allow that? We allow CLEP courses to, you know, we Specifically? Allow, yes, yes, okay. ma'am, we do. All right, let's see. Look on Kathy, page, page nine at the table that we created, the last item number 10, okay, so we, CLEP credits. Well, line says, 10 is referring to that college. That's my program. understanding. Is that right? Plus, Cynthia's okay. on page 15, Cynthia's email back to Dr. Smith, the board agreed to accept CLEP courses to fulfill up to 12 semester hours of humanities, social sciences deficiencies. It says only if they're offered by a regionally accredited college or university and appear in the official college or university transcript. I, I That's the part I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It does this. That's not the know? same. I mean, can you provide some clarification? Where do, where do we see, where did this course bottom. come from? Mr. Gawande explained to me at, when I told him that the transcript was unacceptable that he did take the course from an accredited school, but that once he gets that clip, the transcript that he sent us, that it has to be sent to the accredited school, and then they... I told him to hold off because I wasn't sure... If it would be accepted. Yeah, if it would... Say where, which? Okay. Well, I'll throw I'll throw an idea that may it's coming down to whether we accept this course or not because that that will take him from nine to twelve hours. And do we do we want to make a motion where if we can verify that this course uh, comes from an accredited school that we would uh, accept? this is meeting our humanities requirement I, th I think so is that i'd like to make that motion okay all right anybody second i'll second but i want to make sure the motion is we accept yeah. the marketing class uh, with the provision that it does come from an accredited the clep courses come from an accredited university and that proof can be provided he provides that documentation okay. sound good yes okay well, right. i have one question before we go with that all right on page on page 10 Engineer Committee policies, guidelines for allowing distance learning. All distance learning courses must meet or exceed the following requirements. Does it have to exceed all of the following requirements or just one of the following requirements? I'd like to understand exactly what we're going to approve or disprove in the future. Because one of these, number four says, courses must be pre-approved in writing by the board. So does he only just have to have number one, which is offered by a two- or four-year regionally accredited institution, or does he have to have one through nine? Because I know that that's one of the things that Wanda wrote him back was, we recommend that you get the course approved in writing by the board prior to paying for it, basically. And we don't want people going out there and paying for courses and then them not getting credit for it when they come to the board. I would assume that it implies that they have to meet all of those. And me too. I read, I read those also, Kathy, but I, I, again, my assumption was that this CLIP course was provided by some university that that adhered to all of those guidelines. But I don't know where the university is, and apparently we, we don't. We still don't know that. Yeah. He said it was accredited, but he didn't say which one. I, I think the motion still stands, and I think R Robert's clarification is still a good clarification. That's a good point. You made Kathy, and whether that number four is something we feel like we need to enforce or not, whether it's this case or in the future, that's. I don't ever remember a course coming up for us to pre approve for this. I would say let's not be in the business of pre approving courses and writing. Well, that sounds were, like a lot of work for if staff. If it were approved by NCAAS, I mean, wouldn't we accept it? I mean, I, I think so. It's just that wording says by the board, and that seems really clumsy to me. Yeah. What, what we normally do is send to Dr. Smith. So, we do, don't, so you yeah, do get that? Yeah, we don't bring it to you all. We send okay. it to Dr. Smith. Okay. Right. <clears throat> but in this case, this guy didn't get it pre-approved, so he would not meet. He would be disqualified because he didn't meet one of the criteria.
But who did he get it pre-approved by? By him. He didn't get it approved by the board. He sent me an email and asked, did okay. we accept them? I talked to Wanda about it, and she said yes, that they were acceptable as long as they were from a regionally accredited, from a regionally accredited school. And at that time, he went and took the club course. Just specifically say pre-approved in writing by the board, which yes. I maybe we need to take that up as another agenda item. But I would, I would sort of be willing to overlook that if it were NCWS approved and it were provided by an accredited university. And he, and he did, he did contact the the board before, so that okay. I don't have a problem with what he did or giving him credit for it. I just want to be consistent yeah. as we move forward, and I want us all yeah. to have something that we look back on and understand the reason why we made the decision. Right. But as far as whether or not he should get credit for it, assuming that he's going to send it somewhere that's going to come back with a transcript that acknowledges it as a clip from that institution, I say absolutely give him credit. But I just want to make sure we understand why. Yeah. So if the institution is accredited – Okay, I think that's I think that's what the motion said. That okay, is any other any other discussion ready for a vote? All in favor of approving? Do we have a second to that motion? Robert we seconded. He did. He second with a restatement. Okay, all in favor of approving? Aye. 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 Opposed. So, do we want to, this item of number four, and we don't necessarily need to talk about it right now, but maybe the next engineering committee meeting, we may need to refresh that a little bit. Because he got pre-approval in writing by the board, means the board. Or any of its... <laughs> Well, no. staff members. Uh, I, I, it means the board. Yeah, Roxanna, can I know we, we can't take it up because it wasn't a, an agenda item to start with. But can oh, but we? But you add can. It? I think while the committee is meeting, like you all are, we can discuss. And I'm not. And, I'm, again, I don't know that. Yeah. So, so here's what I don't want to do. If we've got that in there, and it gets approved by s staff, I don't want to put you all in a position where it says board. And somebody can say, well, we're, it says board, but the staff's approving it. I mean, if, if that's the way it needs to be, and that's, I'm, I'm not saying one way or the other. I just think we need to have, I think that's a great point, a clarification of is it's Dr. Smith the board? Right. Is the staff the board? We need to understand what that means in this context. And, and I think the, I think probably taking it out uh, is probably the right thing to do because I'm not sure that it adds any value because we've given them a set of criteria be, for mm -hmm. what's approvable, right. uh, and I just think that muddies the waters. That one, that one that thing is, there. So I, that's a good, a good call. I agree, and and I don't think that the staff wants to or that we need to be the ones debating that Dr. Smith sounds great, but otherwise we we wouldn't be debating it. Yeah, but even Dr. Smith is not the board. Correct. Right. That you know, statement is very confusing. With the yes. capital B, right? So that's uh, if, if they if they want to approach the board staff to before they take a clip sure. credit, that's great. But we can't. I mean, we we don't need to be trying to pre-approve courses. Yeah, yeah. Get into that business if we've got a criteria set up for them to right. have them approved. We right. don't need to be in the process of saying that they just need to meet the criteria that we have there so i think that's probably a little extraneous so what do we have to do to change the policy and, and eliminate item number four the board can also <clears throat> excuse me the board can also designate um authority to the direct the executive director to make those calls in lieu of the board um, meeting to discuss them as well that's an option how would we restructure the language then in line item four? You know, I was I was thinking about that and thinking we could, you can almost take the pre out and say course must be approved in writing, and instead of saying the board, you could say the board staff. Um, well, you don't have but, to change the language. Um, okay. The board 
Uh, this board can interpret the board as, as the board you, staff. You're designating the executive director to make that decision as well. So Wouldn't that we be confusing to, to somebody who was reading the rule? I mean. How would, how, would, how would they know they wouldn't have to submit something formally to the board? And well, they still or? do have to submit something to the board, um, but rather than bringing it to our um, – uh, well, I guess you don't meet quarterly, you meet every other month. So rather than bringing it to those meetings, they would submit it in writing to the board, but Roxana, as executive director, would act as the board in making those decisions if you grant her the authority to do so. I just want to make sure a year from now we're, we're not in this same situation and we reread this and forget that we've made that, that designation. I mean, to me, clarification, if we, some way to clarify it, uh, to sort of stipulate that, I think it would be cleaner. And I, I, I agree. I think, I think if we just take number four and say courses must be, must meet the NCWS guidelines, and be done with it. I mean, I think um, not having the board, having the board, we've given them a set of criteria where they're going to be acceptable, haven't we? I mean. The fact that it's yeah, approved. but you know, Robert, it, NCWS criteria and what they accept changes over time, and, and the board may or may not be in conflict with what they allow. I, I think all of this is really, really good. I just take number, I just take number four out. But I mean, I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> you know, the board, the board is everything. the The board is not the engineering committee, and so the board is everything. And if that's designated to Roxana or Wanda or someone else, then it still counts as quote approved by the board. Um, I just I'm just thinking that the board as a whole shouldn't be in the business of approving courses. I mean, go go through the process and just don't say that we're going to approve courses. That that's all. And if we say NCWS, then we always have to know what it is that NCWS finds acceptable. Well, I think we ought to have. I I, understand, I agree with that, but I think we also need to provide the registrants some guidance that NCWS has a please refer to NCWS or something so yeah. that they know yeah. what courses are generally acceptable by NCWS and others. Uh, and that may be the purpose of why we had number four in there to begin with Indeed. was so that somebody just didn't take a flyer and take volleyball or something and think that was a CLEP course. Uh, and something like marketing, which refers, you know, has some human behavior stuff in it and, and different things that, that are important. Um, just as an, as an example of how that my suggestion might work in practice. The um, sorry, my microphone it sounds funny. Um, the accountancy board has um, a firm name stipulation where the board has to approve the names. Um, that board meets quarterly. Their rule just their rule does says say approved by the board, um, but that board granted authority to the executive director um, Wendy Garvin to approve the names um, in lieu of bringing them to the quarterly meetings, and then names that um, might be out outliers or ones that she's unsure of those make it to the board meeting so rather the board rather than the board going through every single firm name approval at their quarterly meeting she only brings them maybe one or two that were questionable um, so this board could do something similar as far as allowing the director to have that discretion without um, amending the rule just wanted to give you that clarification oh man I, I would be okay referencing NCES guidelines I know there's I know that they have a they can change over time but we're I don't think we're risking any um, any uh, public health safety here this is a it's a humanities requirement that just I think needs some definition and whether NCES changes or not, it is a findable standard that we can all reference at that time. And so it's not something we have to keep up with and and spend our time on. It's a standard that's there for us to use. And I, I have no problem using that standard, however they change it, because uh, we're kind of involved with that anyway. You know, we have a voice in that. So uh, I would be okay changing forward. It's, to, if we don't say it anywhere else, you don't have to make it part of the qualifying criteria. You can just have it as a statement after one through eight, or it would be one through eight at that point. We do. Or you just say it needs to meet the NC, you know, please refer to NCAA's criteria for acceptable. Good. And we do reference NCES. Okay. We may, dis different. we may disagree with NCWS. 
and we don't want either car. I forward the transcript to Dr. Smith and then the courses they wish to take and then he looks to make sure what they want to take is what is needed and then I, if he approve and then I'll let them know and then once they've taken the course then I'll send it back to him to make sure they've taken the right thing that's the process normally so do I not do that anymore just tell them to look at NCEES yeah, I think that that's a good question too because we're all he didn't do that I'm sorry. He, he didn't, didn't do, do that because no, we just said clip clip I, I did I don't know what clip is so we just told him a CLEP course would be acceptable. So that's why he didn't do that, because we didn't ask him to do that. We don't get maybe one or two CLEP courses in years. Oh, gotcha. But normally people just pick out a course they want to take, and then we send it through Dr. Smith for approval. That's the normal process. I think I've only had maybe two or three CLEP courses the whole time I've been on the board. In this case, Wanda or Cindy, did he did he ask whether or not this course would be approved before he took it? He didn't specify what CLEP course, but he did ask would a CLEP course be approved. Would it be acceptable? Okay. And we said yes, and he took the CLEP course, and NCAAS ruled that it was acceptable, even though Dr. Smith said he didn't think it was based on his interpretation of the NCAAS guideline. Okay. I still think we ought to clarify line item four for uh, for us in the future and for future board members. But I, I think is a CLEP different from a distance learning course, or are they is one a bigger set than the other? One is a subset of the other. What is the, what is the difference? Because one through nine apply to all distance learning courses, and then the criteria for a bit blah 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 blah. The very last one says CLEP credits. Will be accepted. So is CLEP part of a distance learning course set? I think it Do can be college level examination. What is it? Program is it or it is? What, 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 Basically, go test out of courses. Is my understanding? Yeah. It's what a CLEP course is. So you can go in and just not go through the course. Right. Just test out of it. Right. So. Here's what I think we ought to do. But I I'm just wondering if that the criteria of one through nine is applying to non-CLEP. It may be. Which is why this one is acceptable. Yeah. I, I just want to make sure we're applying the right criteria to whatever it is we're trying to evaluate. This is awfully confusing. I'm oh, sorry. Well, so, so what I think we I ought to do, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, is let's, again, put this as an – we've had some good discussion, but let's put this as an agenda item to kind of clarify those kind of things. If, if you can get us – maybe just a three sentence here's what a clip is here's what we've got so that and well, let's discuss this at the next because we do one or two a year one or two ever so many i mean it's not something that's time sensitive that if we don't get it right this meeting we're not in trouble i i agree because i i think i, I think i had the wrong idea now that i've looked up the definition clep is not a course clep is a an exam you can take to get credit for having taken a course that you didn't take. So he took a test on marketing and he got CLEP credit. So I I agree. I, why don't we just note that this we need to look at this number four and we'll bring it up at the next engineer committee meeting. Um, and Roxanne, if we like if we want to take stabs at rewording and maybe we have like three or four options can we send those to you yes and, and you and can distribute listen, those I'll, before the meeting and we'll look at them beforehand also just to make sure that that'll be a, a change that's that makes sense it makes forward. sense so th so why don't l let that be our homework assignment is get our ideas to roxana whether they're a, it's a restatement of four or whether it's a statement that says get rid of it or whatever get that to her between now and the next meeting okay got a motion in a second we, right. we've voted we're, we're okay we did vote on on the, to accept this guy yeah okay. yeah we just went on to talk about four okay and these engineer committee policies remind me are those on our website or where are um, these policies on the 
humanities. I can't remember. I wouldn't think they would be. I wonder if we need to, how do we get to those to, so we can kind of look at these? Do you need to, why don't, Wanda, why don't you send those to us, if you would, okay? That, I've got another question. Are there other <laughs> engineering committee policies that are out there that may not be on the website that, well, and again, if there are policies, um, they would be on the website. We'll make sure that they get there. And if they need to be addressed and incorporated into rules, as opposed to having just policy, it's out there. That's definitely something we want to think about. Uh, even if we just had a copy of them for our own review and edification, I think that would be really helpful. I've not seen them, so we'll make sure that they're on the website and that everybody has them. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Roxana. You. Thank you. Cindy and Wanda, thank you too. Okay, um, if we are finished with that discussion, we go on to the application for review here. Does somebody want to guide us through that? I, I can. I, I know Joe a little bit. Uh, he's been manager at Jellico uh, Utilities for a while. Um, what specifically, is he asking? He's he's not currently a P. He, his license he's reapplied. His license lapsed. He had yeah, a previous license. Right, it, right. Lapsed it lapsed in January. I think. Yeah. Right. So he's reapplying because uh, I think he's interviewing for a neighboring utility at some point that is requiring a PE. Is my understanding. Um, and so, um, I mean, it looks like again he's he got good references. He got good. Uh, his experience looks fine. Um, he obviously graduated from a premier university, um, and um, so uh, to me, um, he's he's uh, he's good to go. I would make a recommendation that we go ahead and approve. Second. Okay. Any more discussion? I'm just curious as to why we have to. Uh, why are we doing this out of normal or order? Um, our reapply application process online. It's. Is that right? been trying to get registered for about a month or two, but is having issues. Been delayed. It's been delayed because of that. And he requested. Through no fault of his own. Yeah. No, okay. it wasn't his fault. Okay. It's our process. Okay. And so I told him I'd kind of rush it because he was really needing to get registered as soon as possible. Okay. I hope this works because I'm applying in another state right now and I'm having exactly the same issue on their website. Really? Mm-hmm. I'll ask a question after this, but go ahead. No, I, I mean, no, I'm good. I, 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 made, I don't know if we yeah. had a second. Well, no, we had a second. We're, just, we're in the comments. So yeah. Any other comments, any discussion? I'm just, can you tell a little bit more? What's the problem? It's something with the vendor, and I'm not sure exactly what happens, but when they try to go in and reapply, it for some reason it keeps kicking them out. And it normally happens with the reapplies, and I'm not sure why. Okay, so it's probably some code behind the it's, interface, it's, and it, the, when they sure look at it and they say they used to be a PE, yeah. then it just it won't go through, it defaults, and it kicks them out of the system. Yeah. And I think, again, it, it's we're presenting it because you all are here, and right. he's in a rush. Otherwise, it would go through. Right. He, he doesn't have to do it online. We can get it in quickly and move through those. But we'll make sure that the vendor tries to treat it as a priority so we can get the system to work for him. Other discussion? All right. All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So, quick comment, and this is nothing we don't have to discuss, but it follows up on the, what Kathy had said. I've heard a couple of other comments, not some about this board, just the computer systems and the online applications um, being squirrely. And I, I'll use that as a technical term. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I think technology is great when it works. Um, but if it if it's causing our registrants to have to spend hours re-entering information and re-logging back on hours that they hopefully could be spent doing some productive things to make state of Tennessee a better place to live, I would incur. I don't know what process that we have to elevate those issues with IT uh, to the right place. Is there a is there a committee that looks at IT issues and and 
sends those to the vendor? Is there any accountability to a vendor? Um, because again, I mean, you take how many applicants that we have during the course of a year, and if they're all spending two hours trying to muddle through some stuff, and I know that's bad math, but um, it it's not a good situation. And, and again, I've heard it through uh, for this board, surveyor boards, other boards that some of the select electronic stuff is not as whiz bang as we want it to be, and it's causing frustration which causes other issues. So is there a group that's looking at those or do you, when you get a issue, do you send it to? So the issue, it, obviously if they put it in writing and send it, um, and the main website to every program is a centralized, um, it, it, it's part of our centralized email and phone system. So that is the best way to send an email to. If you just go to the A&E page, you'll see the email. That gets logged in so that they're sure that we get it. And it would be, you know, I've been trying to log in for a day and a half or two. I've started the uh, reapply application. It's kicked me out. Here's a screenshot. I'm complaining about the system. It, it, this shouldn't be that deep. That writing um, definitely then we take up with the IT folks that we have internally and they I believe have a call with the vendor always scheduled every week. So that is the best way to get these high priority items in front of them so that we know the status and maybe it's not fixed within a month or two but at least it stays there and it's in writing. So anytime we get it, I think that's the, the route to go. And if you get one, encourage them to give us anything they can. The screenshot of being timed out, um, the request that isn't taking place. For a while, we had issues with the password. It was just a, a CAPTCHA issue to try to keep you from hacking in. So that delayed some folks. Um, a lot of those have been resolved, but, but these kind of things, yeah, there's no reason for an architect or an engineer to spend two hours on an application. If that's without a doubt. I can just tell you, I just recently had to submit a license, a request for a contractor license. It took me 16 hours to You're get with us? Yep, Tennessee. Contractor Licensing Board. And after I'd spent six, and I know it was 16 because it was all day Monday and all day Tuesday, and I didn't go to work because that's all I did. And when it was all done, they still sent me something that said, here's all the deficiencies. And I thought, and I, and I attached all of it, and I sent it all back again. So it's not two hours, just so you know. I, mean, I'm just I, I know, but you said that might be bad math. I mean, it, I think it's a function of that. And I've heard the same thing from applicants from out of state. You know, they don't have the luxury of being here, and they can't. They don't know people in the state, but they're going online. I don't know what they're spending, but I know it's probably the same. Like you said, it's a kind of the same system. And from the contractor licensing board perspective, it's exceedingly inefficient. giving you feedback I'm not fussing no I appreciate <laughs> it just what you know and I'll also um, try to reach out to some other organizations and let them you know maybe put blurbs and newsletters and stuff that say hey if you're having these kind of problems please it's the do only this, way that we'll, yeah. we'll get it and again I know you are not in yeah. charge of IT I just want right. to make sure they're right. getting right. because it's our applicants that we're ultimately responsible for Okay, um, ready to move on to the next. Oh, excuse me, Rick. We still yeah. have the engineer intern certificate, uh, the uh, reference form. Did we finish with the application? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was going to move move on to that, and it looks like if Just we are last page. on page forty. Look at so forty and forty one, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And. So, we're bringing this before you, and Cindy can answer any questions. She is our expert that touches these. These are the actual engineering intern certificates that we send. Um, you've got an image of what the certificate looks like. But if we could start with talking about the form itself, you've got the blank one there. Um, right now our process, and Cindy will correct me if I've missed anything, but our process is when the universities complete these, we have a signature on the form and the signature should be the dean or a person that's been designated and approved to sign and one of the problems that i think from the time i got here cindy mentioned to me is that we don't always know who is approved by the universities to sign them um, we've sent out letters asked universities to always update us on who the correct person is to sign these and and we don't often get a response so with that, I ask that we kind of talk about it, see if this board would approve 
for the form and now is a good time if you think something needs to be changed on the form as well but if the form can be completed and we not worry about who signed it as opposed to the division within the university the fact that it's the University of Lipscomb's engineering department and we can see the printed name and we can actually search their website for updated deans or chairs or the interim dean because even now with the grant things going on tomorrow I ran into that where we didn't have the right names and I'm waiting on our SVPs and they're no longer there so I can now feel for what she goes through which is she doesn't let these go through until she confirms the signature and I'm just wondering if instead of just worrying about a list of signatures we can accept the person that signed it with their title chair of engineer and then we can match it from their website or presence online uh, through the university and not worry about a list of signatures um, part of that's also we're, we're you know we're paperless so carrying around a report that gives us the names of who's authorized in each school is also cumbersome as opposed to us I think you uh, you kind of count on them to update that information too which may not be reliable Hopefully or, their website or easily is, accessible it, is more current than what they're sending us because we, we're just not getting updates on who is allowed to sign if the board is okay with us searching online to make sure that that individual that signed is part of the university and accepting it that way um, without a doubt that would help us yeah so and I don't know again the I know sometimes on contracts or work orders or things that I sign it will instead of saying uh, it says the person that has the authority to sign this document or something like that so uh, that may be another way to do it because you may have three or four people within a university that can attest to that would be my guess I mean you know, certainly um, you know it's a dean of a department or it, depending on how the how the university or college is structured it may be a uh, provost or I don't know I mean I I'm not trying to get in your business, Chris, but I mean, there's there's a there's probably different levels of people that can sign different things. You know, the register probably can sign certain. I don't know, so I would just put in there whoever has the authority to attest to this or that. Would, would you? Are you? It says right now, authorized college or university department head. Are you advocating changing that to? authorized college or university signatory or yeah, something I just like say that? authorized college or university person who's authorized sure, by the college or, or university or. to make to, to 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 certify this I mean that again typically and you've seen them too on contracts so you, you know the person that's responsible can can sign this from your company please sign it designated what, officer or whatever can, can we use the can we just use the term faculty and uh, I mean, why couldn't it be a professor who was, who's been we were authorized? Trying to simplify it so that I don't have to get yeah. these signatures because they'll send them in from people that haven't been authorized, and I have to go through having them authorized, which means the dean has to send me something on school letterhead stating that this person's authorized to sign. The dean signs it, and then the person signs it. But like UT Knoxville, they've sent me a whole list of advisors, student advisors that can sign. Um, but I mean they come and go and they don't notify me when they leave so it's this continuous thing of them sending me unauthorized signatures and me having to go through getting them authorized or getting the student to get them signed by someone who is authorized let, let me let me ask this then is um, would we have a problem with instead of the word authorized say something more like appropriate appropriate to sign a senior reference um, so that Cindy doesn't have to check a list. You know, you're having somebody sign it, date it, and says they're appropriate reference. I think that's why Roxanne wanted to say that's what I would love the department to say. head or dean, because if they sign it, I can look up online and see is this person actually the department. Oh, you want to just yeah. limit it to or this you want person to limit to the, the, the ones that are not so transitional. Okay, I agree with that. The other problem is now we have the people, you don't have to be a resident of the state, so I've got people from all over the United States that are applying who's authorized for those schools. Okay, well, I'm, yeah, but I'm, if, they're not in, if they're not even a senior, it, there's two different signature blocks, right? Right. right. So they're, if they're in school, we're, we're holding them to the super high standard of go find somebody with uh, signature authority. Right. And if they've already graduated, then anything goes. Pretty much. 
So why why are we doing that? Board member. Yeah. Why why don't we just why don't we loosen up some of the authority? I mean, it just seems like a double standard. I'm confused. There's two different. At first, I was hearing Cindy say it would be simpler just to limit the sig- signature to the department head, and that's or what de- or dean. And that's what's stated. It just says department head right now. That's not. They haven't actually filed that. Like I say, I've got a whole list of senior advisors that they wanted to be authorized through UT. But, but the concern is us even looking for the signature and trying to recognize a signature and match a signature and wait for a form with a signature. You know, those steps seem like wouldn't be needed. If if we just get the name and it matches the chair or a dean or staff on the university, we can just quickly research the website and move it on. But if they wait until after they graduate, you don't have to, they don't have to do that at all. Right. The second part, they don't. Why are we so holding them to such a double standard when they're still in school? I think it had to do with the schools that, to make sure that they were in good standing with the school. Maybe they didn't know money or there weren't any other issues. I think that's why it was that, originally that's exactly put in place. Correct. Yeah, I remember that. Well, you had to have senior standing, too, to be able to take the FE. Correct. Well, let, let me ask this, then. You deal with the form every every day. How would how do you want it? How how would what would you, what do you recommend the way it read? Because I'm a little confused. And, right and now. I like the the thought of authorizing the either the faculty or university or college um, responsible, you know, authority to sign. That way, we're not looking for signature, but we're looking for someone that's representing that that program. That's that all. that could go back to associates or. Let me ask this. Chris, Chris is here. If you don't, is it okay? Is it appropriate that I could ask yeah. somebody from the audience sure. a question? Chris, how difficult is it to for a student? And I'm assuming that um, y'all are helping them go through this exercise and process and encouraging them to do it. Um, how difficult is it to get a department head or a dean s- signature on one of these documents? It's not difficult for us now. Um, uh, at one time, I was signing these for the civil students, uh, and then all of a sudden, one came back and they said, uh, "You're not authorized to sign it." I'd been signing it for a couple of years, and then I wasn't. And so I called and asked, and they said, "Well, here's the form. Please send a letter from the dean that says that you are authorized now to sign on his behalf." And so we, at that time, just went in, and all the department, the dean authorized all the department chairs to sign that form, and we haven't had any trouble since. So it's not difficult for us, but we only have, you know, um, 60 graduating seniors. So it's, you know, it's... So uh, let's, let, let's take that a different direction. If it were at UT uh, and you have multiple colleges of engineering and, and hundreds and hundreds of students, I mean, it still doesn't seem to me that it would be difficult for a student, a senior student, to go get either the department head or a dean to, to sign one of these forms. Or am I... Is that incorrect? I wouldn't think so. The students, you know, are gone by the time they get this, for the most part. And they would just email it to me and say, could you sign this? And I'd scan it, sign it, scan it back in, send it back down. Fairly simple. Okay. Not not quite as simple as if you go back, you know, five years or so, when we just had the dean send out a letter of all of the graduating seniors. Well, I, I didn't know why that changed, but that was, I didn't know that it happened until I got this first form. And I said, well, this, the, you know, and this, it was kind of new. Uh, but, but before that, the dean just at the end of the year would always say, here's our graduating seniors. Send it to the board. And do you think what's the history were, on that? We just did that for a year or two, and then we were told we could not do that, that we had to have individual. Individual. Mm-hmm. Is the is the lower part of the application for for students that have left school and may not have act that they may go off to some long distance place and not have access? They could get a supervisor or a, some PE where they work to execute this. Okay, so the the lower part, and correct? that's somewhat of a problem too because we do have people that will take the exam as a senior student and several years later decide they want to get certified. And right now, I'm having to make them go back to the college and get a signature from someone at the school because right. they took it as a senior student. 
even though they're not a senior student now. But, but this lower part would allow them to get it from a supervisory PE? But that's only those that took it after graduation. If they oh, wow. Fundamentals after graduation. This is this it, is it is a cumbersome. more cumbersome process that from the beginning I've sort of wanted us to address. I thought this was a good time since the universities are coming. I'd like to get rid of needing to look for the signatures and matching and getting letters with approved signatures because that just, and you can but, imagine in a paper. Well, what's the point of, what's the, point of the there's college signature? Right. Is, it because, is it to establish that they are in good standing with the I, university? I believe that's the reasoning. But as, as Liz pointed out, even if we added a line that just says the person that's signing is authorized to sign the form, on behalf of the school, we've never had a complaint or an issue come back to where. Yeah, but I'm concerned about what Cindy, Cindy's saying that they, kids who may, you know, get a job in California, and now they got to figure out a way to, they got to find somebody who's willing to sign it for them who said that when they took the test, however many years ago, they were in good standing at the time. I mean, that's a huge burden for for not everybody, what, what but if, for, for a few. What, what if it's not a signature? What if it's a the printed name of the I think of I'm the reference right. and it's and so if they're in California and they went to Tennessee Tech they can call their professor Tennessee Tech and it and instead of saying department head it just says faculty appropriate instead of department head authorized it says faculty appropriate and the name is there and with the email address of the reference that you're saying this is my reference so if you wanted to email that person and say do you really think this is a good person i think one of the problems that cindy was talking about though is if it's i, I don't know a different way to say this and this isn't very diplomatic but if it's a lower echelon staff member those there's a lot of transition that occurs at that level, whereas a department head or a dean tends to be there for a very long period of time, and them going back and validating that this person was actually ever there and did have the authorization to sign it is cumbersome, I guess, at, at best. That they, they need to pick a reference who's still at the school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, that seems to be pretty easy to just pick a reference still at the school, but. I, I was hearing at at one point it sounded like it'd be easier if it could be any faculty that knew them, and then another point just the department head. Which which do you any think? Any faculty that could. You're thinking any faculty? Do you agree with that, Cindy? I mean, is that's it fine? Whatever. But okay, well, be, well, no. potentially. I'm sorry, Kathy. Go ahead. If we're going to allow anybody to sign it to say that they're in good standing with the university, then why are we requiring it to be signed at all? Because they can go to anybody. And then how would that person actually be in a position to say this student was in good standing at the university? Chris, do you have a... Yeah, I, I think this started, started at the time that the students could apply directly to NCES because bef before that time, that's when the dean would send the letter out and would say, yes, would, would let you all know, yes, you can approve this person to set for the FE exam. He is a student in good standing at the university. It was after they started applying directly to NCES, and you guys were cut out of that that step. Now you're only in that step after the fact that they passed the FE, that you want certification that they were in good standing to take the FE in the first place. That, that's kind of how I saw the the his history of this progress. I, I thought I seem to remember at an October meeting some years ago where the deans were actually here, they petitioned the engineering committee to do that because some of the students were leaving, they were giving them certifications, and they had trouble collecting that last semester's tuition. I, I, don't, I don't remember all of the exact circumstances, but I do remember that conversation faculty might not have that information at the, the time they're asked to so, sure. so who yeah. who yeah. at a at a school of engineering would know if somebody was in good standing we've, we've asked that question because when we look at the form and it says that they were in good standing i said what does that mean does that mean they they don't you know are, are they doing certain things they're 
they're passing classes, they're paying their bill, what's good standing mean? And we just decided, well, if they're here as a student, they're in good standing. <laughs> so I don't know. So, so Liz, is our, do our rules for taking the FE say that a, a student has to be in good standing? Do you know? I mean, so, so, so I'm going to ask this. What difference does it make? What dif what difference does it make if a freshman in college takes the FE and passes it? They still have to have be graduate from an A better accredited university. I, 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 do we have something in there? And, and, and I'm Our engineer um, intern rule is is pretty short. It says individuals may apply for certification as an engineer intern. An applicant who has passed the required examination and has met the other legal requirements shall receive a certificate. So what are the other legal requirements? Here's this form as part of the requirements. <laughs> <laughs> um, it looks like the rule was uh, written broadly to give the board more discretion to, you know, change the requirements over the years. So if, if filling out the form correctly is part of the requirement or um, it, this says required examination, so that's pretty vague as well. So whatever your current requirement for their examination will be, um, you can certainly make it more specific if you'd like. Um, but the rules written this way do give the board um, more discretion when uh, when requirements change, ebb and flow. So. Yeah, but so, so I mean, my, my my statement I, I think is this. Why do maybe you all tell me because I, I just can't get it in my mind. What difference do we care if a kid passes the FE when they're a freshman, if they're in good standing or if they're not in good standing? If they're what difference? They're still passing the FE, they still have to graduate from an ABED accredited university, uh, they still have to have four years' experience, and then they still have to pass the PE. So what difference does it make whether they, and again, I'm not trying to, you know, whatever on universities, but at some point we can't be the gate, either or we can't be the gatekeeper for each other because our rules, I don't think, allow us, there's nothing in our rules that say that we have to, they got to be a senior before they can take this test, is there? And, um also, in regards to the good standing portion, um, I know that we have not defined that, but I think it's helpful that we leave it up to the discretion of each university. They're all going to have different definitions of what they deem as good standing. So you're having that person, right now as the form stands, you're having that person sign off that that student is in good standing according to that university's terms. I think once we start qualifying what good standing is, then we're going to have to go down a hole. Uh, you I know, I that's my, we we that. wouldn't do that anyway. That would well, be the university's yeah, to let, determine. Let me finish that myself. Yeah, that, that comment was mentioned, so I was just making right. sure to address my, it. My point is it's not in our rule. No. Good standing is not in our rule. No. Uh, the year that they take the test is not in our rule. I'm double-checking that. I, I mean, I, and I don't know. So, So my thing would be, why do we care? I mean, if a if a if a person walking in there taking their first engineering class can go sit down and pass the fundamentals of engineering, they still have to go get a degree from an ABED accredited university. We don't let them pass go, right? I mean, so I think this form is unnecessary. I think it makes no difference to us. I don't see a compelling reason that we even need this form uh, because. All we care about is that person, if you're going to call yourself an engineering intern, you need to have show that you've passed the FE. I mean, that's that's basically what we have put in our rules. And we, we're, going, we're getting a little far away from what our, what's written down in our rules and starting to be the, uh, the academic cop, to me it appears. Now, I may, it may be a different jurisdiction. I don't know. But if it's not in our rules, I think we're opening ourselves. Hey, it's... A, it's crappy on both sides because do you provide a list? Do you not provide a list? Do you do this? Do you not do this? Our applicants are confused. And anyway, I'll shut up. I, that's, but, that was my last comment. Well, I, I think one, one other way of looking at it where the form serves a purpose is where we are, the state of Tennessee is issuing 
a certificate and we're we are designating somebody with a certification and the form is basically getting one reference you know for a for a PE we ask for five references for an engineering intern we're, this form is basically our means to get one reference and to me that does not seem that out of place or inconsequential I think to get one reference now and, and as far as good standing when I read the words that surround that to me it kind of describes and defines it a little better it says I certify that the applicant is a prospective graduate in good standing which I think is an academic term in the senior year of engineering curriculum and is of good character and repute so they hereby recommend the applicant so it's just one reference and it's to make sure you have somebody think that this is an okay person to get an actual certification by the state of Tennessee that's a step to becoming a PE is not unreasonable to me. I'd what, just what like to add a correction real quick. Um, so that those items that we just discussed are not mentioned in the rule that I read, um, but they are mentioned in the statute. Um, so I'm going to read that for you guys real quick. It's um, Tennessee Code Annotated 622402. Um, so this might help clear some things up. Um, the following shall be considered as minimum evidence satisfactory to the board that the applicant um, for engineer intern is qualified for registration as an engineer intern a graduate in a curriculum of four years or more leading to a baccalaureate degree in engineering and approved by the board as of satisfactory standing or who is a prospective graduate in good standing in the senior year in such a curriculum and who passes an examination prepared by the National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying involving the fundamentals of engineering, provided that the applicant is of good character and repute. Well, that's where it's at. Yes. That's so this at. is one, one reference to verify that. And I think if we have somebody's name on there, an email address, it's, it's maybe not necessarily that you check it. That's your decision, but... It's there if you and need to there. check it. You can't, if there's any doubt, if they get a, you know. And if we check them all, that would still be faster than what we're doing now, which is looking at signatures, going to a page. She's wonderful because Cindy actually recognizes signatures. But if you think about it, now <laughs> that they're coming from other states, I mean, that's so intensive just thinking about it to me and then trying to get signatures. This way, if the name's there, she can check the online process in minutes, and that's part of it. So not to add to this, but remember that we did put through fee reduction, and this is the one fee that's gone away. So where we were at least charging $15 to do this, now we're not charging a penny, um, not to mention the, the, the time-consuming aspect of it. So um, if we can simplify this form any way the board decides, that would be wonderful. And I think the universities would also appreciate that, actually. But so, so uh, I think one of my still questions is, <laughs> I know it's in the state law, and I definitely want to make sure I understand why we've got the form now since it's in the state law. I understand that. But why is it in the state law? Um, I, I don't know that it makes any difference to us as a board if you're senior in good standing. Now, it may have used to have made a difference when we were the clearinghouse for all this, but it seems to me if that's something that we can get out of the state law, and this may not be a big deal, so whatever, but if we can get out of the state law and we make one less form that we've got to go fill out and we have one less thing that we have to go do that really, I, unless you all see, what difference does it make? If uh, they're I'd a like, senior I, and getting senior, I, I just don't understand the Well, I, I agree. I think we're getting caught up in a whole lot of uh, tangle that we just don't need, especially if we're just going to take the signature of anybody. I mean, what's the signature worth if it's anybody can sign? I mean, what's the point? I, why are we doing that? If we want to say a reference and just go with the bottom that says where it says for other applicants and it could be used for anybody. But that would require a law change, correct? Yeah. But I don't. I agree. I don't know why we have that in the law that that this board cares whether or not the students are in good standing at the universities. And it might have mattered a long time ago when there were only 150 that we were looking at every year. But with with the licensure mobility issues that we're talking about constantly, you're talking about 
people that graduated in states far, far away who might want to get certified in Tennessee. I think we ought to consider a rule change or law change. But I, I definitely, I just want to go on record as saying I think it's just silly for us to require Cindy to go and have to verify signatures that we don't even care who the signature represents. That just seems so counterproductive. I, I just can't believe we're doing that. So, so what I just heard was that you can't take the exam until you're a senior. Because I've been hearing from the board in the last year or so that. that anybody can take it. We, but at one time I thought it was you can take it any time you want to. Graduation. No, you can take it any time you want to, but you can't be certified. Well, she just read that now, you had to be a senior. No, this statute only addresses um, the qualifications for registration as an engineer intern. It does not um, dictate when a, a test can be taken. Yeah, so there's a way. difference there. Well, that's for the certification part, Perfect. not for the examination. To be part. registered. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. And not so, everyone will want to get the certification, yeah. possibly. So. Well, I've had students, because I've, I've made this comment in my, in, to my seniors, and one of them made a comment to me that when they got on the NCES website to uh, apply for the exam, that it said they must be within six months of graduation. I haven't gotten that far along the, to look at it myself, but... Um, how, and the other question I would have is how many states don't require um, for a, a, an applicant to get uh, certified that doesn't have a degree? Because you basically are telling me that they can. If they pass the exam, they can have this EI certification even if they don't complete their degree. You not? No. Oh. Well, it sounds like they can be registered if they're a senior. Would you like me to read the statute? Yeah, yeah. A, gra a graduate in a curriculum of four years or more leading to a baccalaureate degree in engineering and approved by the board is satisfactory standing. So it does say a graduate. Well, so um, it also says or who is a prospective graduate in good standing in the senior year. Um, so let me read the statute in, in whole just one more time on the record for everyone. Um, this is Tennessee Code Annotated 622402 Engineer Intern Requirements. The following shall be considered as minimum evidence satisfactory to the board that the applicant is qualified for registration as an engineer intern. A graduate in a curriculum of four years or more leading to a baccalaureate degree in engineering and approved by the board as of satisfactory standing or who is a prospective graduate in good standing in the senior year in such a curriculum and who passes an examination prepared by the National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying involving the fundamentals of engineering provided that the applicant is of good character and repute. So it's a graduate or a senior who is yes. of good, yes. good repute. That's correct. Which would still leave the situation of you could still have a senior with good standing and good repute that wouldn't graduate but get certified as an engineering intern. Correct. That's well, if they, it says, and who passes the exam. And passes the exam, right? Right, right. right. yes. Not graduate. But yeah. not graduate. Correct. That's correct. Maybe that's the part we need to take out is the, out. the part that says yeah, perspective. One. Because I agree with you. I, I think. My, my assumption has always been that these people would graduate, but if they're not graduating, I don't want them to be called an engineering intern uh, because that that connotates that you've, to me, it connotates that you've graduated. Uh, so I think on some level we need to look at taking that last half out, the or part of it out. And that's been my problem with signing these is that I have, I, you know, if, the, if a senior passes this tomorrow and they send me this this certification, I sign it. And he drops out of school, then he's going to get his his certification and never finish. Um, I believe the board could interpret prospective graduate in good standing the way they would. You know, I think you could interpret it here as only granting this uh, intern certificate or the certificate being valid if they actually do follow through with graduation. I think I think it's written in a way that you the board could interpret it like well, that. And see if it's if, if we can interpret it that way, then to me this is a simple argument. You just have somebody send the, that they've passed the FE and send a copy of their diploma or whatever or that and and that's what you get and then you send them an engineering certificate and they're done. I mean that's 
That's the letter from the dean at the end of the school year that the dean sends, sends to the board. It says these these people have graduated. Yeah, or they just uh, send a copy of their diploma. That's mm -hmm. you know, take a take a picture of it saying here you graduated. Transcript. Transcript. Hmm. Transcript. Whatever. But I mean, it's still the there's an official document that's already there that doesn't require any signatures or anything. It's just here's my stuff. Send me a certificate. We can confirm that they passed the exam, and they can actually complete the the application, not the right. whole, online. I mean, we can, and at this point, they won't even pay for it. But if we can interpret it that way, I'm 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 game for just not to to get rid of the form and just make sure they show up with evidence that they've graduated from a university and and passed the FE, and then you can send them a certificate. And that way, we don't have to worry about it after that. I mean, to me, that that is the intent anyway. I would think. I mean, uh, I. But, Robert, I do think there's one little piece of it that says that they are of good character and repute. That's in the law. So there has to be something that is, you know, at least – I don't think we've – have we ever even turned anybody down? I mean, that's not uh, – I'm not aware of having – Our back and forths are for the signature. It's yeah. Because it's not I mean, we're not turning anybody right down, but signed. we got to address that issue. Either we can just let anybody and their brother – sorry, not their brother – let anybody sign as the person who says that they are of good character and repute or I don't know I don't know why we're asking for somebody from the university to sign anything okay let, let, here's where I think we are um, what we can do today is something about this form can the engineer committee change this form it doesn't need to go through the board our form. Or, we can okay, vote it it's and our form update the rest we can't change the law today Correct. that's a future thing uh, right now the law calls for us to it, it it reads the way it does and it calls for the good character thing so i think the form is the only element we have right now to get some reading on whether somebody has good character if we and the signature is the problem so if we if we leave it department head and just have a name and an email address there not a signature but leave it the department and we're only talking about the upper block not the lower block but if it if it is the department head which ought to be findable with a name and an email address if we want to check that and say is this person of good character and good standing academically if the department head doesn't know they can go ask somebody but it's somebody we can check with would that streamline the form process and it, does it also do what we want to do with giving us some way of checking good character so that we're abiding by the law I think it does I mean I agree that you know it opens up a lot more individuals but we can follow up we can check we've never had an <clears throat> issue with it I, I think it definitely streamlines and, and, and gets it done Seems um, like, Mr. Bursa, yes. uh, the, the statute doesn't contemplate that the good character and repute um, opinion comes from the university. Only the good standing um, portion refers to the and university. So really the board <coughs> has leeway here as to who they're going to defer to, whether it's your opinion or if you want the opinion of the university for the good character and repute portion of the statute. Yeah, and I, I would say if, if this person's a senior in school, which is what the upper block is for, and we don't know them, that I, I think it's reasonable that we ask for a department head name there, just a name and an email address. Or or dean. Or dean. Because those aren't transitional positions normally. And the form right now asks for phone number, email, name, maybe, um, as Liz mentioned, just adding another line there for clarity of, you know, needing the printed name, anything along those lines so we can verify it and not worry about the signature itself. So that's what you're saying, Ricky, is dispense with the signature requirement and just have the name of the individual and contact information. Yes, that gives that gives our board staff the capability. If they want to check, they have the connection to check. But they're not looking at signatures from somebody in Wyoming. We've got books with letters of who was approved and matching signatures that just doesn't make any sense.
Well, still we still think work. we ought to change the law yeah. down the road. The, the right yeah, future. Can we leave that on the? Day. Can we leave that on there? We'll have that in future. So we will work on the form for the next meeting. That way, the board can can approve it. Um, especially now that they're coming from other states, and that we're not charging the fee on top of it. And it, it's just a night. All right. Thank if, you. If if that is, um, I guess we can make a motion. Maybe. We, about the form right now and then if we want to keep talking about the law in this meeting we can keep talking about what makes sense is that is that okay i don't think talking about the law is going to, well, we can't change it for a while okay i just i didn't know if we wanted more discussion about what we're thinking but we, i mean it was a good discussion okay so do we want to will somebody make a motion i don't know if i can make a motion as a chair but um, I'll try. I'll give it a okay, shot. Can we take? All right. So I'd like to make the motion that with regard to the form on page 40, that we change the block that is entitled for senior students to not require a signature, but to continue to require the name and contact information to verify the student's attendance. At, at their <clears throat> at their respective university slash college via either the department head or the appropriate dean or his representative would that be acceptable to add the at his representative I, I would say we're trying to get something that's readily findable why don't we just limit it to the dean, the dean, dean co the college dean, the college or the department head, or the department head, the department head or positions. dean of the college. Those two positions. Okay. I'm good with that. Okay. Um, I'll second. second that. Okay. Any more discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, uh, opposed? All right. That was motion passed. That was good. <laughs> That help? Thank you <laughs> immensely. And I didn't know if you wanted to look at the certificates, but the very last item okay. is the actual certificate. Um, we're going to be printing them internally, possibly look a little bit different. If it changes any, I'll bring that at the next meeting for you to review as well. But that's kind of what they get completed now. Um, and if they lose that, damage it, want a duplicate of that, that we are still charging for if, if they actually right. want a duplicate. But the first license and entire process now is at no cost to them. You realize that signature at the bottom on the right there in 20 years will make that like a Babe Ruth baseball. <laughs> thank you. This, Liz, this thank, is huge. thank you for your interpretation on that and your guidance on that too. All right. Um, do we want to take a break or um, why don't we take a five minute break and then we have laws and rules left only if you do this is okay. just one of those topics if you've got items that you want to discuss before we're with the I've, I know I've got one okay. that then I want yes. to bring up we'll that it came to me minutes. so okay thank 5 you. minute break thank you thank you not, not, on the record not in the current environment that we're in no ma'am I do not want to make a joke <laughs> okay <laughs> <clears throat> Let, let's uh, resume our meeting and the next topic is uh, laws and rules potential laws and rules changes if if anybody has any I've I've got one that has come to me in the way of a question that kind of exposed uh, uh, a need to discuss a law and rule uh, and Robert I think you said you've got one I, I was looking at these two or three things here um, is this, is the, the list that we've got is that anything on the is that on the iPad no, probably I don't know and, um, Ricky if you wouldn't mind I, I was going to give a little um, bit of an overview of um, the current state of our um, opening rules rule 0120-01-0.03 that I had um, sent an email out uh, last week um, I'm going to discuss it in more depth at the official law and rules committee but I just wanted to let you know where that was so that if you're thinking about future changes so you know um, what's the current state right now um, so just would you repeat that which rule yes um, um, this should be on your iPads I'm not sure what page um, it's a, it's the separate it's um, a any &E rules oh yes Okay. Um, we will be talking about this um, more in depth at the um, Lawn Rules Committee with um, 
and with the full board. Um, but I did want, before the engineers discuss any potential changes you'd like to make, I just want to make sure we're all on um, board with what uh, the current rules are right now. Um, so previously, um, at past, I think, last meeting or either the last meeting or the meeting before, um, I had received news from the legislature that um, our rule package that had uh, like 10 changes in it, and one of those was clarifications to offering to practice, um, I was notified that that rule was going to not be approved by the legislature. And um, it turns out that actually the rule was put on a stay and was paused by the legislature, which gave them 45 more days to think about whether or not they wanted to disapprove it or approve it and they didn't take any action. So what that means is that the rule actually did become effective. It just became effective later than the others. So rather than us not getting that rule approved, it actually did go through. It just didn't go through until 45 days after the other nine or so in that rule package. Um, the current issue we have, that, so, that, the, so that is some good news. The rule that um, the board wanted a, um, a while back that we'd been working on since 2016 did get approved by the legislature. Um, this is, I'm referring to rule 0120-01-.03. The new rule title is clarifications to offering to practice. I believe the red line is included um, on your iPad. So you can see what the, um, the new the new rule language states. Um, if, we, if we go, excuse me, Liz. Yeah, we, yeah, no the, problem. On the iPad, we're, we would be looking at the proposed. You're looking at the AEL proposed a rules red line. Red line. Yes, I apologize. So if yes. we look at that and we're, what page on that, that's 22 pages. What page on that? Is it page two? Um, we are, one second, I'm going to pull it up on my arm. Um, right. We're looking at page two. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, so you'll see the rule previously is um, marked out, um, strike through in red, and the new rule is what's written in blue. Um, so that is what I was referring to when I said it, uh, we thought originally the legislature was going to not approve that. I informed you guys that that rule did not pass, um, but actually um, stand corrected and it was actually put on a stay, which was paused for 45 days where the legislature had the option to disapprove it, but they took no action. So it means that um, the rule did go through and is now effective. Um, so I bring all of that up to say that when we, um, when we submitted the uh, more current rulemaking package on um, architectural associates and the co-op credits, we did not account for this new language because at the time we submitted it to the Secretary of State, um, we believed that that rule did not get approved. So we submitted the portion with the architectural associate change with um, the old language. Um, from rule 0120-01-.03. Um, so what I'm going to talk to the full, um, the rule, law and rules committee and the full board is um, because, because the rules somewhat overlapped each other, the board can decide um, the, the one that we just submitted to the Secretary of State with the architectural associate and the co-op credit, um, we, can, we can sever that and um, resubmit the section that um, got crossed here um, and and move move the co-op credit portion forward and then resubmit the architectural associate portion with the updated uh, rules that did actually get approved um, or we can move forward with the old language that has been submitted with the architectural associate change um, and that would substitute back for um, the language that was written prior to our amendment um, to the clarifications to offer to practice. Um, so I know that is a bit confusing. Um, essentially what it whittles down to is does the board want, um, are you happy with the change that did finally get approved by the legislature where we changed it to clarifications to offering to practice um, and we added some stipulations as far as to um, responding to letters of inquiry and using the title um, or do you want to change or you have the opportunity to put it back at the um, original language at this point. Um, so those will be the options for the, the full board to vote on. I wanted to let you know about the current state 
of that rule in case it affected any potential amendments that you guys were going to talk about in your committee meeting today that's that's helpful i mean that's the rule that i want to talk about yeah. so okay why don't we go ahead and talk about it since since liz has gone through all that um the if if everybody does everybody have that page two in front of them and it, and it really talks about people who are who are registered in other jurisdictions who who come to want to come to Tennessee Tennessee to practice the old the 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 what was struck in red there under number two says individuals registered in other jurisdictions cannot offer or perform architectural engineering or landscape architectural services in Tennessee unless they are either acting as a consulting associate in accordance or working with uh, under the responsible charge of a Tennessee registrant okay up in the in number one then it says let's see let me find that looking for the the statement about offering let me find that right but I mean the original not not in the clarifications what was in the original the, the original language um, is on page two written in red um, and struck through that is what the rule used to be before the amendment was officially approved and updated by the legislature so the amendment the amended language is in blue underline okay that I'm, i missed it and then too and then i just read it individuals in other jurisdictions cannot cannot offer or perform architectural engineering or landscape to the public um so that that's really the in the past we've talked about whether some somebody can respond can offer a proposal to do a job or respond um and my understanding went along with what's said there but my understanding was that you cannot unless you are already registered in other words and i've run into this in other states where most other states i can't even give anybody a proposal or even talk about a job very much or do anything unless i'm registered most of their rules read that way and it was always a bother to me because i thought it was kind of um uh, unreasonable that I couldn't make a proposal uh, in a state I wasn't registered in uh, that I had to get registered just to make a proposal but after I found out Tennessee's law was read that way <laughs> that um, it, it seemed to me like that was that's in there to protect the, the health safety welfare of the public in that if somebody is puts put out a project to to request proposals and they award the project somebody who's not registered in Tennessee and then they find out that that party can't get registered in Tennessee for whatever reason their application well then you set that owner back months maybe a bunch of dollars and so I so I understand there was a protection of the public there and and so my so it so I, I was and I think we talked about that. This has maybe been a year or two that helped me further understand that. So the question came to me um, because the our within the last two weeks, the what is redlined there, or, or really the blue was already up on our website as our rules. Yes, that's correct. And um, like you mentioned, the board did debate this change for quite some time and so the current rule as it stands um, so, uh, paragraph two says notwithstanding paragraph one proposals may not be submitted contract signs signed nor work commenced until the architect engineer or landscape architect becomes registered in Tennessee unless the architect engineer or landscape architect is either acting as a consulting associate in accordance with Tennessee code annotated 62 2-1032 or working under the responsible charge of a Tennessee registrant so that is the final language that the board um, approved and is now uh, currently active effective okay, so so here here was the confusion that it caused with somebody with a, 
a registered engineer out there offering business um, the, or, or really uh, it was it was a, as an engineer who is on the board of a for an owner board who is uh, seeking uh, proposals and um, the that the language in all of those points there's a there was a difference in w seen as a difference between responding to an RFP or an RFQ that the that the it seemed clear to this person that the RFP that they could not respond to an RFP because of what Liz just read in two they could not offer proposal well if the board is um, interpreting an RFP as being a proposal a contract or commencing work then then no they could not say that again Liz um, it, you asked if an R if they could apply for um, an RFP without um, being registered in Tennessee uh, according to the paragraph two that we just read if if an RFP is a proposal or a contract or commencing work um, then no they would have to be registered in Tennessee first right and and so that was clear that was clear to this person what was not clear was they felt like there was language in there that would allow you to respond to an RFQ because that number two says proposals it doesn't say paragraph one proposals or response or qualifications responses well there there are some caveats that um, that you were um, including I'll read the rule in its entirety um, so you can see it, it, it's possible that it, it follows on uh, it falls under one of those um, so the amended rule as it stands currently effective is 0120-01-0.03 clarifications to offering to practice paragraph one the following items are not considered offering to practice architecture, engineering, or landscape architecture, provided that the architect, engineer, or landscape architect is registered in another jurisdiction. Uh, paragraph A, advertising in publications or electronic media, provided there is no holding out of professional services in jurisdictions where not registered. Section B, responding to letters of inquiry regarding requests for proposals or requests for qualifications, provided there is written disclosure that the architecture, the architect, engineer, or landscape architect is not registered in Tennessee and the response is limited to inquiries regarding scope of project and to demonstrate interest. Can I, can Section I C. Pause just a second. I think that may be where there's some miscommunication or they may have misunderstood because. This is submitting like a letter of, you're responding to a letter of inquiry. Does your firm offer these practices? Do you provide these services? Are you competent in these fields? Not responding to a request for proposal or submitting a proposal or a statement of qualifications, right? Well, that's the way I interpret it is if we look at an, a response to an RFQ just like a response to an RFP that it's offering to practice. But and I and I saw these words letter of inquiry as being different than a response to an RFQ. But this registered engineer did not read it that way. Did the 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 letter of inquiry was a response to the RFQ is the way he was interpreting this. Generally that's not the case. we we get these periodically, mostly from let's say federal agencies like we're gonna we've got a project would you let us know if your firm is interested in pursuing this and it's not submitting a statement of qualifications or it's not providing a response to a request for proposal it's just a letter of interest do this and yeah. are you yeah right yeah and that's the way I interpreted it but in the, the reason I'm bringing this up is if I want I wanted to find out if our intent was to be view RFP and RFQ re responses as the same and because as I've I've gone through it in my mind and I think that it should be the same because you can damage somebody that when you go through an RFQ process and you award a job you roll right into to them producing contracts yes and if then they can't get registered it's the same delay in cost you know it's the same trouble but 
I think that the language in the blue is misleading. I, I do understand where it's misleading and that it needs – I think it needs to be cleaned up. But I, but I didn't want to go – I didn't want to start suggesting ways to clean it up and looking at all that if I if the way I was viewing the intent was okay. incorrect. Um, but go ahead, Liz. Well, it seems to me, um, you know, when you describe submitting a proposal, uh, you are describing a full process. So I think that that would, you know, fall under number two, whereas, um, like, uh, mentioned previously someone just responding to a letter saying hey yeah we're interested give us more information on what the requirements are I think is very different than filling you know completing a full-on proposal and spending time and money and effort into into getting the job so I think that the board has um, clarified that in this new rule um, now if you're wanting to delve into describing what is a letter what is a response to a letter of inquiry versus what is a full-on proposal being submitted that is something we can talk about um, no, I, I think that it would be totally clear if in paragraph two there if it just said notwithstanding paragraph one qualifications or fee proposals may not be submitted that would there was no way that he then could have interpreted it that way it would it would have been totally clear uh, um, that you can't respond in RFQ either if you're not uh, registered I, I, I agree I read that exactly the same way that you do you can respond to a letter of interest it says letter of inquiry but letter of interest is normally what they're called and then, uh, yeah and then all that makes sense if if yeah. that two says both qualifications and, and fee propo proposals and, yeah well, if um, if the committee uh, would like to make a motion to um, amend the rule and discuss with the Lawn Rules Committee and the full board, um, I think if you think that that clarification will help your licensees, we can certainly add that. The, the, for as we go, um, I think if we got rid of B altogether, C kind of says this. I think what we want C to say. B, under 1B, 1B. Responding to letters of inquiry. Yeah, we'll look at what 1C says. Responding to letters of inquiry from prospective clients provided there's a written declaration is not registered and the response is limited to require inquiries regarding scope of project and demonstrate interest. That's what we're talking about because when we see the words request for proposal, it automatically means to us that we're having to put together a process, okay? When we see request for qualification, it means to us that we're putting together a resumes, projects, and all this. C says what we want. You've got somebody calling you from the whatever, the Oak Ridge, and they're saying, are you interested in this project? Well, let's not say Oak Ridge, somewhere out of, town, out of state. And are you interested in this Old project? Green Municipal Utilities. Okay. Are you interested in this project? Mm -hmm. Let us know um, kind of what your capabilities are, or let us know. Are you well, actually the? I, I think this is limited to. Well, that's right. Is this something that you it's would be interested, be interested in pursuing? In. Is this something we'd be interested? So we'll put your name on the list to send out uh, the scope of service. That's right. And I, to me, that's that's where we're trying to get to, mm -hmm. not get to. A letter of inquiry, slot, comma, request for proposal. Right. That because I think the only problem is that term request for proposal has got a pretty narrow definition in our world that says you're going to have to go through a process of cover letter, similar projects, project, whatever. Project approach, project understanding. But in this, it says, which I think it's what it needs to say. When you respond to letters of inquiry from prospective clients, provide there's written disclosure. And the response is limited to inquiries regarding scope of project and to demonstrate interest. Yeah, we're we're interested in your project, uh, and we can handle the, What's the clarifier scope? design or something for you. That's something that we've done before. Whatever. I mean, but that's different than when I see B. I see request for proposal. I, I do agree with Ricky. Even though, it says, even though it's prefaced by letter of inquiry, it still says after that comma request for proposal and to me that means a different thing it, it does 
And uh, also, I agree with Ricky and item number two, notwithstanding paragraph one, proposals or qualifications may not be submitted. Or, or, however, I, I, I would probably say qualifications or f and fee proposals or some somehow. Well, we don't, however we say don't submit fee proposals, but just uh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, that is statement, of, so. statement of qualification may include a, a list of your history or projects of similar scope. A, a proposal is generally a lot more specific to that one project. Like I said, your project approach, your project understanding, the identification of risk associated with the problem. I mean, you're going into a lot of detail about that one specific well, project. I think in that number two, I think the intent was those that proposal meant a, qual a response, a formal response to an RFQ, like putting or all. That, that, well, they got two different I, things: RFQ and RFP. Correct. I think it meant both of them, yeah. and so that's that's where I think more words are needed there because it's being interpreted that it's just the RFP response. Maybe we just say request for proposals or request for qualifications. That's, that's fine. That would be the probably the clearest um, that those are not allowed, and then that would. Then that would tell them, okay, well, then this letter of inquiry is something different. Yes. And, so. and, and I agree with you that three is, or C is. He a, says what we want to say. It says almost the same thing as B. It's just a more, it's a more umbrella language that's more general, and it would, it would include what's in B. Um, in other words, if, if an RFQ came out that asked, for, that basically had a letter of inquiry in it. It's specifically B would handle it, but it's also covered by C's language because it's coming from an owner to ask for interest. So I, I agree with you. I think C would do it without B. It seems to me that B and C were both left in the amendment to cover different areas. It looks like B is covering government contracts and C is covering private, private. clients. Uh, do I think you could address it in one rule? Yes. Um, I think it, it appears um, that this rule was written to cover both situations separately. That makes sense. That makes well, sense. Let me let's and let's clarify one quick thing here. Again, there there's two things. There's a request for a proposal. So I'm gonna disagree just a little bit on what you said. There's a request for a proposal. A request for a proposal typically has a fee element to it on some level. Okay. A request for qualification, but that's but I mean seriously, I, I just Wikipedia it, so it's we, gonna be right. But, we've never um, we've never submitted a fee on a request but, but for that, proposal. But but that's the problem. A request for proposal by definition, I believe, means give us your request and tell us how much money you're going how much you're going to charge. A request for qualification says, give us your qualifications. Correct. And most people have that labeled incorrectly because they should be asking. They'll ask for a statement of a request for proposal. A proposal is I propose to do these services for X. That is my understanding. A request for qualification is, or a statement of qualifications are, here are my qualifications for this project, and then we'll go through QBS after that's over. But a lot of people use those two terms interchangeably, and I think in the, in the in most purchasing worlds, a request for proposal means tell me you got enough people to do it. And here's the price you're going to do it for, and they use it incorrectly. See, now, I disagree with that because we get requests for every time the CDBGs come out. You know, they're required most most of the time. Development districts or some other administrative entity sends out requests for proposals on behalf of whoever the client is. I mean, it's we get dozens and dozens of requests for proposals for CDBG applications every year. They they never ask for a fee. But they're I think using that title incorrectly. Yeah, I think I think they are. I think that's understood. See, that's they can't a, ask for a fee. All the more reason to put both. No, I agree. Yeah. I agree. But I, I'm in the in the private world when we do work for mm -hmm. a FedEx or somebody like that. They, if somebody from out of the state cannot give them, they can't respond to an RFP because RFP is going to ask for. I mean, that asks for dollars in RFP in the private world. Um, yeah. So I. If they provide an RFQ, that implies that, well, this one, to me, we're, we're trying to tell somebody, if you're not currently licensed in this state, you can't respond to either one, an that, RFQ that's or the an point. RFQ. That is the point I think we need to clarify. That I mean, that, yes. And, and 
maybe semantics, but but those I, I agree with Robert to some extent. People do think those are almost interchangeable. I, I th my understanding has always been the RFQ is just qualifications. RFP has the fee component, and that's that's not how the client uses the phrase. We get RFPs every week, and they are non-fee oriented. Agree. But I call them RFP. You might disagree with how they should define it, but the client is going to send them out as an RFP, and therefore the registrants are going to assume that they are governed by what is referred to as an RFP. But by definition, proposals got a proposal has got a fee component to it. I just think people are using the word incorrectly. Where's the definition? Of, yeah, well, I've looked it up in four places. It talks about competitive bidding and all kinds of other a proposal. A proposal, we get requests for proposals for surveying services, services, and that's got a fee component to it. I mean, it just does. Give us your proposal. What's your proposal? Let me have your proposal. A f request for qualifications, there's a request for information. A request for information is kind of like this letter of interest. Um, so, so there's, but people, I think clients by and large use the word request for proposal interchangeably with request for qualification and they're two different things i agree that they could be but again <laughs> and i don't mind listening we're both not, of them in here but we're not going to change what the client's perspective is on a, on no. a proposal or qualification we're just trying to help police i guess our own profession and i think we even though we understand i think it needs clarification and it needs to define request for proposals or request for qualifications even though they our, our clients oftentimes use them interchangeably because our clients use them interchangeably I, I think with good discussion I, I think what would do it for me just both hearing this discussion and also in dealing with this question which I gave a non-answer to so um, did not try to interpret for this person but um, what would do it is if B and C either B is eliminated or B and C is combined somehow like Liz said and then if two adds um, uh, response to proposal um, neither response for proposal nor response um, or, or um, request for proposal nor request for qualification may be submitted if that language is changed in two and we combine b and c that that would i think clean it up as far as what i've run into would that does that sound like the right direction ricky can i ask a clarification question on yes i i think what causes the confusion is the way that b is written responding to letters of inquiry regarding requests for proposals I, I think if we just said responding to letters of inquiry and strike the request. like like C says like Robert said yes and just strike B yes I, I agree that was that was part of the confusion so yeah eliminating B leaving C in there to which would cover that yes and then adding the language to two that request for proposals or request for qualifications right however you want maybe you want to say yeah yeah neither request for proposals nor request for qualifications may be submitted that would that would be really clear Liz, is that have you is that all okay? Have you got all that? Oh, yeah. That's okay. fine. So, Ricky, are, are you talking about you want us to start an amendment to this rule and request this rule I think change? We need it. Yes, I do. But it's taken us two years to get to this point. Well, um, I think, let me, I'll, I might need to explain it a little differently. Um, I might have to, like, point out things to you guys uh, physically on the rule. It's kind of hard to explain verbally. Um, this rule is currently effective right now um, so we can submit the amendment but as it currently stands you're having this updated blue line version um, as it currently stands you're no longer having the red uh, old language in the red strike through version so um, 
even though it's a little bit unclear to to one person who has reached out I think the rule still addresses what the board intends and as it's written in the blue underline um, so I think moving forward um, in the interim between adding the updated language that you'd like to make to this I think the board is fine to still interpret it the way that I think I think this gives us the authority to interpret it the way that you are intending um, but certainly this is a good time um, with what I explained earlier about the architectural associate rule um, needing to be resubmitted to the legislature because of the rule crossover, this is a good time to make sure whatever we send them is exactly what we want moving forward. Um, so we can add that updated language in uh, paragraph B. And if we want to combine B with C and make it more clear that we're talking about the same thing there, we can certainly do that as well. Um, but I didn't want you to to think that we currently have that old language in the red strike through because that is not effective right now. So. And that was, uh, I was kind of asking for exactly what you just said. And I just think we, we probably, if we agree on how we would interpret this, then there really isn't a problem today and we can make it more clear. Not on October 3rd, but when I get two months down the road or four months down the road, right? I understand. So I, I go think back to the words, and and I, 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 I can't help but think if that said RFP nor RFQ, it would be totally clear to me in a year when I've forgotten this discussion. Asking us to do something with this law or rule. Um, today, if you would like to make these amendments, we just need a motion that you're going to recommend to the full board that these amendments are made. And we can discuss them again at the Law and Rules Committee, because um, I know that there's some architect members on that board as well, and um, landscape architect. And then the full board uh, would vote to move the amendments through the actual rulemaking process. You're saying we're, we're going to have amendments anyway to clean up some language. Yes, so that's correct. Yeah, it's not this like, is a good time to do it. It's not like, you know, we're not touching any of this. Right, that's correct. We're already yeah. having to send the architectural associate um, portion of that rule pack, that other rule package um, back through. So this is a good time to clean up any of the language that's currently effective um, based on, you know, the very recent amendment. This is a good time to do that. I think it's like tinkering with a computer program. You find out where the bugs are when you start using it. Fix it. I agree. I just don't want us to tinker constantly. Uh, so I think it's really important that we, if, if we got this one more shot, Yes. We need to be really, really careful if we're going to say what a, an RFP is and it's going to have to be defined and where does the fee portion fall relative to the definitions of letter of inquiry, RFP, RFQ, submittal, call, all that stuff. I, I just don't want us to look silly and come back in another two months and say, oopsie, let's try again. So I, I just want to make sure, if we, and but I also wanted to know, like, what's in there this is the rule right i mean yes. yeah so we're good where we are it's yes, just that that's we're, correct it's functional it's and, functional and it is um uh, yes we are able to um interpret it the way that you intend with what's written today and what's effective on the rules on the website and um today um, so yes your clarification would be helpful down the road um, for licensees and potential licensees um, but as the rule is written today it doesn't prohibit the board from interpreting it the way that you just discussed um, and uh, I think Kathy made a good a good point about too much tinkering I, I um, you know while the board has authority to amend the rules and um, what what happened with these is, is things kind of crossed over because we had too many changes to the same rule section occurring at the same time um, so we do have to be a little cautious in the rulemaking process with that and then also um, uh, I, I know it might not be thrilling to watch the videos of the meetings again um, but if you do need a reminder of the way that that you guys interpreted this rule and you can watch the full discussion sure. on the Tennessee Department of Commerce and Insurance website. Um, so that's just a reminder that's always available. Well, I, and I, w I will say that I don't want forgotten in this. I know that we can, if we're solid on our end with how we're interpreting it, 
I, I still would like it would be nice not to have our registrants wading into doing something that's uh, against our rules without them knowing it and us having to go through whether it's discipline or letters of caution because these out-of-state firms are going to re submit responses to these RFQs and when they're not registered because of this language in here. I mean, and we don't, and, and if we don't have to deal with that by just clarifying it, I think it'd be a positive move for them. Well, I think we need to, if we're going to go to that level of detail, I'd like to see us then also, you brought up the difference between private and publicly funded projects. And if that is a line of demarcation with regard to what constitutes which level of response and what's allowed, then that also should be part of the clarification. I, I don't think it does. I, I think that I think that uh, the the re request for proposal or or request for qualifications are the two ways you can ask to offer to practice whether it's public, private, whatever. Um, and so that would cover it. I don't think, you, to me, that's some needless complication on, between public and private. Because if, if you're private, you can ask for an RFQ, you can ask for an RFP. The, the point is the thing that a client or an owner is going to use to select a registered professional, that's what you're saying you have to be registered for. And that's what a response to an RF P or an RFQ is. I don't I, whether it's I don't think it private. makes a difference whether or not it's private or public. It I was just it something does. that was brought up for discussion. I want to make sure yeah, that we don't, don't, don't come back later and decide that that, that also needs further refining. I think in both environments it's used interchangeably. I'd like to make a motion that we adopt the modifications as presented with the caveat that we present recommendations for clarifications to the laws and rules committee there's nothing to be adopted they're already law oh they okay so we don't uh, you're asking the, the that's what blue, she was saying the blue underline that is before you today is effective right now um but the changes that you and ricky have suggested we will have to put through the rulemaking process which means the full board will have to approve approve that really we if, if we wanted proceed with a motion to change the blue to eliminate B and add the language to two that we've talked about. I guess that's a question on, on the table for us of, of proposing that to the Laws and Rules Committee. Um, yes. And let me amend. Is this, do I have to do this in the form of a motion? Uh, yes. Can we just do it as a recommendation? Typically, we do it as a motion. Then I, then yeah, I but if you're going to make a motion, you're going to have to actually say what the words are that you want to change. Is that not correct? I mean, you can't just do a general. That's, That's fine. I can, um, or you can, or you can refer to you know the changes that we've asked legal to make on Rule zero one two zero dash zero one dash point zero three because I have written all of them down. So that you could say it that way too. I think you very clearly understand what the motion would be. I do. Would you craft it? Um, sure. Um, so if if the board would like to make a motion to amend the currently effective rules zero one two zero dash zero one dash point zero three clarification to offering to practice to reflect a combination of paragraphs B and C um, to refer to the same thing so that there's less confusion and also um, under paragraph 2 to add qualifications or fee proposals into the language as what may not be submitted um, until an engineer architect or landscape architect becomes registered in Tennessee. I, I don't think that's exactly correct. I think okay. we were talking about eliminating B altogether. I thought you wanted to combine B and C into one paragraph that addressed both government and private clients. I don't really think that I, it, the distinction doesn't matter. I don't think okay. it does. Um, I think yeah. the, and the other component is in line item two is not fee proposals. It's requests for proposals and requests for qualifications. Okay, I must have written down what Ricky said wrong. So um, one of you will have to make the motion. Let me then. let I'm me sorry. try. Let me try reading that sentence. <laughs> okay, if I could. In number two, notwithstanding paragraph one, neither. 
responses to requests for proposals nor requests for qualifications or I, I don't need responses yes, you do. or okay responses may be submitted instead of may not yeah so notwithstanding paragraph number one neither responses to requests for proposals nor requests for qualifications may be submitted All right, that doesn't work with the rest of that. Oh, it does. It does. No, I, because it, exactly it contract is. signed, or we're, it might be clear to say, notwithstanding paragraph number one, responses to requests for proposals and responses to requests for qualifications may not be submitted. Clearly, the first way you okay. said it. about that well es essentially you don't have to have the language perfect um, for the board to vote on this change um, you basically need to have a motion that you want to change it and discuss why um, because typically the language does can get changed during the editing process and the input from the full board um, so if you're not um, set on exactly the specific language you want to say you can make more of a general motion that you're going to amend it right now and then at the law and rules committee um, we could tweak it if anyone wants to give me a um, written version of their suggestions um, I can try to get it typed up for everyone to look at um, and then we can uh, kind of whittle it down to the exact language we'd like the full board to vote on that, that sounds good because I, I I think there's still there's a little inconsistency there, but I I think I okay people to to look at okay see if it does it okay so you want to make your motion like <laughs> go back to number B and C B and C yes so what what are we trying to do I I personally I'm confused now okay. I, <laughs> I thought the last discussion we had on B and C was that the, in B, that language that actually used the terms request for proposals and request for qualifications was part of the confusion so that we thought it would be clear to eliminate B, whereas C is an overarching responding to letters of inqu inquiry from prospective clients, which is a more general way of saying that and it avoids the confusion of those terms so in essence we'd strike B so, well, I, so I, I think I disagree with that okay I, I really think C C is the one in my opinion which is a little bit sketchy in terms of interpretation because in our industry I mean who uses the phrase letter of inquiry in our industry I mean we're talking about our registrants the cities and the state agencies they all use the terms Request for proposal, request for qualifications. We, we actually receive, uh, the, I haven't seen, it's not letters of interest is normally what it's called. That's right. It's not letter of inquiry. Right. I think that just muddies the water. So, uh, well, again, we're going back, we're not having to make a definitive decision about what we want to say. We can all, we can sort of get together and craft what language we want to do. I think what we need to do is, is let make a motion that we want to modify the language under Zero one two zero dash zero one dash point zero three clarifications to offering to practice. That's correct. You can move forward with that motion if you'd like. That's my motion. So, can we, can we, can we, can we discuss? After you get the second, second. you can discuss. Um. Is an offer to practice except in a letter of interest or inquiry? Or yes or responding, no? Responding. To responding it, to it. It would not be. Okay. It, that's, is, that's, a request for, is a request to practice a using the term engineer if you're not registered in the state of Tennessee? It is. 
So this is this. And, and what I'm trying to get at is is we are defining what is an offer to practice. We're not defining all possible permutations of a QBS process or anything else. Or is it okay if you're out of state? To, is, is an offer to practice, do we perceive an offer to practice as a request for qualification? To, off, to submit a request for qualification, yes or no? What's an offer to practice? That's, That's what this title of this section is. <clears throat> yeah, that, the way that it's all set up is you, I think if this you're is not excluding a response, though, to a letter of interest or a letter of inquiry. It is. It is. It's, it's saying you, somebody who's not registered in Tennessee can't offer to practice, and this is saying this is it kind of going backwards is defining what is not considered offering to practice. Correct. So if this is written correctly, then what the conclusion should be drawn is, yes, responding to an RFP or an RFQ is offering to practice, which is not allowed. But responding to a letter of interest or a letter of inquiry is not offering to practice. And that would be allowed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they're, they're drawing this distinction between responding to an RFP and an RFQ versus Just responding somebody, to yes. a letter of inquiry in here or your language letter of interest. There's a difference that's being described here. So we said the following items are not considering offering to practice. Responding to a letter of inquiry is not considered to be an offer Correct. to practice. Right? Right. And that's Advertising, not considered to be a, a, an RFQ. As long as uh, responding have. to a letter of inquiry, again, which to me seems to be the same thing, uh, provided there's written disclosure, using the title engineer architect is not considered to be an offer to practice, and using the title engineer architect whatever or appellation thereof in communications is not considered to be an offer to practice. So, again, that's why I think we do consider an offer to practice any RFQ or an RFP. Response to So we need to get rid of we need to get rid of any reference to RFP or RFQ that is currently in this subsection because that's what's creating the confusion is that they are considered offers to – by this us, they're considered offers to practice. However you want to define them, whether it's got cost, doesn't have cost, doesn't matter. We consider an RFP or an RFQ to be an offer to practice. Yes. Am I, am I stating that correctly? We just ought to get rid of references to RFQ and RFP from this thing. The, the, yeah. Well, that's, that's where. All it, other inquiries are considered offers to practice. All other requests are considered offers to practice. We're done. Are you Are you saying eliminate two? I, yeah, I've I've already said eliminate B because it's got or RFQ B, no, and RFP in there. I agree with B, but and, are you and saying, C just says letter of inquiry. But are you saying paragraph get rid two. of two or, number two there or notwithstanding paragraph one proposals may be submitted? Are you saying get rid of that or keep that? I'm saying get rid of one B. Okay. We were proposing to reword number two, but we don't have to do that as part of this motion. What we're doing in this motion is, is to make a recommendation for modifications to this rule. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. I'm just. I think we're. And we can we can discuss that and agree to what that modification is later. I think we're getting. I think we're we, we lose track of what the first sentence is, which is an offer to practice. And what we define as an offer to practice. But but if we modify the language, then we'll clarify what that is. Maybe. I just think getting rid of B. That would be the objective anyway. Yeah, because the way the language is written is the following items are not considered. I, I know. I, I agree with getting rid of B. I still think that 2 is going to be misinterpreted to think you can respond to an RFQ. So I... Three. I, I, I still think we need to add some words to two. I think we need clarification, and that's what the motion proposes. I, before, and I don't know if we can do it, for, well, laws and rules meets tomorrow, right? Correct. Tomorrow at 2 o'clock. I think it would be a good thing to have some verbiage, if you can, Liz, if we could write that down, because 
I, I'm still not 100% in my mind tracking everything that's going on. Um, I can get a, a draft started this afternoon that has, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the changes that um, that you guys have discussed during this meeting. I think I have them written down correctly. I will discuss with um, Ricky and Alton after the meeting to show them what I have written down to make sure it reflects what you've stated on the record. Um, and I can easily get a draft together for everyone to see the big, the whole picture of the changes, if you'd like. I think we need to use some of our uh, surplus funds to buy an etch -a sketch or something so we can go in here and <laughs> make some of these changes so I can see them on the board. I like to see things, but anyway. I may need to interrupt you all just to kind of give you um, a, a, some timeline. Uh, I think a few of you are on this afternoon's work group session for QBS, and that starts right at 1. So I hate to have you not have a chance to have lunch. If there's anything else we need to add and wrap up quickly, if not, we'll continue definitely with the rule making. I'm good. I mean, we can I'm get snacks or something. I'm fine. I think my. You want to keep going? Oh, I'm solar powered. I'm good. You're good. Yeah. You're good. Well, wait, we've got a motion with no second, though, right? We, second. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Right. okay. So, all right. So we got a second. Any more discussion on it? What is it? I have a question. <laughs> motion is that we modify the language in zero zero one two zero blah 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 blah. blah. Uh, and make recommendation to the Laws and Rules Committee. I'm just trying to remember what we were, what our point was to change this rule. And is the is the difference that we wanted to allow an out-of-state reg registrant to submit a letter of interest? And we wanted them to be able to advertise in 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 a magazine or on the internet as long as they didn't claim to be a Tennessee registrant. Uh, That's the things uh, I is, I just here, don't remember why we even came up with this idea. Here's why I came up with it really is because we started some of the QBS discussion and started some other things about RFPs and RFQs or whatever, and we didn't have anything in our law or our rules that prohibited an out-of-state firm from putting in a request for qualification for a project. And as Ricky correctly noted, that has the potential to create a situation where a firm is selected based on qualification. I thought the, in, the, in red it says you can't do that. It definitely didn't. It said uh, um, you can't offer to practice. That, that was we're defining that the, because okay. a word "offer to practice" was a little okay. nebulous. Yeah. I think okay. we were trying to clarify the I, the term "offer to practice." It was clear to me because I never allowed it. Well, I know, but, <laughs> but but there were people that did yeah. because they they thought, and so we want to make sure that that "offer to practice" was more clearly defined. Um, that that was a term because some people that offer to practice. Is it an offer when I give you a fee proposal, or is it an offer when I sign a contract, or is it an offer when? And we were trying to define okay. when that point was. Okay. I, th I think we must have been getting questions about the other issues for us to specifically add them about advertising and such. And yeah. so I think I think it was meant as a let's just make it more clear with a rule change. Okay. So uh, out of state engineering company can advertise in a Tennessee magazine and as long as they don't say they're licensed in Tennessee that's okay is that what a says and I don't know how you would police anything opposite of that how you could police it either but I don't know why we need to say it well but you I mean, you could advertise in another state. Maybe you're getting ready to open an office up there or something, and you're doing advertising in advance of doing that. I don't know. But, I mean, there's a I, – I think with the mass marketing, mass media that we have today, it it's going to – It's hard to – It's hard to keep it yeah. from happening anyway. Yeah. Let's, But we do have to stop it somewhere. There has to be some line to, to stop 
Yeah, I, th- I think A is saying you can have an ad saying we're all, we, that we're engineers and we offer engineering services, but it says you can't say, and we can we can take care Tennessee. of your practice in ten, or your project in Tennessee if you're not registered in Tennessee. You can't hold out to to say you can practice in a state you're not licensed in. So I, I, I would have I would have argued that. If someone did that advertisement, that wasn't offered to practice. I think the the nature of advertising has changed, changed with, uh, you know, the with with yes. I think that was probably what. Plus, you got it. national magazines that have you know people that are picked up by people in Tennessee. So how are they going to know where its origin is? I just no longer have local papers. So <laughs> <laughs> remember, Steve, we got rid of that a while back. Yeah, uh, I remember. <laughs> okay, are we uh, are we ready to vote? <laughs> okay, <laughs> all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay. Um, do you, we want to keep going? Yeah. All right. You had a rule? Well, I've got, yeah, I mean, I think this list of stuff that we have here, which it's pretty obvious we're not going to get to most of it, but that's okay. Um, definition of engineering. Have we done anything on that? No. Ricky's <laughs> looking at me. No, I I said earlier to Ricky that I felt like, um, you know, I've been on the board for a couple of years now. When I first came here, I really didn't feel strongly one way or the other. But having listened attentively for a lot of the cases of the people who come before us who violated rules, laws, and had their licenses at risk, and the whole QBS argument, and offer to practice, um, it I, it is my opinion that it is time for us to define engineering. I know that it will be uh, difficult to make everyone happy, but it is very hard for us to have legitimacy in the marketplace with our registrants and potential registrants if we can't at least make an attempt to tell them what constitutes engineering and what does not. And I also went on to say earlier, but you know, not all of us agree on what art is, and there are th- some things out there that pass for art that I think are trash. But that doesn't mean that other people don't think they're art. And we have to define what intellectual property is. That's what engineering is, is most mostly intellectual property. So I would love us to have a discussion about this and see if we can't make some progress on the definition, even if it is a broader, you know, if we can't nail it down. But if we're sitting here slicing and dicing on request for proposal versus letter of interest versus letter of inquiry versus RFQ, I think that we are we do the public and we do our registrants a great favor and especially help ourselves down the road on cases that come before us if we will define what the practice of engineering is. And I'm okay with doing whatever. I think we've got some, again, I'm not sure why we want one, but we've. if, if that's the feeling of everybody, let's go ahead and get one. I would, my recommendation though, Mr. Chairman, is, is that a definition of engineering is going to have to dovetail with the definition of architecture, which also has to sort of dovetail with the definition of landscape architecture. Uh, there, you know, when you look at grading plans and things like that, I don't know that that needs to be done as a group project. Um, I, I would prefer that we find a engineer, an architect, and a landscape architect to go sit in a room somewhere and take different varieties of things with a word processor and our able attorney and try to come up with a some variations or some things or, or here's where we agree, here's where we disagree before it comes back and we talk about it anymore because we just went through 30 minutes on, like you said, Kathy, on what different definition things are and and that could be something that would take years days uh, and days yeah and, days. and so if we have th- uh, my my proposal is is that we have three people or, or one from each group that kind of sit down and take some language that we've seen before and hash it out you know whether that needs to be uh at another roxanne at another meeting time or something like I mean, because I just don't think we're going to get anywhere. That definition was two pages long, the last one I saw, if I remember right. And 
So all the different defin- these are all the different okay. definitions we've discussed over the past so, few years. So, I mean, years. It, it, that's a lot of things to try to mix match yes, together here and then go take to the architects and try to put it together right. what they've got and then – Oh, by the way, we've got to bring a landscape architect here. And I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to be opinion. a part of that discussion. Is I, I think if we go in without a definition, uh, I, I think we need to go in with a definition that's acceptable to all of us, uh, and then w- we'll have a, a a foundation to work off of that we can go back and we can meet with the landscape architects and the architects, and then edit appropriately afterwards but i'd like for us to come up with our own if we're going to go that route and we're going to have a definition i think this committee ought to prepare the definition and then enter discussions with the architects and landscape architects about issues that they may have with ours and issues we may have with theirs and we've got that ncws has it in model law their model law but there's also well, dozens and dozens of others that aren't NCWS model law that may have good points or bad points. I, I could see it working that way, but one the one item that I can think of, and there may be more like this, is it would be it would be nice to know if we all agree on incidental practice or not. Like, do we we either? I think most definitions or at least a lot of the ones, define incidental practice and the whole concept of it. But there's some some that don't agree there, that, and maybe there's not a need for any incidental practice. You know, maybe we're saying there is no incidental architecture or incidental engineering. We just want to go ahead and draw the line and say you need to be an architect to practice any architecture. And, and so – that's just a, a general I – wouldn't, I wouldn't like to spend three days developing incidental language if nobody thought we, we wanted to do incidental practice language. I, I agree. So that's that. just a broad, let's get some agreement, and then, and then we come up with our, our definitions, and then we come together and modify it. I'm not well. Okay. I'll go with the will of the board. I disagree. I, I think it lends a lot more clarity for us to have our definition. I know that the architects have kind of come up with their own definition. In fact, they they provided it to us, and it it did include incidental practice of engineering, in, practice of engineering, incidental to architecture, which I would have an issue with probably, just like they probably would have an issue with practice practice of architecture incidental to engineering uh, I'd rather have our definition formatted and prepared and be be willing to work with them to edit it so that each entity is comfortable with each others but I think if we don't have a basis to go off of how will we know uh, you know I don't I don't know how you set ground rules for something that you don't have a basis established for That what I'm talking about. If they've got incidental they do. practice in there, ours kind of needs to work with that. We got also, we'd also need incidental practice of land surveying. It's one of the things that's in some of the model laws. Yeah, right. But there are a lot of those that you know won't. The architects won't care about them, but will be important to us. It's fine with me. I guess the bigger picture is. At this point, do How we and when and who? Do, uh, up till now, I don't think we have said that our committee agrees that we want to proceed with developing a definition of engineering. We probably should start with that. Oh, we yeah. So some kind of motion on that. There's and just to give you kind of an overview on, like you're talking about a framework is kind of what I hear you saying is that there's the definition. These are different ways of doing it, but generally speaking, the definition of engineering, exceptions to that definition, uh, and incidental practices, and then some of them go on to say what a professional engineer is. I think we've already. Don't we already have that, Liz? Don't we have licensed? Okay, so that's we don't have to. We got that. Yes, defined. But the practice of engineering exceptions to the rule and incidental practice, I think, are the the framework, if you will, of what we would 
what a lot of people do. I'm not saying that's what we should do. That sounds so good. I think Kathy could be like the first shot <laughs> author. I think that's awesome. I will do it. I will do it. I do feel passionately about it. I'm happy to take Excellent. the lead. So I, it seems like first we need to make a motion on whether the engineering committee um, proposed, wants to do that. Wants to do it. Wants to develop a definition of engineering. Does anybody want to make a motion? <laughs> like to make a motion that we begin the process of defining the practice of engineering so that it can be implemented into rules and laws as appropriate. Discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. I'll, I'll pass. That's, <laughs> no, we, I got that. We, we heard your silence, I Robert. Got that. I just want to make sure that my silence is not. You're a good teammate. So noted. <laughs> you, we still you love you. You can say nay. And I don't, you know. no, I'm not, it's not. I don't know. The reason I'm, I, I honestly am not sure that we're, I don't know what we're going to, at the end of the day, solve because the number of cases that we have and the number of things I don't think is. I just don't want us to box ourselves in a corner. Uh, and definition that's broader, wider, able to weave those things in and out that makes it Well, I hear what you're saying, but I, in the same way that we've sat here and debated for an hour and a half about what constitutes an offer to practice, we got to start somewhere, and, and then it will refine over the years. And it may be that with the advent of technology, that a few years from now, what, those, what we sit here and define as being engineering may be dramatically expounded upon in five years, 10 years, 15 years, and, and the board members who come after us will accommodate those changes. But I think that we uh, do ourselves a disservice and our staff, and, and in particular the legal folks, by not giving them a leg to stand on when it comes down to finding potential violations in the practice of. So I, that's one of the, that's really the reason why I feel like it's a big deal to us to start down this path. But I respect what you're saying, and I don't want us to be boxed in. But I feel like we have to start somewhere. And I do too. And I've said this before. I'm, I, I totally get. Oh, you don't have to. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I totally get. I'm I, not throwing anything. So where, I'm where where we where we've come from, and why there why it wasn't, and that it, it's worked. But I think that with the way I know in my, in, I, in my world, building design has and codes have become much more complicated. That what we're designing has become much more complicated. That not having a definition is kind of protecting the practitioner and just saying somebody's got to be an engineer to do engineering is more protecting the public and so i just kind of think that we ought to err on the side of protecting the public instead of the practitioner who may like doing all the trades okay what what other topics we got we got yeah. some more on this. Well, page. I've got one on the in the second one on the list, and I just want to make sure that we have clarification on this. It's the early taking of the PE test, and again, we've kind of I thought discussed it uh, among ourselves. Here's my deal on the early taking of the PE test. Whether I think it's the greatest idea in the world or not, or the worst idea in the world or not, makes no difference right now. Uh, and and I, I mean. And the reason I say this is, and I don't know if we, this is an official position we need to take or if it's just something that we need to have noted. We are not going to, nor do we intend to, have a position or pass legislation or sponsor legislation to do anything with the early taking of the PE test. That, and, I, and Casey's out there shaking her head, I think, that that will come from the engineering societies or the engineering population at large, we've, I just don't know how we can effectively 
advocate that when our hands are tied from our ability to put legislation forward we can give some opinions I think from studies that have been done or from what we've seen in other states and we can be a resource for that but we're not in the middle I mean we're kind of supposed to be a little bit away from that's our thing as a body I, I, you know I mean I just we have all these people so what do you think about early taking it well I'll I see some good and some bad but we keep getting asked for our opinion like our opinion is going to sway the I don't know that our opinion is going to sway the thing what's going to sway it is when everybody looks around and it's done in other states and it's not done here and it all of a sudden gets passed I mean somebody says let's go do it that, that's whether we care or not, I, and maybe I'm being fatalistic when I say it or something, but I think we're in generally in favor of those mechanisms which promote licensure. That's what our charter is. I mean, that's what our thing is. And I think we're in, in favor of those things that make it easier for our registrants to get licensed. Or, let, let me let me offer just a counter to think about. Not just um, So this, this is... I think our board is really we we have been put in place to to handle I guess regulation of registering professionals that that's our purview is to if somebody wants to be a registered engineer or architect they have to come through the board this rule is directly about how you become or law is directly about how what you need to do to become a registered professional engineer um, so maybe it is our purview maybe it is our responsibility to propose law changes for things that is our, that are our purview and this being one of them so are, are we being a little too reticent not Proposing what if if we think it's the right thing to do, not proposing the law change, or we'd be a little too reticent there. I know why we wanted it to come up through the organizations because we don't want an outcry that would then defeat the legislation if we thought it was the right thing to do. Um, but I don't know if there's some in between <laughs> because I don't know if it's ever going to happen, if it's ever going to come up through the organizations. And like you said, I think that it's going to become a moot point when all the states around us accept the decoupled um, uh, law. So uh, anyway, I, I, that's, that's my thought, is it, it may actually be our responsibility and purview, these laws, about what we're supposed to be looking after as a board. That's my question. <laughs> Where do we go from here? I don't know. That's that, that's always been my Bob, question. Did you did was there some specific thing that you wanted to make a motion? No, I, I mean I, I don't know that I I wanted to just discuss it because it's been on our radar for quite a while. We've all heard, and we can provide a white paper on everything that we've heard about taking a PE test, the, the early taking. White paper basically says this. It's a pretty simple white paper. If you take the test within years three, between years three and five of graduating from college, your your probability of passing the test becomes more in line with normal ranges of people taking the test currently under the situation that we've got. Um, I mean, that's just what the numbers say. And whether we... I don't know that we've got any harm in making early test taking. I don't think we've got any harm in doing that. But on the same token, I'm not sure that there's any huge overwhelming benefit to doing it either. And I I just don't want us to spend our time as a board on something that to me on you look at the good and you look at the bad and I don't know that there's either one. 
but unless we've got an overwhelming reason that makes it good. The the one the one thing I there was two things actually that I see that I think may be good. And I think we've all seen that the PE has become an academia exercise. I mean, it's not necessarily a standard of practice or a normal practice. It's put together by, I think, 95% of that silly committee is all made up of academians. The other comp that goes with what I will say in just a minute, but uh, the other component of that is if we are about the promotion of licensure, and, and we are, and I'm afraid what happens when somebody gets out of school is their propensity to take that exam goes down depending on the, the whatever they field of practice they go into. Well, as if they've taken the PE before then, then I think they'd be more likely to pursue that four years of experience post uh, graduation. Uh, and going back to the academia part, I mean, that's basically what they've learned. I mean, my experience has been I really learned how to design a water plant or a wastewater plant once I got out of school. What I thought I knew when I was in school really doesn't hardly apply. Well, the academians think differently, you know, and and their questions are all based on stuff that's in textbooks or you know that uh, their academian part of the exam. So I think. I, I don't think there's any supporting evidence that people that take the exam directly out of school or in while they're still in school have a higher rate of passing or failing. I don't know what that I don't know what those numbers are, but those would be the two reasons that I would potentially advocate for decoupling. I'm not saying that I'm an advocate for it, but those are two arguments that I could see in its favor. Kathy. I, I I disagree a little bit, um, Alton. I just want because I'm going to tell you I was actually on the examination for professional engineers committee. So the the only reason I did it was to find out firsthand how the actual exam questions were written. So I wanted to know, and um, I think there are anecdotal stories out there relative to specific questions that tend to make people think that they're very academic in their in their approach. But if you really, really dig into it, statistically speaking, and you look at everything that the committees do in order to prepare the test questions and the bank and the pre-bank and the audit and the cut line and all the things that I learned by being on that committee, you would find that the truth is that it's somewhere in the middle between being textbook and truly a, a practice exam of what you learn when you're out there. So I, I just feel it's a little unfair to characterize it as, a, as academician driven exclusively. There's a lot of really good stuff that comes out of that test. And, and I only say that because I, I dug into it myself. Um, having said all that, I agree with you. And I, if, if, if I were king for a day, I would say go ahead and decouple because of licensure mobility and reducing barriers to entry and barriers to trade and the opportunity for people to make a living. And if a person can pass that exam right out of school, then more power to them. I couldn't do it. But the statistics so far show that some people can and some people are, n are never going to pass. It doesn't matter how what their grades were. So give them a chance. And that would be my personal opinion. I, I think that industry, and I've said this to Chris, is, you still have to, to Chris and others who are in the uh, the education side as well as Casey and people who were on the board before me that I run into and people at the NSP, TSPE board is they need to decide what they want to do if they're going to carry the legislature and get on with it, the legislation and get on with it. And, but I feel that, if, that it will become an option down the road. I would prefer that we, the board, participate in helping in whatever way is necessary so that industry can uh, decide what they would suggest. But if they don't make a move, then someone in the same way, in exactly the same way that we regularly see a, a protest legislative uh, offering where a representative carries the water for a constituent who feels that he's being unfairly prevented from making a living in Tennessee and he gets an engineering technology, et cetera, et cetera, something like that, that's how it will happen. 
because someone is going to feel that they have been basically unfairly prevented from being able to practice engineering because they want to be able to take the test early. So I, I know I'm just pontificating, but that's I just feel like it is gonna it's gonna happen. I, that's my opinion. I, that's not my board opinion. That's my Kathy Ware opinion. But um, that's all. As far as what the next step is, I mean, the only thing that comes to my mind is to have a, another round of discussions with ACEC and TSPE board members. We did that years ago. I mean, that may have been happening without me knowing, but we did that a couple of years ago. And what's What's changed since then is the number of states that now um, um, have adopted it and what that means, which it's not that clear what that means until you're on the kind of the, the side we're on with people applying for comedy. Um, and um, also that I have their great fear was that this was just the start of weakening the whole meaning of being a PE and getting rid of the test and I have seen no inkling that anybody's going to get rid of taking the test or requiring experience or one you know any of the three stool the three legs of the stool that's what their fear was two or three years ago that we heard I have I I don't have any evidence that that's happening but maybe 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 you do, but I don't. But that could be something to relate to them to say, in the years we've been talking about this, we're we're not seeing it in other states. We're you know it's not happening. So your fear there is not. So is so let's I don't know. Continue to talk with them. That that's the only thing I can think of to advance this. And I'm not saying how. I'm just whether that's a newsletter or, or talking points or going to meet with them again. Um, but maybe just a decision that we that's a, that is a next step so this is going to be an unfair question to ask you Wanda but I'm going to ask it anyway okay and it's unfair because the time the time is is going to skew the answer um, how many people have we had from Kentucky that took the test roughly that took the test wanted to get licensed in Tennessee and Kentucky's only been doing this for two or three years, but they've had enough people that, you know, have their four years of experience. That have inquired or have actually well, applied? Well, maybe both. Maybe both. Maybe applied and then and, or inquired. Probably about 10 or so. Okay. Out of seven, I mean, you know, I, I, the only reason I, well, the only reason I say that is I still don't know that it's at a, and again, when I say this, the question is, a little bad because the time that Kentucky's had this in place has not been long enough that we would generate a lot of interest to, to say this. I just think we've got other things that we need to spend our time and effort on because it doesn't seem to be a huge barrier to the people that are trying to get registered in the state of Tennessee right now. And that may be what my real point is more than I'm against it or forward or anything else is if we've had 10 in a couple of years and I think they would be eligible within I think a couple of years ago it tells me that there's not just a people are not jumping up and down to go take it right out of school or even they may want to take it a year early but I don't I, I, I would love to see a number which we won't have on how many people took it two years and under out of school I bet there's three people in the United States that did it uh, and before year two, like a, year out of a year out of school that were eligible to do it, I bet there are three people in the United States. I mean, I just can't go. Okay. Okay. So there are people doing it. Okay, well, so that's the, all of them are in Tennessee. If the audience members could come to the yeah, that's fine so that too. I'm just the, um, comments recorded. Go for ahead, yeah, that's fine. We've had several come through our PE exam review class on their way to Kentucky, but what I think would be really helpful, the number that I think that you're really looking for, is how many folks, eventually, when we figure it out, how many folks are coming in through comedy through Kentucky who have had to get licensed in Kentucky and then come down 
because right now they can't just get a license with you all right so they have to come in through comedy so that kentucky specific number or any of those other states where they've had to go get a license somewhere else to comedy into here i think would be a really valuable number to have in making this pitch so yeah but that's that's the problem how big issue is this in state of Tennessee, I'm just I'm asking a question and try to quantify it. How big an issue is this in the state of Tennessee? Is it an issue? If it's that big of an issue, then we all need to get on our horse and get moving, right? And I know we've had some discussions about that, but if it's not that big of an issue, if we've got three people here and three people here and five people here out of you know two thousand or whatever, then I'm just trying to get my where do you where do we spend our time and our effort our resources our goodwill with our friends over there and all that kind of stuff i'm just trying to get a handle on that my my gut says that the the bigger issue is that as this starts popping up around the country that that this is the kind of issue to protect the health safety and welfare of the public that you all and and engineers in general the profession in general ought to be defining a little bit more about what what should that look like in terms of experience and in terms of what it, what is a license versus um, versus a legislative initiative because they've heard about it from other states and so I've we've been trying to reach out and, and speak to legislators about you know we know this is probably going to come across your desk at some point and we would appreciate you know we're, we're working on it internally and would appreciate the opportunity to be together on this working together on it so that it's not just randomly defined by an outside body that that there's some influence from this side so I don't know that it's in a, an emergency because certainly there we've got f at least 40 percent turnover over there and so i don't know that it's an emergency but i think it's something we've probably sooner rather than later because as kentucky as those people start to have that four years of experience we're going to start i think that's when we start seeing more of them ac do you know how many states have approved decoupling 11 or 12 i was going to say 12 so let yeah so let me ask you that, and, and that's part of the question. What's our role in this? What's our role in this? Yes. And I reckon at the crux of my thing, that's my question. What's our role in this? I mean, it's obviously. I think I know, and I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to be obtuse. I'm just trying to ask. Do we need to sit down and spend our time writing a, a early test taking out here's what it needs to look like is that coming from engineering groups and societies do we need to just go out and cheerlead do we need to pass information on or I'm, I'm just i don't know what our role right. is anymore and i think it, what casey just said relative to health safety and welfare is really the perspective we ought to look at answering that question from what is the effect on protecting health safety and welfare of tennesseans if you allow registrants who have taken the test in, in a decoupling model as opposed to what we have right now and if the issue is who cares then i then it probably is not a board issue but there because of the board's mission the board's mission is to protect the health safety and welfare of the public if that is not impacted by test taking and registrants under this different model then maybe we don't have a role at all and we're just sitting here talking about it as more of individual registrants like i said earlier my my opinion not my board opinion but we probably ought to think about it from the perspective of answering the impact to, to our mission that's a great way to put because that's probably the thing I'm getting at. I'm not sure how it right now is impacting and will it impact it in five years. I don't know. And so that determines if, again, if my charge as a board member is to protect the health, safety, and welfare, then what's my role in all this? I would be very uncomfortable with the, and, and would openly tell them so, if the associations decided to run legislation that that directly affected the licensure process, which is your wheelhouse, that running anything that you all weren't comfortable with. Do you know what I mean? I think it's I think it's important for for it's important for you all to be on this on the same page, if that makes sense. It, absolutely. You know, I don't think there's any point in anybody getting sideways on this issue particularly. So our role then needs to be more of 
here's the info is here's information that we've got you're getting ready to maybe put we think we've got enough of a something for legislation can you all look it over and see if you see some way that it's going to mess you up in a I don't know I'm just trying to figure that out I would certainly hope that this that that legally that Liz and, and her team would allow that um, I don't, I don't I, know. that would I, I'm, I'm just, make everyone more comfortable I think it would certainly make legislators more comfortable too and, and I reckon the re and I'll shut up I really no. will shut up well for this <laughs> issue I will um, I think on some level we're being looked at to kind of raise the flag and say oh yeah we're all in right and I'm not sure that's I don't know if that's where I mean because you just said it perfectly a health safety welfare issue I don't know that we can raise the flag and say this is a health safety welfare issue right now is there a staff opinion? Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Do we need to ask the staff to look into the issue and give us some feedback on why, if, if there was a position taken by some of the other states that went with decoupling that took into account health, safety, and welfare protections for the public so that we just are more educated on what the potential outcomes could be? Could we ask for that? Yeah, you can certainly direct legal to, to do that research to report back to the board. Um, of course, I was I was also going to mention um, working with the professional societies. Um, I know this this board hasn't seen that, but on my motor vehicle board, um, one of the rules we passed last year, um, we actually worked on that language with um, one of the professional societies and their attorneys. We held um, somewhat like a hearing in this room where all parties came together on the record and stated what they wanted out of the new rule, um, and we worked. Together to draft the language and made sure that all parties involved were included on the final drafts. Um, the board obviously had the final say, uh, and this was for a rule, not a statute, but the board had the final say of approving the rule moving forward. Um, but it did help when we went to the legislature, um, the government operations committee, to get that rule approved, um, to have that backing from the professional societies and the input from the other attorneys. Um, the legislature does always ask whether or not the licensees and um, have have agreed or have given input to the potential rule. So just we, wanted to let you know of that past example. I'd like to ask two questions. One, Roxanne, and, Roxanne is that a, it, would it be appropriate for us to have a meeting like that with the professional societies? One, and then I'm going to ask Casey a question. So if if just one board member met, that's not a problem. If more than you are are meeting, we can do it during a time where we've got a board meeting and make it a committee meeting beyond the record if more than one of you board members are one, available. One or more Anything committee more members or one or more board members? Board members. Right. If or there's, a board if there's member more and than an associate one of member? Than, right. More than one of you would need to be recorded and be part of a meeting. And, and I mean, a schedule. full board member or can a board member and associate member meet? It no, doesn't it doesn't. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't that the Open Records Act will apply to associate members as well, even though they're not right. full voting matter. board members. Sure. Okay. Um, so what the Motor Vehicle Commission did, they they meet quarterly, so they don't meet as often as you guys. But in order to get that discussion going, they did schedule a meeting that was outside of their normal meeting dates um, that was noticed, um, but was held in this room. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to occur at an already scheduled board meeting but since your board meets six I think six times a year versus four we could easily do that second question Casey is is there a committee uh, or organization inside either TSP or ACEC or both that is is formulating something on decoupling so yes, there's a folder on my desk with the people who are on that committee. TSP is going to lead the committee, but it is it includes members of ACEC, TSB, ASCE, and some others. That list has been sitting on my desk for quite some time, and it uh, it Chris just asked me that question of when are they getting together, and it will happen in the very near future. I've just been a little overwhelmed with other things, so, and this has not been on fire. So, so they haven't convened. They don't have an opinion. No, but or? we uh, ASC did a did a survey very recently, um, and we have certainly we we did a year ago did a town hall meeting on it. I think as we people continue to give me opinions on a very regular basis, um, probably the same people who talk to you because people are 
there, I, I feel like there are people uh, on both sides of this, on extreme sides of this, who are very animated and, and excited about it. Um, either way. And then there's the 99% in the middle who's sort of, they, they seem to be a bit ambivalent um, as long as we protect other pieces. So, yes, there's a committee, but they have not yet gathered um, mostly due to my life, at, mostly due to the number of things we have going on outside of decoupling. I'm not sure that's a bad thing. I, I mean, maybe then this is the best time for the engineering committee, however we do it, Liz, if we do it in like a special call meeting or at the next, at the December uh, co engineering committee meeting, to invite the TSPE, is it TSP, ACEC, or both? TSP, ACEC, and ASCE. We're in oh. anybody, and we, and the other, um, the other professional societies will, the technical societies. <laughs> Whoever. And as far as I'm concerned, let's all get under the tent. I agree, and and have start those conversations and sort of maybe set a template for how we want to move forward with that. And given the changes, given the changes uh, in the legislature, in the General Assembly next year, I think it's it's probably, a, a, in my opinion anyway, not a terrible idea to spend a year really educating people on what engineers do first um, and why licensure is important to begin with. I think we've got a lot of education to do there anyway to then a year later perhaps bring something once we understand. Sort I, don't, of, I can't see this being resolved or developed in a year. It'll probably take at least that long anyway, so maybe we can do those things concurrently. My thought is really the 2020, if we're going to, if we decide to do anything, yeah. which we may or may not, but um, but I think that gives us some time to flush it out. We may need to stop there because of the time. It's getting close to one. Um, we, can I make a motion that I would that's like what to? Gonna, if yeah. we're going to make a motion, yeah, I just time. would like to make a motion that we direct uh, legal counsel to to do some research with regard to the the states that have passed decoupling to specifically address for us any opinions, um, conclusions, arguments for or against relative to protection of the health, safety, and welfare of the public. And I think NCES would be a resource that would have the potential health safety welfare reasons um okay does anybody second that motion well, I, I second her motion. yeah okay okay kathy's motion and go ahead well, and this we we can certainly bring this up but i would like for us to put this on the next engineering committee agenda meeting if we can or if we want to wait late or whatever i think item number three is one that maybe i put on here and i believe that it's it's something that we need to have uh, and item number three says not sure, but I think a statement on why we believe the BS should be the qualifying degree. We seem to run into the master's and technology degrees more frequently. Um, sorry, Robert, oh, we didn't vote on the last motion. Oh, I thought we did. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, I apologize. That's, My bad. that's okay. Um, I should have picked up on that. <laughs> I thought okay. it, I thought you were going to enter more discussion. About yeah. that. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I thought we had voted. I said yeah or something. All right. so I this thought is we had. staff looking into it. So we've we've got a motion. We got a second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Uh, uh, opposed. Apologies. All right. All right. Go ahead, Robert. All right. What do you read off of? Uh, Roxana sent us about topics for discussion. You got it. We can discuss this later. That's good. But I think we need some sort of statements on why that we keep either internally or something about why we believe the master's degree nor technology degree qualifying degrees for uh, a license. Uh, we run into this frequently enough, I think, where we have somebody with a technology degree that wants to apply or somebody with a master's degree that wants to apply. And I don't know that we've got anything formalized other than it's not in our rules that says here's why we think those things are deficient and again we can talk about this later but there are certainly some things that we that we all I believe understand make them deficient but it would be nice to have a list written down so that when we get challenged on these over a couple of years like we do uh, we I just agree. have something to kind of go back to. Yeah, know? it could be something like a a, policy a board policy or, or, or position or, or whatever, something. almost like the humanities list that we have. We yeah. use as a tool that is a resource for us. Yeah. Okay, that that's good. I don't 
I don't think we need a motion for that. Uh, if we can maybe put that on next mo next engineering committee just to kind of just keep it there. Okay. Uh, it just seems like that's a pro. I mean, we we run into it enough that it it helps, and I think it would help staff too when they get questions on. There are several other items on the recommended topics. Do we want to move those to consideration for the next engineering committee meeting? Some of those are not really ours, like interior architecture. We don't. They've covered that. This got emailed to everyone, including our association, so that they all got a chance to look at what. So we will cover them at different times, I think. Okay, good. All right, I think, uh, is there somebody want to make a motion to adjourn? So moved. All right, second. It. All right, all in favor. All in favor, Aye. stand up. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, let's get underway. And uh, I'd like to start with my apologies uh, for running late. It's what I get for scheduling an off-site meeting uh, with uh, not a lot of time in between. But appreciate everyone uh, here, both those who are participating and those in the audience as well. This is, uh, to my recollection, our third, is that right? Third meeting of this QBS working group. I just kind of begin by restating the purpose for uh, which we are gathered here today is to uh, come up with a document that can be posted both internally uh, with uh, the architects and engineers board uh, and then also externally with the other um, within more broadly on state resources and the goal of it is to both be internal facing to be helpful for our registrants uh, but then that it would also be helpful for um, for the purchasing side uh, so that it's going to be useful for uh, for as many people as possible. Um, so to that end, in our last meeting, uh, several people volunteered uh, to take the uh, MTAS QBS document and to redline it in order to uh, come up with something that we could agree on uh, about putting forward on those uh, websites and sharing in other means as we had discussed. So I know that several people sent uh, either to me or to my assistant uh, versions of that document. I thought it would be appropriate for us to review those, maybe talk about them, uh, certainly give opportunity to members in the audience to give their opinion as well. Um, so I think that that's what where I'd like for us to move, but maybe I could stop right now. Um, Having said all that, uh, let us go around and introduce ourselves to the audience um, and see if there are any other uh, uh, points of order that we wanted to talk about first. So I will start. Uh, my name is Carter Lawrence. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for Regulatory Boards, uh, and I think I've kind of fallen into a de facto chair of this working group. Uh, unelected, so y'all could toss me out at any moment that you want, uh, but maybe we'll go over to Frank next and work our way around. I'm Frank Wagster. I'm a West Tennessee Architectural Representative on the Tennessee A and E Board. Greg Thompson. I'm the East Tennessee Architectural Representative. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not getting your uh, microphone. Thank you. There you go. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Rick Thompson. I am the East Tennessee uh, Architectural Board member, and uh, glad to be here. Thank you. Robert Campbell, uh, East Tennessee Engineer Architect and Engineering Board Engineering member. I'm Lori Bryant, the Purchasing Director for the Clarksville Montgomery County School System, uh, representing the Tennessee Association of Public Purchasing. Trent Andrews, I'm sitting in for Kathy Stickle from the Comptroller's Office. Chloe Schaefer from the State Architect's Office. So, uh, for introducing yourselves. Uh, did anyone want to uh, address anything before we kind of jumped into the meat of this, of taking a look at uh, the redlined documents and maybe talking about how we could come to uh, an agreement. Look, I'm gonna, yeah, I'll go ahead since I'm used. I'm already warmed up to talk from Perfect. the last meeting. Um, first of all, I, I don't the red line when I looked at really was Terry McKees, which I thought was uh, pretty well done. Um, and, and I think you've got this one, but it printed out this way. It seemed to simplify a lot of the MTAS stuff, which was the MTAS was was good but it had a lot of different language and he kind of consolidated some stuff down two things on that or two two questions i think um number one in the state law there is a item if you look at tennessee code annotated 12-4-107 there is also a, a subparagraph number four 
talking about a satisfactory working relationship uh, for cities, counties, and utility districts, which I think needs to be addressed somehow in this document that we come up with because it is Tennessee Code annotated. So we need to give probably guidance on that. The second thing is, is in looking through this, um, it talks about the interview process. And my understanding was is that an interview process, I mean, if you knew who you were going to use, so for instance, you got your proposals and you got it down to one, two, three, there was no real requirement or real need to do an interview um, unless you weren't sure or they were very close or, or whatever. And I think that's something that not having to do an interview or not being required to do an interview takes a little burden off the people that are selecting the consultant. And so would you just want to add something if doing an interview? Yeah, then if doing steps. an interview, yeah. And, and the way it's written here, it's you, it's a step in doing the process. Uh, Lord, you, you all, you, you ready? Go ahead. Yeah, um, I think it can be addressed as an optional item right. or if, an if needed item. However, there are a number of times that I have come down to two or three that we feel are very qualified to do the job and bringing them in for an interview to clarify what they what they could provide and what we what we can come together on for for that is is often very useful so I don't want to eliminate that from the document entirely so Robert maybe for the benefit of all of us making notes then for the audience as well uh, was there a particular page, and maybe if you could break it down to paragraph, where you would uh, propose putting inserting that? And I'm going with the the the, the what Terry? Oh shoot! I think I'm getting Everybody's Donald Trump. Getting Sorry, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's everybody. It's from Trump. <laughs> he said he's made America great again. Very good. <laughs> Do not listen to Robert Campbell. It says this is yes. a test. Robert Campbell will help me make America great again. Oh, that's two of them already. <laughs> Mine says, be afraid, be very afraid. <laughs> Harder. If we could take just a step back. Um, sure. For oh, Trent yeah. and I, we just got these handouts. Actually, I reached out to your assistant and okay. asked him if there were any materials for this meeting. And late yesterday, he forwarded me the MTAS guide okay. and then um, a document from Terry McKee mm -hmm. that isn't redlined, as yes. far as I can tell. And so right. I don't, I'm not even sure who Terry McKee is. Can you... Um, and um, I just mean I don't I don't know where these yeah. things came from, and I'm not sure if I'm looking at the same things y'all been <laughs> looking at since I just got them. Right. I think we all just got them. Terry is the purchasing um, director and and for the Knoxville Community Development Corporation. He was hoping to be here today and wasn't able to be here. So. Um. And while what we were sent was uh, purportedly a redlined version. We saw no red line. There was no way to get into the track change and see. So uh, uh, my assistant, Dustin, actually had to kind of manually go through and note what was different uh, from the originally supplied document. And, and actually, maybe if I could take the opportunity to stop there, did anyone else provide a red lined document? Just took it as a marketing Okay. Okay. I mean, you, can, you can run a red line. You, I mean, I ran one. You can run a comparison of the two documents, and it appears that there are a lot of changes. Okay. So, I, I mean, think that, yeah, no, yeah, the, just, the topics are all still there. I think he took a lot of words, and there was some real definition stuff at the beginning or restatement of what the state law was. And if I'm looking at the original again. Just so having I, got it, and right. it's hard to sure. so, participate. Uh, understand so would it maybe be helpful to kind of work through it uh, sequentially in order to give an opportunity uh, to to see or are, do you need time to take and digest on your own separate from this I mean I think we're I mean if uh, we will need time to read it and to look at, I just ran the red line a few minutes ago I think yes we will need time to read it I mean it's significantly different Right, but you have read the original MTAS document, right? So, did, and did you prepare your own red line of that? No, because I wasn't on the subcommittee that I thought okay. was supposed to be meeting, and I was going to be an advisor, is my recollection of the last, and no one contacted yeah. me with anything. Right. I, so. It was never the goal that the subcommittee was going to meet separately, but instead that they would be doing their individual work on redlining it. As you probably recall, I was not part of that process because I've tried to remain a little bit 
uh, separated from it, but instead to just facilitate. I'm not sure exactly what happened. I don't know when this document from Terry McKee arrived, uh, so I'm not sure if we got that yesterday or if we received it a, m a month ago. Um, so I, I, I can't speak to that. But if, if we're going to be able to talk about the document right now it, it, and move forward as a working group uh, with and with total understanding that you need to take a look at this separately, I think it would be helpful for us to still work through the document that we have and to talk about making suggestions to it. That, because uh, uh, otherwise we're just going to have to have uh, y yet another one of these uh, meetings and as much as I love getting together with everyone, I'm sure that uh, everyone has things they would like to do uh, beside get together at the David Crockett Tower. Well, and again, I'll go back to even on the original this one. I still think there needs to be an or interview, not as and and a number four for the Tennessee Code annotated needs to be addressed somehow, whether it's with the red line version or the MTAS version that we received early on, the MTAS basically says that you will have to have an interview. And I understand why you may want to have an interview, but there are times, too, when number one is clearly number one and number two and three are far enough down that I don't want it prescribed in the process if it's something that's not necessary for you all to make a decision on who it is because it wastes time on both sides then. and. Then the number four, and I know I'm blabbing, but number four in the Tennessee Code annotated was if you have a, the way I read it, for cities, counties, and utility districts having a satisfactory existing working relationship for architectural engineering services may expand the scope of the services provided they were within the technical competency of the existing firm without exercising this section. And, and I think that's a good thing to have. Uh, we do a lot of utility district work and knowing the system and knowing what pieces, it's really beneficial to be able to have that that relationship makes a lot of sense. Um, but maybe having something on that one that says, hey, even if you've got that pre-existing relationship from the person that you want to do that, that make them give you three projects or something. I'm just throwing something out that they've done that are exactly like the one you've got them working on now. Um, so if you're wanting them to do a water storage tank, please provide three other water storage tank projects that they've done so that you can at least make sure that there's some documentation that they're technically competent to do what you want to have done. But it's in the Tennessee Code annotated. We have to address it somehow in what we end up doing. That's, that's my thought. Not for state, it's for city, county, yeah. and utility district. I mean, it's specifically spelled out for those three. Like Rick and I were talking about, it's been my experience if there's not already a pre-existing relationships when you're talking about cities, counties, and utility districts, most of the time people don't just cold pick somebody out of the blue for, you know, that relation. That, does that, if that makes any sense. So, anyway. I'll show that for the legislature revised the section of the code this session to deal specifically with construction management or right. I guess there ought to be a thought of whether or not this guidance document should be limited to to guidance on architectural and engineering services specifically or if it's going to address the full gamut of Disciplines covered by the QBS statute. Question. Very good question. Okay. I was just thinking architects and engineering services because. <laughs> well, that would but, but, but make it, that would certainly make it simpler. Yeah, they do know? construction management too. I mean, architects and engineers mm -hmm. do construction management as well. So, anyway. <clears throat>
Is is the red line document on your iPad? I can't. No, I just I ran a comparison in Word and yeah. printed it out and that's okay. That's what yeah. I got. I'm happy to happy to give you my copy. No, no I, I just thought it was because <laughs> I can do here. another. It's on here. The you know not having not having the document in front yeah. of me. I it, it's hard to. I mean, I, I, I see where they've highlighted the, in this format, but it's different. Yeah. yeah. Is this something Terry has been working with, or is this something that he developed based off of the, I guess, thank you to Terry for um, putting this together, but. <laughs> yes, he um, he's a little more, or he was he was able to get the, spend a, spend some time on it, and it came from, from this, because he was, like I said, he was planning to be here as part of the, but um, but yes, it came from the the MTAS document that he he worked that up or made some notes on. So I think I've just been nominated. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead and start with the original MTAS one. If everybody's had a chance to kind of look through it. First of all, let's look at the table of contents. And if you look at the, let's, let's before we Skip down to where it says step one, step two, step three, step four, etc., 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 through step nine. Do we all agree those are the correct steps? And the correct steps in that order, in that order as well. Right. Yes, and, and we can put something in there, I think, that says if you get to this point, then you can skip what, or whatever. I mean, we, but as long as we think those, that's the right order for QBS, I think that's to me, is a, a big thing. Well, isn't, isn't what you were discussing earlier, step six might be... Um, 
Yeah, but we can. Yeah, what we can yeah. do is we can put in that sentence for step six. An interview is not necessary. Is not required to follow QBS. However, if you're in a situation where you're it's recommended, re it's recommended if you can't, if there's not a lot of separation between in the ranking of your firms, or if a clear favorite's not selected or something. But I think there needs to be a process in there to do an interview because there's some really good guidance about setting up the room and about. Mm -hmm you know, how you make that kind of fair. And I think there's some good guidance in there about that, that that helps whoever's doing that interview do it in a way that people think they're getting a, a fair shake. Probably the same with the site visits. Those are optional yes. as well. Yes, I think so too, yeah. Where's the site? Site visits are up a little bit. They're um, in the this is step five. Okay. Just as a comment, I, I recently was responding to an RFQ, and the language in there was uh, site visits are not required. I mean, it was just that simple. You could do them if you wanted to, but it was not required. And also, the interview process that they they had the option to interview the three top selected firms, or at their discretion, or it was at their discretion. So the way they worded it was that it was not an absolute. So and and, I, and it's with it's with the city, and I've done both. You know, you've had to look at the site. And I've had an interview with two other firms, and then I've been selected without an interview, and it's because of qualifications. So, it's it needs some flexibility. Yeah. yeah. So basically, if this was a flow chart, we could get to one side where where it, it could terminate there but it, there might be another reason why the the chart would flow on to get down to the interview correct okay you could get to a point and say this is my termination on this particular point or if i need to i can do these next two steps they may be optional on that would from a, a municipal standpoint I, I think it's any and all uh irregularities and blah 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 can be waived that's typically what we get to see <laughs> yeah, some, something along that line. Yeah, okay. But, yeah. but you, you would determine the, re, the need for an uh, interview or site visit probably more on a case-by-case -case basis. So, you know, whether or not uh, – now, obviously, if you're going to interview one firm and you, if you've got a short list and you're going to interview one of them, you yes. need to interview all three of them. Correct. But, Correct. Um, and, but uh, that's – it's kind of – it would be on a case-by-case -case basis on some, on some things. As I said before, we, you know, we may not have – we may not have a reason to do interviews. It may be a clear, there may be a clear number one and you go with that one, but there may be two or three that are ranked up there, you know, but everybody's pretty happy with, with them and you want to try to get a little more definition. So on a project by project basis that you make that determination. I don't think you would ever close that door on your opportunity to, uh, to, no. to interview if you say, wow, you know, this, this looks pretty good. We got, we got two or three good firms here. We need to talk to them. So. So we're all good with the steps and the optionality of the interview and the site visit. Okay, good. Um, now, let's go up. Now, now we're going to go backwards. Uh, my opinion is that there needs to be some rationale, and that rationale can be probably done in a couple of different sentences. Um, the purpose is to prevent a process is to present a process that allows the public funds to be whatever the most effective or something and it's required by the, the statute in, in Tennessee state law and by the Brooks Act. I mean again that's probably two or three sentences that you could put as a preamble to this entire document. So do you want to shorten the section that begins with legal requirements and flows into why follow QBS selection? Is that Yeah, I think so. From Yeah, I think I think we can take qualification based selection process, get rid of this whole step 1 through 9 thing. I mean, to me you've already said what step 1 through 9 is in your table of contents, so there's no sense in having it in there twice. 
and then take the legal requirements of contracting for professional services um, and then up to where it says by fall QBS selection process I think all those can be distilled into a few sentences or a couple paragraphs or something I don't think it needs to be yes ma'am if I'm allowed to speak, but I'm going to. Go Casey ahead. Anderson with the engineers. I need to eat another the one thing that we've talked about from the beginning of all of this is if you could perhaps, under why follow the QBS selection process, that very last bullet is it's the law. It might be really helpful to have that really early in the document somewhere. Maybe a lead off with it's the law. That we're discussing this because you're, you know, legally obligated to. Just, just a thought. Sure. I would say it. The beginning of the procuring professional services and process does start with the TCA listed. So it seems that we are bookending on both sides. We're saying it's the law by showing the statute and finishing by it's the law. But this one we were uh, So that's on page four where, uh, where we see the uh, TCA listed. Oh, okay. and five is where it finishes with it's the law. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, just to throw out the something throughout the document that we would want to address is is the references to only municipal offices uh, or you know municipal officials or whatever because I think we're wanting to make sure that this is is relevant to counties and other and other local governments so if we can when it at the times when it only only references municipal or city if we can change that and replace with local government or another similar phrase and Casey if if you don't mind the is that enough that the TCA is listed and then it also says it's the law or did you want to see a more explicit reminder that one has to follow it no I mean I I I think we're getting. I, I don't. I don't want to go on the record at this very moment and say it's enough or it's not enough or whatever. Because I, because I, I need to look at both of them. The, any any changes or whatever. But when we had initially reviewed the MTAS document at the very beginning, those changes. Um, I, I, I and I apologize because I was thinking that there was a subcommittee that was going to meet about some of this stuff, and so we had done a lot of red line changes pretty early in this process as we started looking through some of these documents and so I would really love we, we probably I I think we just need to put all the pieces together but but I so I don't know the answer to that question but and, and I'll Lori I'll say one quick thing on that too and it probably needs to say the purpose of this section presents a simple step-by-step -step procedure to help state and local Tennessee state and local government because this is going to be a state government. Is it going to apply to the state? Okay, I wasn't wasn't clear on that. So but it's Tennessee code annotated. I mean, it's got to it's got to apply. It, it, the, the Tennessee code annotated applies to state and local. Oh, so yes, it does. I just wasn't sure about the process. Yes, yeah, I don't. I, don't, I mean, I don't think we, there's any objection with the fact that it applies to the state government. I'm just not sure that this procedural guide is what our you know our the SBC this to the extent there is any conflict with the SBC policy on selections and this guide wouldn't want there to be any impression that this guide is now going to trump SBC policy so it might I guess our preference would probably be that it be limited to state and local governments and if, if y'all have any concerns about how state entities are following or are not following Casey's always been pretty quick and Ashley to tell us when they think there's a problem <laughs> and, and we're happy to continue to hear from you let me ask um, you a question though mm -hmm. do you follow these basic step one through nines um when you're when you're in the in the very few cases um are there interviews i would say it's only for the um i mean ut on its marquee projects is probably the only one who does routinely interview as part of its process um but you know their forms included in here and I don't think they're consistent with the forms that our state procurement agencies um, oh, yeah. typically yeah, use yeah, 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 right yeah. I mean yeah. just in su yeah. in substance yes and I think that's where we need to make sure too is and maybe that's what the document needs to say you can have your own 
forms, you can call the words a little different as long as you're in. I mean, and, and, and I think that's why the, I like the steps because they say advertise or, you know, seek out qualifications. And the steps, they're the same steps you would go through. You may call them a little different and you may use a little bit of different form. And I think we want to make sure we give all the municipalities the flexibility to use a form as long as it meets a intent of what that step would be. One, uh, one significant thing about the, the state projects is the state sets a MACC and then the fee is, you're told what the fee is based on a formula. And so there's no fee negotiation unless the state changes the scope of the project. But when they're selecting a designer, they go us through a similar process, but the fee is not part of the discussion or the... For basic services. Right, for basic services. But you are negotiating a contract. Even though it's not a fee, you are that, still negotiating a contract that may have certain scopes in and out of it or right. certain things in and, and out of it. And where it, it got into being problematic is when the state started allowing you to include consultants or subconsultants that are not asked for in the basic services but you might provide them anyway and in the, so doing you're saying that you're bringing more to the table for the same amount of fee which is kind of in a backwards way trying to negotiate a fee and so that's that's the problem that I've seen with with state projects when that's allowed to happen it ought to be here's the basic you know here's the basic fee here's the basic scope of the project here are the basic sub consultants that uh, you're required to have and let that be a level playing field and then later negotiate as an additional service that are listed and there's a whole list of them um, and you might comment on that so that, how does the state look at that the formula is supposed to be for the basic services associated with the project but do you allow people to bring extra consultants in sub consultants in and call it cause it part of their basic services where you might have another uh, respondent not having that in there but still covering the basic services we are very much looking at this but we are not in a, we have not found a way that the state can tell people that they can't propose services to the state just kind of unlevels the playing field when you do that we haven't found a way to tell people that they can't propose services they can provide all the free stuff they want I guess hmm. but we are but you know aware, what I'm we are saying aware of your, we are of aware of your concern and I'm not in, at all trying to say that I'm um, but you know the state ask for the basic services and that's as far as we've been able to determine that we're able to control I mean influence I shouldn't say control influence what people propose maybe if we could uh, return to the original MTAS document I'm on page five I, I think that we had left off on step one with defining the project so in the same order and then maybe see if there was anything to be stricken or added to this section yeah. <clears throat> so to me on all these sections there's some really good information in here um, but it's not information necessarily you would use in a white paper or one page or two page summary to give to somebody to come up with a to give guidance to them Okay, um, and I, I'll just quickly go through number step number one. Defining the project may be one of the hardest task decision makers will face. Well, that's yeah, okay, but you this thing needs to say 
you will you need to define the project and the scope of the project and here's some things that you will need to consider when you define the scope of the project what problems are you trying to solve when do you need a solution where's the problem instead of kind of the commentary that's in there that i know is good for training or for dialogue when you're doing that but it's not necessarily good for the practitioner for what we're trying to do here and what we're trying to do here is create a template or a set of rules or a set of expectations we're not trying to necessarily go through a training process or a does that make a, yeah so would, would yeah, you it propose because yeah, it is hard but i mean what does that do to sure x y and z you to the answer would you then propose removing those first two paragraphs as they're a little more narrative in nature and just having the what, when, where, how? I think that's, those things are fine. Um, yeah, I think that kind of information is certainly fine. And you go to step number two. Establish an impartial selection committee should be no more than five to seven members, no fewer than three. Um, this can, these committees can be made up of, and you may want to, but see, that's the thing too. Each individual, I don't want to pigeonhole Clarksville from doing something different than Morgan County does their selection committee may be different and may need to be different based on the staff they have the it's different um so you may want to have two city council people on in clarksville right i mean maybe maybe not i don't know or you may want to pull a parks director onto your selection committee or you may want to have a somebody from the community that's a contractor that's familiar with these type of projects Whereas somebody in a smaller county or a different county may say, we want it to be the mayor, the whatever and the whatever. I, I don't know. But if you don't, this is pretty prescriptive in how and kind of what that committee needs to be made up of. And I just think it needs to be more generic in how you go about that. Does that sound right? guidance added about the um, qualifications or experience of the people on the committee one eight is a desire to make sure that the evaluators understand the and that may be the sentence you put in there make the committee up with people that understand the scope and complex as best possible make sure the committee is made up of people who understand the scope and complexity of the project they're evaluating I, I, to me that's a great i mean that's a perfect sentence instead of having you may or may not have this person you may or may not have this you may or may not have this well you might want to have this again i think that's good guidance and that helps in a training session but i'm not sure that it helps going forward yes ma'am probably not okay um, the selection committee should be made up of those individuals that have uh, that have an technical or other understanding of the project and its complexities. So the first the first sentence of the final paragraph of that section reads, "Quote: If possible, the committee should be composed of individuals with expertise in management, finance, technical." technical aspects of projects and operations in quote is that I wouldn't put all that in there you would not have all that no. you just want it to say that they understand this particular one yeah. because okay. you may be you may be deciding on a um, ba a new bathroom for a uh, park what what financial I mean what you need somebody that understands what a bathroom to a park looks like. You don't need a finance person. You don't need a you don't need a nine person committee to do something like that. You may just need somebody who understands about 
plumbing. I mean, you may go get Joe's plumbing guy to put on there, or maybe one of your council people is a plumber. I don't know. I'm just, I want, I want them. I think, and you all tell me if I'm wrong, uh, and I'm looking at Lori a little bit more on this, but I would think the municipality, the, 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 they would want people, they would want some more flexibility in picking that committee based on what they've got available to do and what the project looks like, rather than be so prescriptive. It looks prescriptive to me. Yes, that's true. Typically you would, if you're building a, uh, or say you're designing a um, sewer line, then you're going to have, you're going to have somebody from your public utilities department on there and um, probably more than one. Um, typically, typically I wouldn't have involved anybody other than the department that was involved with it. So having the finance, somebody from the finance office is not, probably not going to be a, um, something that something that would happen um, there may be somebody from like the city administrator's office or or something along that line if there was a big enough interest in that project um, just uh, it just kind of depends on on what uh, what the scope of the project is intended to be um, in in my experience, refining the scope of the project is not something that the selection committee does. Usually that has been done prior to the, the selection committee getting together. Um, so that's, it, it's usually, usually the scope has been defined by the time we say who is going to be. So a lot of what, a lot of what this is talking about in defining the project with the selection committee is seldom done unless unless there's a reason to do it another way or this or this. but um, that, that's been my experience anyway so are we looking for something along the lines of trying to take what you said and then Lori what you just said as well committee members should be to the greatest extent feasible knowledgeable in the field of the scope of the project Yeah, or understand the complete, or understand the project, or be able to give a. Yeah. But it's just there's a lot of words on here, and that's really you just want a few words. I mean, I think to. And and you want flexibility because you're exactly right. You're going to pick committee people based on. Is it in the public works department or is it in the maintenance department? Is it in this department or is it in that department? And. You know, sometimes the mayor, it may be something that the mayor says, I want to sit in on this because it involves my budget for next year and I want, or something. You may want your finance person to sit in on it because there may be something money-wise that, that you need to ask. Hey, we need to make sure this is going to be done across two calendar year or fiscal years or something so that we can work that out, whatever. Uh, but I don't think this document needs to specify who they put on that selection committee. I mean, have um, some sort of technical expertise to your point. Technical or operational. So, I mean, you know, you're picking your utility person because they understand what's happening, or so. So, I think a lot of this is is gone. I think there is some good guidance, though. In here, where I would just say, odd number of committees work best, and, and you know, I mean, and that's all. You don't need to say three and five and seven and say odd number of committees work best. Well, and to their point of five to seven, once your committee gets to be larger than seven, if you're expecting people to actually attend all of the meetings, then it becomes more difficult to schedule people. It's a logistical. That's a logistical thing more than more than a. That's a logistical recommendation more than something that's that's really terribly important to the committee itself. So, and that's something though that that the purchasing person would say, let's or whoever would say, you know, let's let's keep it at five, as long as it's an odd number. Right. Tiebreaker. So you look at selection committee task. Um, if you want to go through that, um, the selection committee tasks are pretty simple. You select a you select your consultant or your proposer. 
I don't know how many selection committees have been involved in mediation to resolve disputes between owner and contractor, project startup services. Oh, this is defining professional services, but it's def this is defining what the selection committee might be asking of the professional service provider. Um, The professional service provider would be the one that provides all of these items, one through five. Robert, I know you've generally preferred brevity. Would you want to strike anything here? Yeah, the only thing I, I mean, again, I selection committee tasker to pick the. I would say if there's a good point to, to leaving this in here is a lot of the, these committees have no idea wh what they're interviewing for. There might be another book they could read on it, but here it is right here. And these are good points as to how, you know, the process that you follow that the people you're hiring are going to perform knowledge if you're going to be on a selection committee to know what you're selecting a person for you know it may not be their good looks or their the best pictures that they bring it might be other services that they do and so even though it's wordy and I agree with that I mean the the, the wordy part kind of bothers me because you wonder who's going to read the whole thing. That's, right. that's my, that's, that's, yeah. But this, this particular part, to me, helps somebody that's, that's a banker or something that's never, you know, he's an upstanding citizen, they put him on the selection committee. But, um, and I'm not saying bankers don't, most, <laughs> most do actually. But, you know, at, at least this gives them some idea of what, services they're looking for and maybe there's some of these that they go well we don't want to spend the money on this particular part of the process and should those items be moved then to step one under define the project that was going to be my point it's, it's, it's or a even an appendix it's a scope it's more of a scoping thing these are more scoping items i would right. think then right why are you doing this in the first yeah. place and when you put the scope down you can list those say, here's the scope of the project preliminary design and that's, the selection committee can have that, but I don't think that's up to the selection committee to, they need to be aware of it, but you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think that needs to go under scope. So could we go ahead and slot it in, into scope, where, where you would want to put that? Right underneath defining the project. Move on to step three now. Step three is good. So, um, step three next step solicit qualification statements from interested parties. The step uh, commonly is called the request for qualifications. The RFQ differs from a request for proposal. Issuing an RFP means that you're seeking a cost proposal. Never mind. I had that discussion a little earlier on. I just wanted to. I'm just. I'm just wanting to hammer my point home again. I'm sorry. Um, again, I think that. Um, I think most of that's probably pretty good. There may be some wordiness in there, but what do you all think? What do you all think? I think that gives some pretty good guidance to the person submitting the RFQ. You can put it in newspapers, advertising times, that kind of stuff. Nick, are you okay with that? Because you're the, you're the important one.
Step four seems uh, similarly short. Uh, was there anything that you wanted to tighten up there? Back to step three for just a second. The 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 um, the way that the RFQ is, I'm going to use the word disseminated, or but it's like advertisements in the newspaper. Um, direct mail to firms or individuals. How, how do you do that without discriminating? Not the advertisement in the paper, the sending out letters. I think you can do that. You can direct solicit, but I think you have to do it from people that are pre qualified. Um, direction or the the practice most people have is if they've got a vendor list that they are that people have registered for or or have quali pre qualified for if you want to put it that that way. Ours is a ours is a registration process. So if somebody has said this is this is our information and and our and our just basic qualifications, um, you know we we would like to be notified of any of any. Um, opportunities that become available then at that point we notify them when when something comes up so the direct mail or direct email or direct notification to firms or individuals from from your vendor list is is a fairly standard is a fairly standard thing um, and then anybody in addition to that who isn't part of that list um, who's requested to be notified would find out through the advertisement in newspapers trade magazine and website so um, I think probably most people find out from your website, you know, they've got a subscription to some service that, that gives them information about that, those upcoming things. Um, that's, that's kind of what I've, I've come, to, come to see in the last several years. Um, so, so it's often, it, I probably get more questions about those kinds of things from, from people who I haven't ever heard of before that, that had uh, had an interest in it and found out about it from the website. So, um, but but we also do you know directly notify the people who have requested to be notified as well. So, so maybe we take out the word mail and <laughs> or direct <laughs> notification. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> mails. I don't, I don't mail very. I try not to mail very much anymore. So. <laughs> So again, um, I think we need some work on some of the attachments because in statement in step four, when statement of qualifications have been received, each member of the selection committee should use a a um, should use a pre-approved evaluation criteria or pre-set or predetermined predetermined evaluation criteria similar to what to similar to a6 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. or something like that because your yours may be totally different i mean again for small project maybe you're going to have your evaluation criteria maybe three points or something and I've seen it where it's like technical competency and similar projects and understanding of the, and that's fine. Yeah. But but everybody needs to understand what they're going to be judged on, uh, how many points are assigned to each section, mm -hmm. and once you understand that, then that's you know if you decide to use it a ten page Excel file to do that or a three sentences on a piece of paper, then then that's up to whoever's evaluating it. You don't need to have all this stuff. Score one through ten. Yeah. Looking at A6, one thing I see all the time that's not listed here, and like you say, this is for you to tailor to whatever your needs are, but most local governments have some kind of wait for local 
firms or within a certain distance project. that is um, that is not something that is advocated by the Attorney General's office they've it all time. <laughs> they've issued a ruling about that um, now there may be uh, there may be other considerations in in part of that but the Attorney General has has opined against it so I could interject real fast just for those following along in the audience uh, what Frank's referencing a6 is on page 21 of the I don't think it's something that we want to try to include here. <laughs> well, but let me. And if that's so, should that be stated in here somehow or other? Well, let, let's talk about that particular issue for a second, because to me, that's that's one of the other elephants in the room when it comes to selection. One of the things that I hear from purchasing folks as well as engineering folks and, and other uh, people is this: Here was my team. Here's the team we picked. <laughs> Here was the team we got. And I think we need to make sure that the team that was selected is the team you get. Or you at least get to say this other person was a, we, we're okay with you using this person because they've something, right? You don't want to pick a bunch of people that split the atom and then all of a sudden get the group of people that swept up the mess after the atom was split. And and I'm afraid that's what happens on a lot of these RFQs. And part of the dissatisfaction with some of the process is, and, and that gets back a little bit to the local presence part. If I, if I can show you the top five people in my company and put them on everything, you may never get access to those people because they may be working on the $50 million project. Project's a $100,000 project. But I'm gonna show them because they make my proposal look really good. Is that uh, no I understand where you're coming from I just legally we have trouble doing what you're talking about or, or making that a uh, a, a, a rating or a weight factor of the of the uh, proposal so well, I've seen proposals that say that the the staff that you're going to use needs to be within 50 miles of the, or something like that. Well, and there have been well, and there are reasons there are reasons why you would do that as well. You, as far as access to the to the project, um, so so yes, that's that's a consideration and something that you can kind of consider as part of it. But it's not it's not your deciding. It's not something that I would. It's not something that I would put in and saying if you're not a local, if you're not a local company, we give you any any value on this part of the project or something. Um, uh, what I've seen happen is the the local part, and like let's say your total score is 100, they may put 25 points in there as being. That's not a practice I would advocate, but I, I, I don't. I don't like it either. <laughs> but, well, I do think, and, and I think it's something for further discussion. But I think there needs to be a way to validate the people that you're getting. And from a from a public health, safety, and welfare standpoint, if you're going to propose a certain level of expertise and a certain level of knowledge and a certain level of experience on a project, and that's the reason you get selected, then you need to make sure that you provide that certain level of experience and expertise on that project or somebody else needs to do it. I mean, that's because that's not protecting the health, safety and welfare of the public. If everybody you propose is got a PhD and the people that actually end up working on the project are summer interns. Yes. And I agree with you on that. I think part of what you are doing when you get to the later stages of this where you're negotiating the contracts and and having your discussions with the firm is saying are these actually the people who are going to be working on this project for us um, you know who is it that you you know that's part of your discussions with the firm I guess um, that way you know either yes these five people who are outstanding are, are they are they live in South Dakota and and they're going to be overseeing it from a distance and and whatever. But the this uh, firm over here in Arkansas is going to be, or this this office over here in Arkansas or in Nashville or in wherever, is going to be 
the ones that are actually working on, I say, I, I was, I used to be in the Memphis area, so Arkansas was not a, not a, uh, <laughs> uh, outside of the realm of possibility. Um, so, you know, but you, um, but those are, those are things that, uh, those are things that you're asking about there, you know, who is it that's actually going to be doing the work on this project, who's doing the oversight on it, who's doing the quality control on it, um, you know, do you, and where are, you know, not necessarily location-wise, where are those people, but how accessible are they to the project itself, so. But I think that question may need to be asked earlier on. Okay. During, I mean, to me, it, because here's, here's why. You've already gone to the time and effort and all this of selecting, and now that you're your number one qualified firm, and you want to try your best to make sure whoever your number one firm is, you're going to bring them to contract because you've all put a lot of effort into getting them to that point. To go to number two now, once you find out that the team that they've given you is not really the team that's going to work on it, it may take you a month, two months, three months to get all that figured out. And meanwhile, your project that you're really needing to get done is two months, three months, four months, five months further down the pike and you've got to not start all over again, but you certainly have to do more work. And you know, maybe just listing where their home offices are, maybe, I don't know the answer to that yet, but I certainly would like to see that as part of this QBS guidance if we can. So maybe some information or some recommendation in the solicitation that they include in the solicitation to ensure that they are asking for the project team who will be working on the project and oh, yes I think so. you have a legitimate reason to ask for that guys in mind so it's not necessarily location based but it's it's who exactly is working on this is are you planning to have working on this project you're you may have a uh, Ricky's not out there yeah, he is you may have an HVAC person that is working on a project that can work on it from 200 miles away because they're not integrally involved in the where all the pieces and parts go together but you may want the person that's deciding all that to be where you can come and meet three times a week on the details of it you know i mean there, there may be some instances where that distance it really doesn't matter but there may be some where it's certain positions are more critical that they have some local presence or local availability. Go ahead. I'm I'm just jabbering right now. I, I, I think I think you're you're kinda overthinking it a little bit in that uh if I'm if I'm gonna send you an RFQ, I'm gonna send you the best team I can put on there. And it's my intention to use those people. Your project is delayed six months. I can't guarantee I'm going to use those people, so I shouldn't be held accountable or penalized for the fact that uh, Randy Jones, who works in my office, was going to be doing the HVAC. Randy's tied up on the new university project, and Bobby Smith's going to be doing the HVAC. Does that disqualify me? It shouldn't. So I, I don't. I want to be careful not to start disqualifying people. Now, it, on, on the RF cues that I respond to a lot of them have specific names they want identified as to who is doing the electrical and and, and a lot of these are clients that that uh, are university clients who have relationships and know the quali qualifications of these individuals that are on your team and if you don't have them on your team then you're in trouble but if something happens and you can't have them on your team, there is an avenue of saying, hey, this is why this happened, and it's just who we're going to replace. And I, I'm not as concerned about it as being an out-of-town consultant because I use a lot of out-of-town out consultants because of our practices in 40 states. But, you know, I, so I'm, I'm used to doing that, uh, you know, having engineers out of Ohio or wherever. But, and, and yeah, having them there on a weekly basis is not going to be practical but you know with Skype and things like that but but I, I just want to be careful uh, to not limit these if it were me I would like to at least have have the knowledge that there was somebody that you were going to substitute somebody on yeah, that yeah. team and yeah. and have the opportunity to review that and say yes I approve or no I don't is what are the other options so and maybe that's a statement or, or is that part of the negotiations of the contract hey you you offered up this team 
I need to know right now if there's an issue with this. <clears throat> I got a phone call last week from a from a, a municipality, and we hadn't, we we were awarded the project three months ago and hadn't heard a word from. Them. So I just I had no idea what was going on. The guy calls up and he says, "Have you assigned a project manager to this project yet?" And I said, "Well, it was on my RFQ." He said, "Well, I I don't expect to hold your hold you to that since it's delayed." which was very uh, reassuring to me that I'm, you know, I'm getting a fair shake from the client. But it was the same guy. But, I mean, I, I have gone through this with the state of Tennessee when things have changed at the university level where somebody can't do that particular thing anymore. And, and, and there's an avenue to do that. It just needs to be defined. And I don't, I don't think it defines it here. You're right. Oh, what do we want to put in the document then for, <laughs> oh, to try to address that? I, I don't I don't know that I've got good answers right now. I okay. think that document's go I think we're gonna have to discuss that a little bit more and come up maybe we've got an answer right here. I don't know. From your perspective though, what how would you like to see it? I mean you're you're putting out the RFQ, right? I would include I, I would include a statement in the RFQ that says something along the lines of uh the the proposer shall include the names and, and biography of or qualifications of the project team that they intend to use on this project. Um, future substitutions must be um, must be approved prior to use of, of a new person uh, by the by the project by the city's project manager. So something uh, that that would be what I would include in my request for qualifications. I don't see that being a problem. I mean, it gives everybody an opportunity to say, okay, here we are. If something happens, we got an option. So. I was just going to say that TBR does that exact thing. When you respond to uh, or submit a designer letter of interest, you have to list each of the responsible in charge professionals, and it says, and if you are at any time at any time in the project want to change this it has to be submitted and approved by TBR I think it works pretty well part that you just mentioned where where was were you proposing to include that a statement that would go in your scope of work kind of a under who would be involved um, so under step one that last item who will be involved um, that you should include a, a statement regarding the use of the project team that is okay. planning to do I think I might have gotten a little turned around. Did we finish up with four, or were, was there still work to be done on step four? I think step four just needs to have uh, a statement of qualifications have been received. Uh, each member of the selection committee should use a predetermined um, predetermined evaluation criteria to independently evaluate the written submittals and assigned points. An example of one is A6 statement of qualifications and evaluation form. An example of this is there, is, is that. Okay, so you would cut um, beginning with checking references that oh, I, I would actually have, um, I, I would probably have, see I don't know where checking references comes in. I've had it done early, and I've had it done at the end. So I don't know exactly where checking references. I, come. I don't usually do it until it, I at least I have a short list. I don't if I've got 15 respondents, right. I'm not going to check references on all 15. So um, I might check references on all on the all three of the short list people, or I might say we've got it. 
we've got a short list and we've narrowed it down to the last one and we're going to check references on that that one that we're pretty sure about okay so maybe we're but, moving um, that so oh, sorry. Uh, checking references is a part of an evaluation though so so yeah we need we maybe the sentence needs to say once a short list has been developed or the uh, the preferred consultant has been selected references should be checked The, um, the form, the A6 form, though, however, includes the reference checks as a weighted item. Um, I, I have, I've done that before, and it, because I don't typically do the reference checks until later, it tends to wind up, I wind up being short on the number of points I'm supposed to have. Um, so I don't typically put the, I don't wind up putting the reference checks in the, in the, evaluation form but um. no I don't like it in there either because sometimes they don't return those forms oh well, yes and, and, <laughs> and you get penalized because a good reference just doesn't do that I mean that's something one of those things they don't do References that you know they're asking you to give them a reference. If good. if you've got if you've got any <laughs> sense at all, you you call your reference and say, hey, you're fixing to get a letter, and um, you know I, I already loaded <laughs> or should be now. If, I'm assuming sometimes you. I mean, occasionally uh, we get a reference that somebody really trashes somebody, but. For the most part, when you, you know, the references that you're talking to, I would move already, reference checks to a I don't later, put this a much later value step. In there, I guess. Step six. <laughs> step six. Yes, as as part of as part of the interview um, or prior to the interviews or, or at, at some point during the interview process. Uh, checking, I uh, should check references. So, okay, so are we picking back up at five then? Are we yeah, I think that goes back to the whole. We say step five, notify firms of results and conduct site visits. I'll just put in parentheses if needed. If necessary. Um, uh, Remove references to by mail. Uh, you can. <laughs> I would just say notify the firms not selected, period, and just say interviews and site visits not selected period okay, so it looks like we could lose almost the entirety of that first paragraph is that is that what you're proposing so we have the notify firms not selected lose almost the rest of it and then pick back up with notifying the firms that are selected yeah, so I, yeah. yes notify the would it be your intention to leave in the reference to the um, example letter in A9? Do we want to keep those in here? I think we should, yes. Okay. So how about in the second or third paragraphs? Are there parts of that that you would also strike I would I mean I think that whole section needs to be moved to the next step which is interview shortlisted firms if you if you desire notify firms if there will be an interview and if there will be an interview then time and place, just 
the study's information, dates and times for site visits, selection criteria, you know, conduct site visits if necessary. And then the interviews got, this has got some pretty good information in here on number uh, six about the interview and the setup of the room and, and I don't know what all to cut out of that. Um, I conduct all the interviews on the same day using the same interview. Well, there, I think we can lose some of that. Um, the same day often is, is a difficult thing if you're doing a, you know, a two hour interview process and you've got three firms, there may be, there, you know, that may, well, yes, they would all fit in the same day. Often it's, it's not logistically, um, feasible to do so. So within, I would say within the same, you know, week or so, but, um, so I, I think it's, I think that's not really necessary there. Um, So, Lori, would you be comfortable with continuing to stress the importance of consistency, but actually taking out the uh, the recommendation that it always happens on the same day and some of those others? Yes. Um, yeah. So. And how about the the bottom part of the page that begins with immediately after? Would you also want to remove that and instead just focus on capturing as quickly as possible the impressions? I actually like that. Okay. I mean, I don't know what, Laurie, if you do or not, but I think right after they've interviewed for the team to sit there and talk about it is a, is probably a pretty good thing. Yes, that's it's a, probably a the best uh, a best practice. Um, I don't always do it, but it is always it is probably a best practice. I often just wait till the end of the interview for everybody is over, but rather than each interview, but. Um, I think it's helpful to the team to have a to make a good summary after right after right after you have heard from a firm. So leaving that section intact, that really takes us all the way through to seven then, uh, with ranking of the firms. Another fairly short one, but was there further content that could be removed here? Back up just a couple of things on six. The the last uh, bullet point at the very end of that says interview session should be closed. Don't allow one firm to sit in on another. I totally agree with that. I've had that happen. Um, but somebody might read this as it should be closed to the public. Sure. The meaning. Well, it's not a, it's typically not a public record until we've made a decision on something. So, um, we, I've, I've been in a lot of school board interviews where there's a hundred people sitting out. So the firm isn't there. They probably got somebody sitting in yeah. <laughs> as a spy. <laughs> I don't know. But, I'm not familiar but I, with, you with know, that. I, that's not been I'm my practice. I'm all for it being so. close to the public, but I just, I just want to make sure that's not Anti something. I don't know why. It's it not. Would be. Yeah. <laughs> in in Florida, it would be here. Here, it's not. <laughs> like the next to the last bullet point, even though probably most interviews I end up going to or being a part of, they're looking for. Preconceived, yeah, lines and everything else. This is, I think, it's a good recommendation, so I think it could stay. It's almost like something you'd want to say in your um, interview letter where you're inviting them to be interviewed. You say, <laughs> Would you really put that in there? the interviewer or the interviewee could do whatever they wanted to I guess but. Oh, sure. that's almost an expectation in a lot of interviews I've been in computer rendering. yeah 
if, if I could interject quickly, so this is outside of my personal uh, subject matter expertise, and kind of broadly outside of uh, my divisions, but I did want to let uh, Tony Glandorf, uh, our counsel, speak uh, to the question about the uh, whether we should be including information that we are uh, recommending that this be closed to the public. So, Tony, if you wanted to share some thoughts yeah. on that. I, th I think j just generally, um, if and I, and I was in the back listening, but if the selection committee is one that's made up of a governmental entity, um, then, then our governmental entities here within the department are required to do all of that selections and all of that all this discussion has to be in a public forum so it cannot be in a closed session um, that's not allowed under the uh, Tennessee Open Meetings Act so that's the only only thought that I had on that though I'm not I'm not so sure about the exact uh, makeup you, of that selection committee it, or if is there's that a true even if it's even if they're not elected officials None of none of the, our board members here are elected officials, but they They're have to do their business. Board, yeah. They're but a they have to do appointed board, though. So. And I, I think Casey might have some knowledge on this to share. So we're all clear that I am not an attorney. <laughs> I'm not either. I'm not trying to be an attorney, but I'm going to just and I'm not going to pretend that I know what Chloe would say right now. But this it is the the procurement process and and evaluation of the, that kind of that I. I Maybe the comptroller's office knows more about the open meetings acts, et cetera, et cetera. But none of these, they're not, these are not traditionally open. You can't go watch somebody's procurement interview. And that's a pretty, that's a, that's an actual thing. So I, I, I would hesitate to, in, to suggest that these are all very open and public form pieces. I think it's all part of the open records. I don't know where it comes, but I don't think that. Trent, did you have something to add? Well, I was just going to speak to that, that that's in a, another area of our office that I don't deal with, so I would feel uncomfortable answering that question right now. So, uh, But there are people that I can follow up with and probably get in a, a more uh, educated opinion on that, if that's something that y'all would like yeah. for me to do. I think that would be helpful. And then maybe just in the meantime, we could just hold off from changing anything right here about uh, adding to what closed means in the context of this uh, document. I'm just considering, and it's not in this part of the code, but in the part of the code that authorizes us to use requests for proposal processes. Requests for proposal processes very, very similar to this. Um, and that is not a public record at all until a notice of award has been made. And we've always kind of followed the same process. So. And I kind of caveated my, my statements with kind of how we do it at Commerce and Insurance and what our understandings of our open meetings are. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out for discussion because yeah, 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 I appreciate that. It's probably complete, maybe completely different on the side of how you all do those selection processes. But I just wanted to discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. So we'll, we'll we'll dig into that a little bit more, and this would be one of the things that we'll be able to revisit. Well, and, and on the, on that point, though, I think. I think from what we're looking at, I think we would say that we prefer that interview to be closed, but each 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 entity or needs to to uh, meet their local comply with the law comply with the law and their because there may be you know a, a, one city one county may have a separate thing where they say everything's going to be open and one may not I don't know I mean well and if they're if you have the final decision or the final um, presentations being made to the, like the county commission or the municipal board, those are publicly elected bodies and they are required to give public notice of their meetings and therefore they are, it, it is a public meeting. Now the, um, now the meetings that we have as a selection committee or, and as a selection committee with the, with the peers, um, in my experience, it, that is not something that has to be publicly advertised and noticed. So, so we'll, we'll uh, get into that, and that would help us uh, inform on number six a little bit uh, more in the future. We're ready to go on to seven. Uh, I think had we 
I think I just kicked it over to you, Robert, right yeah, before I think, we jump back. Or just for six. number seven, I just think if an interview is needed, then you will right then rank the firms using sheet A11 or something similar. But I mean, we're, you've already ranked them. If you don't need the interview, then there's no. I mean that 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 one's moot. Um, I like the you know if the consensus final rankings chief through discussion agreement of the entire committee it's a recommended selection committee thoroughly discuss the evaluations and arrive at their decision by consensus rather than majority vote I kind of like that process more than the majority vote thing even though everybody feels like their own evaluations what I found and you got everybody can jump in sometimes you have somebody in the room that has a little bit more insight into the project that everybody else doesn't catch up on and and when you do this discussion you're able to go oh you mean it's got oh I didn't realize that well yeah that other firm does make more sense to do this or something and and so if you just strictly go give me your one through tens and we're just going to lay our cards on the table without any discussion or anything like that I think it is not a good I like the way that's worded how about you Rick you don't like the way it's worded. Depends on the circumstances. It depends on if you're if you're no. higher point number. No, I don't. I don't just. <laughs> one one thing that does when you yeah. get everything together is you you sometimes find out that somebody's got a buddy, yeah. and so they just score them high on everything. But when you get everybody together, and all of a sudden this shines out as yeah. you know, trying to trying to lean the. So one way or another, the discussion comes into yeah. play. I think I like the way that's stated in there. I do. I will say I seldom score the interviews. Um, often we will rank them at the end or have a discussion, as you said, to come up with a consensus or a, or a vote on yes or no to um, to that. But, but I, I seldom actually score the interviews. <laughs> so. Um, while the while the categories that are here are um, are good categories to make sure that somebody is addressing, I, I'm not sure that it necessarily is is something that if if you came to me and, and asked me to open my files and said I need your interview score sheets that I wouldn't have them. So it's, um, so. I think just saying rank the firms after the interview or re-rank them if you want to or something language like that may. whatever mechanism you want to use to do that step eight just needs to say negotiate the contract yeah. okay. I mean I know all this other stuff is guidance but my guess is whoever's negotiating the contracts got enough contract knowledge to know where they're looking at lump sum fix or cost plus or well. <laughs> If the purchasing person is involved, then probably. But if it's just if it's somebody in public works, possibly not. Most of ours had to get signed off by a county attorney or something yeah. similar. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you use. I mean, I I very rarely see one that's not that will have like the mayor's signature and the county attorney's signature on it. That needs to be stated in here when negotiating the contract. Please make sure that. Uh, the signatories on it to understand the various contract law or con have an understanding of contracts or contract negotiation or something. I don't know. But this is a lot of words. So, Robert, would you feel more comfortable with some or all of that being moved into an appendix? Um, I think it should all be moved into append an appendix. But I'm one voice. I think it would be fine in an appendix. I think I think the information is important for somebody to know. Um, some people may not know what cost plus fixed plus, plus fixed fee is, or or the ramifications of a of a per diem uh, costs and and those kinds of things. Um, so I think yes, it still needs to be included in the document if we want to move it to an appendix. That would be fine. So on page 12, the uh, second paragraph from the bottom beginning with if an agreement, I'm a little surprised that y'all aren't wanting to include that part 
and I'm not trying to take a position, but just it seems that that's something that I've heard discussed a lot, that you wouldn't want that part to remain in under uh, step eight. I think it can remain under step uh, eight. I, I just hadn't gotten to that point. I was going to bring that up, but that's that's valid. Yeah. So maybe yeah. that part could stay and the rest goes to an appendix? Or? Well, yeah, because well, it says uh, negotiate the contract, and if you can't negotiate the contract, that's – that's how you the next one. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't pick up on that. That's all right. Good point. Thank you. Sorry. Final step, step nine. Uh, unless there was anything else that you wanted to pull out to not move to the uh, appendix. Otherwise, nine. I think that final paragraph about notifying the interview firms can stay as well um, just wrapping up the so that it just wraps up the interviews and the and the process that he knows you're done okay. number nine That's kind of a raw, raw thing here. You can leave that in there. I don't know how much more guidance. More your, your agreement's going to spell out. Yeah. yeah. What you do on. Right. So you're going to leave that including the tips part? I think it's fine, and, and the tips should be included because. Okay. It should be stressed that it's important to have your attorney uh, review the agreement. Where would that be? It wasn't in here. You're right. But I don't see it. That's what I'm saying. But if you're going to manage the contract, a good part of before signing the contract, uh, you know, first thing says, for signing, resolve any initial concerns or questions. I'd say before signing, uh, you're, you should have. And the contract, is the, at least the AIA contract documents are going to say in, in italics, you know, it's recommended that you have your attorney. Is that something in step eight that you would want under the negotiation and that maybe that would be in the appendix? It's actually under nine. Okay. Where this is before signing it? Yeah, before signing the contract. That ought to be one of the bullet points there. Before signing the contract, <laughs> consider consulting with an attorney. I try to never uh, say that people have to talk to attorneys, but if you want to put it, it's your document. You recommend. That's not, that's not requiring. I don't believe. Uh, one thing uh, Rick was pointing out to me here, in most of the, this document, the term engineer is used as the design professional. Landscape architects, so it's design, maybe it's design, it's design professionals or something. And the word, it, that would be probably correct because it, in other parts of it, it does say design professional. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very sensitive to that because I just did a public works contract. And that's all it said, engineer, engineer, engineer. And I went architect, architect, architect. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it looks like we'd be adding another appendix, uh, A14, which would be what we talked about, just removing when we kind of took out the body of 
or m maybe it'd be in a different order in there, but that's what we talked about with all of the uh, body of step eight and negotiate the contract. Um, but other than that, it looks like we kind of just did our own red line right here. Um, so I would think, unless there were other comments, suggestions, edits that came up right now, um, that we could now take this document that we have, incorporate all the red lines that were just discussed, and then we'll have one document that can then be sent out to everyone who's on this. Um, it was my hope that we weren't going to have to gather again uh, together. Uh, I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts as to the necessity of uh, meeting together in person uh, a final time. I still think we need to do one more, and but and again, I don't know that number four has been in the Tennessee what we talked about. Not and not in that document in the the code where it says a city county utility hit it. And, and the reason I use this one is because that is a that is an acceptable method to procure services based on the code and I think we need to give some guidance to people procuring that as well as the design world on what that needs to look like I can work on that if I need to and attach it into this document but I mean it's I don't want to just say oh it's not part of it because it actually is part of the contracts for architecture engineering instruction services section so I mean it's part of it right yeah. What are you pointing at again now? There you go. When you it references at the beginning um, under legal requirements of contracting for professional services, and I don't remember that we took that out. So, but it references the entire twelve four one zero seven, which includes. It does. A four. Um, but if we want to specifically identify a uh, 124107A4, um, that could be a, sep a second paragraph to state that in lieu of this process noted before, or in lieu of this process, um, if a city, county, or utility having a working relationship may expand the scope of services. Etc. Um, without having to complete this complete this whole QBS process, um, but, and, and I think that's fine. But and maybe this is just two more sentences. I think for somebody procuring that service, it would be a good thing to say to have some proof that the person, even though you've got a good relationship with them, you understand what the work is. That maybe that design professional needs to supply some. There needs to be something in the file to say we selected Rick Thompson because he had just finished up the last three renovations on this same building um, and did a great job. And the scope is identical to that. And he gave us three, and we. Because if you don't, I'm afraid you, there's both groups are opened up a little bit to, will you pick somebody that was unqualified? No, I went through a, I knew what they were doing and I knew the scope and it was identical to that. Uh, so we could say something along the lines of it is, it is recommended that the um, local government officials request from, evaluate that particular, or evaluate that a and E with um, for technical competency of this per, of the particular or that or something. project. Yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah. I'll try to write something. I mean that I can try to put something. That I can in, once you send me that, I'll try to insert that. Red line. Who's who's sending the red line? Right? That's actually I was going to look for a, a volunteer to take what all was discussed today and uh, add that into the Word document that was distributed. Robert, you liked talking during the meeting. Don't you, don't what you want to tie it to it? I'm a talker, not a writer. <laughs> <laughs> Lori? 
do you have that all marked up? Because I've I've been talking. I made notes as we went through that I know uh, would have captured some. Uh, so I, I would I would do, and I also or my office rather could could do this and redline it, uh, and then send it back out. Uh, well, if we can do that and, and listen to some. I mean, I reckon we could go listen to the tape two to see what we've said. But sometimes in talking, I don't make good notes. That's fine. Okay, so if it's okay, then uh, my office will uh, take all of the uh, suggestions and we will then send those out to everyone. And we're going to do that as soon as this is done, uh, as soon as that's completed. Uh, and could we now talk about – so, Robert, you said you wanted to have another meeting date, which it seems if, if we're going to have time to review this document that we would have to have another meeting in order to come back and maybe officially – adopt uh, the working group recommendations that we could then the department would post on ours and I would be able to share uh, with my uh, colleagues in the state so could maybe some suggestions as to dates something that uh, actually let me stop there because I know we've done them around the uh, a and &E board meeting right. so and the next meeting is in December I believe we meet It's um, sixth, yes, fifth, fifth and, and sixth. sixth. Yes, we've done them Thursday afternoon. Uh, I think the last couple of times, but it's a Wednesday is the fifth, and then Thursday is the sixth. Okay, let me pause real fast. Casey, did you have a date? I, mean, I would just like to respectfully ask if perhaps we could be included on those those with some input on those yeah. emails. I've had the because um, this sort of all stemmed from some legislation that we carried last year, and and those sponsors have followed up with me to say ask where we are and. I would much prefer to know a real answer. Okay. Thank you. If it would work, I'd like to be able to send it out to everyone and then also post it on our website. I would love to, I would love it if we could have another go at it before it, I I think it should do that. Yes, but I, I mean if I would just I, I I'm just asking if if y'all are sending it back and forth internally um if if it would be appropriate to add us to it, I would appreciate it. Okay. We'll make sure that you're in the loop. I've got one loaded question. Um, is it required for professional services to be to go through the a procurement process at all? In other words, I know if you if you go through the procurement process, this is the process you should follow. But it's my understanding if a local school board wants to hire an architectural firm, they can hire an architectural firm. I just so wonder. absent any consideration of qualifications, you're wondering yes. whether those professional services could be acquired? Yes. First sentence in the TCA 124107A1 says, in the procurement of architectural and engineering services, the selection committee or procurement official may seek qualifications and experience data may is a permissive term and not a requirement so I, I think i knew the answer but just wanted to make sure i was well, i'll say that our score our, our school board seldom does this process right. uh, i'm familiar with it because of my old job but um that our school board seldom your school board selects someone yes. without RFQ. Yeah, okay. Got several people that they know are are competent and have done done good work in the past, and they prefer to to stay with that recommendation. The elected officials, so I can't go against them. <laughs> well, that it, I, and I don't want to back up too far I just want to I'm, I'm asking a question because uh, uh, Robert and I read this a little differently uh, it was on the uh, uh, number four on the uh, QBS statement it said where it said a city county or utility district having a satisfactory existing working relationship for architectural engineering services may expand the scope of the services provided they are within the technical competency of the existing firm without exercising this section. To me, 
that tells me that I can start on a renovation on the first floor of a building, and at the end of the day, I've done the whole building. But that doesn't tell me I can start on the renovation of the first floor of this building and get five more. That, that I don't I don't think that's clear. I mean I, I I don't think that's intended the way I read it. It's intended for you to be able to select a architect and let him do all the work citywide. I mean I I know what you're saying. You select who you want to select, but I I don't I just don't think that's the the way the spirit or the way this is and I written. agree with you actually I, I do I, I think expanding the scope of services is intended to be within the project that you were already working on I think that is the intent of the well, we can't do anything about it uh, no I, and, and but I, I, I can't either <laughs> just making a uh, but, point um, here I, so. and so yes I agree with you okay well, and, and I know I think I, I agree with you on that too but there are times when a municipality has, and we've talked about, so if you're if you're doing the first floor and we need to do the second floor, mm -hmm. it makes much more sense for you to do the second floor yeah. than to go try to hire somebody else to do that. Mm -hmm. But it may make more sense too for you to say, and build these two buildings. You've renovated the bathroom. Now there's two more bathrooms over here that we found really need to be renovated. So we've got you doing a good job on these two let's go do these two as well I mean does, I mean I think there's some it's just I understand exactly what's going on I understand it doesn't need to be a substitute for we're going to use this person for everything because they did a good job on they a did a good job on the bathroom <laughs> right but and I think that's what that's trying to say too yeah that's way technical I competency yeah I got it. but I know on some projects that we've been on it's like oh well you did this roadway for instance we've got a sidewalk quarter mile down the road that you've already surveyed most of that and done most of the work on it. Why don't you go fix that for us while we've got you out here doing a set of plans. That way we can get all under one contractor and it's not convoluted and it's not. So I think there's some things from a municipality standpoint that make sense, but the technical competency is the big deal. I wouldn't want you doing all the work for a city if you've never done any of what they're asking you to do either. But you've done everything, so that would be an <laughs> issue for you. Yeah, yeah. We're rambling now. Okay, so we'll take it back then to December 5th and 6th for the next A&E board dates. Uh, and Roxanne, you said we had previously met on Thursdays. Yes, I believe because um, the full board meeting meets in the oh, morning right. and ends usually between 12 and 1. So what we've been doing okay. is doing Thursday afternoon of that. Okay, uh, so Thursday, December 6th. Does anyone have any objections to that date? Okay, all right. Uh, we will go ahead and set that, and we'll be sending out uh, both a reminder about this, and then also after we have redlined the document, we'll send that as well. Okay, well, unless there's anything else, then uh, we'll go ahead and close up the QBS working group. Thanks again for everyone being here. And actually, let me, anything from the audience before we close? No? Casey, you always have something to say. Nothing else? Okay. Thought you might want to say more. All right, thanks, y'all. Thank you, Commissioner.